I've sought to provide this information with all the facts and information that I know regarding this matter, to answer all of the questions that have been asked of me, and to hide nothing of my own involvement in this matter, and provide the truth as I know it. This has been most difficult for me because I've had to speak against the President of the United States, some of my friends, and some of my former colleagues. I attempted to end this cover-up initially from working within the White House, and when that didn't work, I took it upon myself to work from without. And I earnestly pray that this committee reaches the truth in this entire matter and reaches it as quickly as possible because I think that there's a terrible cloud over this government that must be removed so that we can have effective government. In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. Tonight we have an end of the longest week yet of the Watergate hearings, a week that consisted entirely of testimony by a single key witness, former White House counsel John Dean. The basic elements of his testimony were set out Monday when Dean read a 245-page statement. Since then, senators have sought to have him elaborate parts of that story or to catch him in a contradiction. The test of that truth of Dean's story will come later, as other witnesses retell incidents Dean deals with in their own versions. In today's testimony, Dean seemed most shaken only when he admitted that he often confused the Statler Hilton and Mayflower Hotels in downtown Washington. His confusion became understandable when it was learned that there is a Mayflower coffee shop in the Statler Hotel. Other than that, Dean stuck to his guns, and his story emerged from the ordeal intact. This failure to shake Dean's testimony has, in the eyes of many observers, weakened the White House position. Not a single member of the Watergate committee has yet insisted that the president come before it to tell his story, but there have been a lot of suggestions of that effect. Today, Senator Baker, the ranking Republican, noted pointedly that President Wilson, at the time a Senate committee was considering the Treaty of Versailles, invited committee members to come to him. Senator Irvin noted that President Lincoln appeared before a congressional committee looking into news leaks. And Lowell Weicker, the outspoken Connecticut Republican, cited another Lincoln precedent. With John Dean looking on, he read a portion of Carl Sandburg's biography of the 16th president. The excerpt dealt with a Senate investigation into charges of treason against Mrs. Lincoln, and an incident that astonished the members of that committee. For at the foot of the committee table stood solitary, his hat In his hand, his form towering, Abraham Lincoln stood. Had he come by some incantation, thus of a sudden appearing before us unannounced, we could not have been more astounded. There was almost unhuman sadness in the eyes, and above all, an indescribable sense of his complete isolation, which the committee member felt had to do with fundamental senses of the apparition. No one spoke for no one knew what to say. The president had not been asked to come before the committee, nor was it suspected that he had information that we were to investigate reports which, if true, fastened treason upon his family in the White House. At last, the morning caller spoke slowly with control, though a depth of sorrow in the tone of voice. I, Abraham Lincoln, president of the United States, appear of my own volition before this committee of the Senate to say that I, of my own knowledge, know that it is untrue that any of my family hold treasonable communication with the enemy. Having attested this, he went away as silent and solitary as he had come. We sat for some moments speechless, and by tacit agreement, no word being spoken, the committee dropped all consideration of the rumors that the wife of the President was betraying the Union. 
We'll have an interview of Senator Weicker by Impact's Peter Kay at the conclusion of tonight's replay. All right, now, Senator Weicker, as you'll recall, was one of those who originally criticized the way the Watergate probe was conducted before the Urban Committee began operations. Well, today, three men who have been criticized for the initial investigation removed themselves from the case. They are Assistant United States Attorneys Earl Silbert, Seymour Glanzer, and Donald Campbell. Also quitting today was John Ingersoll, who had been director of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Ingersoll said he wasn't able to make the Nixonian War on Drugs succeed because of continued interference from White House aides Ehrlichman and Haldeman. But there was no mention today of why he had decided not to stay on now that his two problems were gone. We'll also be talking about today's testimony with former White House aide Stephen Hess and law professor David Austin at the close of the hearings tonight. But before we go to the Senate caucus room, here is our hour-by-hour -hour rundown of today's hearings. In the first hour, we see the confusion over the Washington hotels. At issue is where Dean met with President Nixon's personal attorney, Herbert Kaumbach. Under more questioning, Dean admits he invoked the Fifth Amendment before the Watergate grand jury and that touched off a debate among the committee members. In hour number two, Dean testifies that after some initial opposition, there was a political change of heart on Chet Huntley's Big Sky Resort in Montana. It needed some Interior Department approval. Also in that hour, Dean testifies that Senator Edward Kennedy was one man on the enemies list who was submitted to extensive surveillance. In the third hour, Dean reveals that John Caulfield found and then destroyed a diary that belonged to James McCord. Asked about what he told the president about the cover-up, Dean tells the committee, you just don't lie to the president. In the fourth hour, Dean says he expects others to contradict his testimony, but is confident the truth is my ally. Asked about that September 15th meeting, he says, I was convinced the president knew of the cover-up. In the fifth hour, Dean admits the money from Herbert Kaumbach that went to Watergate defendants was an improper use of campaign funds. Also in that hour, he says he tore up the check he originally put in his safe to replace $4,800 in campaign cash. In the sixth hour, Dean testifies that Herbert Kaumbach burned the notes that he used to keep track of payments to Watergate defendants, and he spends much of that hour trying to clear up inconsistencies about several trips to Miami in October after his wedding. Now to the committee and Chairman Sam Irvin, who will add some more touches of humor to the proceedings later in the day. The committee will come to order. I would uh, like to thank uh, Senator Baker for presiding during my temporary absence yesterday afternoon, and also, in, state, in addition to state my thanks to him, I would like to state that uh, I have never had the privilege of performing a public service with a more courageous and uh, independent man than uh, my vice chairman. I'd also like to make this statement. The committee has discussed the question of holding hearings next week, but the staff has been so pressed in uh, preparing a, a testimony and, and talking to witnesses that we decided we'd make more progress by taking next week off and let, leaving the staff here to work. And I'd like to praise the staff because uh, in connection with the preparation of the transcripts of the Mr. Dean's testimony, some 12 or 14 members of staff who had worked all day Saturday stayed up all, uh, I mean all day Saturday and all day Sunday also stayed up all uh, Sunday night in order to enable the committee to go ahead with the hearing on Monday. And I've never known a more diligent and more dedicated uh, staff on any committee than uh, this committee has the honor of having. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, might I respond just for a moment? I thank you most deeply and humbly for your remarks. I say not just in a spirit of reciprocation, but with absolute sincerity that, and I've said it before, I'd like to say it again, I have never in my life worked with a man who's been more cooperative, who's been more sensitive and understanding to the importance of this occasion. He's tried hard to make a bipartisan effort of these hearings, which I think they have been. It's been a great privilege for me to learn from you and to go forward in this uh, unpleasantness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
No, Weicker had finished, and I yeah. guess uh, Montoya is next. Mm. Senator Montoya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dean, I presume that uh, while you were counsel at the White House, that uh, you had many discussions and probably provided input into uh, some legal opinions with respect to the uh, uh, separation of powers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the possibility that the president might uh, be subpoenaed before any congressional committee? No, sir, I did not. Did anyone else? Uh, not while I was present at the White House do I recall that subject uh, uh, being researched by my office, certainly. Did you have any discussions with uh, respect might, to this? Uh, Senator, I might respond in this regard that much of the doctrine of executive privilege, uh, and there were several statements issued on the, on the uh, policy of executive privilege, uh, stem from the separation of powers concept and it was the president who told me that rather than refer to the matter as uh, executive privilege, that uh, Mr. Ziegler should start referring to it as separation of powers. Now, when, uh, when we were looking into problems of executive privilege, of course, there were collateral uh, reviews, but not as far as the president vis-a-vis -vis an appearance per se uh, was their research as, much as opposed to staff appearances. I uh, noticed from uh, reading uh, about the President's press statements that uh, <clears throat> he used the separation of powers and uh, Mr. Ziegler in his uh, press statements used the, uh, that term and also the uh, term executive privilege. Now, was there any legal opinion with respect to the uh, ground that the uh, two facets or two phrases covered? Well, as I said, I think you'll find that about in mid-March, uh, the phrase executive privilege uh, was not being used as much, and they, went, they began using the phrase publicly, separation of powers. Uh, as I say, this resulted in some discussions in preparing the president for press conferences that occurred in mid-March, and the president said that he did not want to use the phrase executive privilege, rather he wanted to use the phrase separation of powers and instructed Mr. Ziegler to do likewise. Uh, how often Mr. Ziegler subsequently has used the, the phrase executive privilege, I don't know. I haven't studied the uh, Are the you aware that anybody might have advised the president as to whether or not he was subject to a subpoena of a congressional committee? I, am, I have no first-hand knowledge of that, Senator. Now, referring to the uh, uh, President's news conference on August the 29th, 1972, and I will quote from uh, that conference, a reporter asked this question. Mr. President, would, wouldn't it be a good idea for a special prosecutor, even from your standpoint, to be appointed to investigate the contribution situation and also the Watergate case? Answer, the President. With regard to who is investigating it now, I think it would be, it would be well to notice that the FBI is conducting a full field investigation. The Department of Justice, of course, is in charge of the prosecution and presenting the matter to the grand jury. The Senate, Banking and Currency Committee, I presume he meant the House, uh, is conducting an investigation. The General Accounting Office, an independent agency, is conducting an investigation of those aspects which involve the campaign spending law. Now, with all these investigations that are being conducted, I don't believe that adding another special prosecutor would serve any useful purpose. Now, you stated before that there was a move uh, at the White House to try to stop the House banking and currency investigation. And uh, you presented uh, testimony as to what went on in the White House in the background. Now, was this going on under auspices of uh, anyone close to the President? 
Well, of course, on September 15th, I had had a discussion with the president about this. He had asked me uh, about the uh, Banking and Currency Committee investigation. He would asked me who was handling it from the White House. I had reported that Mr. Richard Cook uh, was the man who had formerly worked with the Banking and Currency Committee as a member of the minority staff, was very familiar with the members of the committee, and at the conclusion of my report, I recall him saying that he wanted Mr. Timmons to get on top of the, uh, the matter and be directly involved in it also. And that was uh, about the time that he was making this statement to the press? Well, that preceded, that's correct. Of course, that was September 15th that uh, that arose in his office directly. Uh, and we're talking about a press conference in August. And during the uh, following weeks, of course, there was an ever-increasing effort of the White House to deal with the, the Patman Committee hearings, as I have so testified. Now, when did the President tell you about this? Was it before August the 29th when he made the statement at the press conference, or after? Well, it was after. It was September 15th. It was approximately 17 days later. That is correct. 17 or 13. Now, in the same answer as he went along, the President said as follows. The other point that I should make is that these investigations, the investigation by the GAO, the investigation by the FBI, by the Department of Justice, have, at my direction, had the total cooperation of the, not only the White House, but also of all agencies of the government. And I want you to pay special attention to this. This is quoting the President still. In addition to that, Within our staff, under my direction, counsel to the President, Mr. Dean, has conducted a complete investigation of all leads which might involve any present members of the White House staff or anybody in the government. I can say categorically that his investigation indicates that no one in the White House staff, no one in this administration, presently employed, was involved in this bizarre incident. Now, now I ask you this question. With respect to any project that you handled directly for the President, where a report was required, wouldn't you assume that if this is true, that you would have been required to file a report? Yes, sir. And also, if, assuming that this was true, wouldn't that report be available at the White House? That is correct. And so, assuming the correctness of the President's statement, then it necessarily follows that if you made a complete investigation at his behest, and for him that the president should produce that dean report i already believe that the white house has indicated there was no dean investigation i think that is one of the inoperative statements but uh, it is still your testimony that you were not requested by the president to make a report to him or to conduct this investigation? Not at that time, Senator. That is correct. All right. Now, I want to go into this a little further. The matter of the San Clemente conferences. Now, did you discuss specifically with Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and others who might have been attending there, matters directly dealing with the so-called cover-up. Uh, yes, we did. Now, will you, as uh, succinctly as possible, as briefly as possible, relate for the record now just exactly what those discussions were with respect to the cover-up? Well, we had a lengthy discussion ranging over two days 
and I've estimated between uh, 12, 14, 10, 12, 14 hours, I don't know how many hours totally were spent in discussion that basically were focusing on how to deal with this committee. At the end of that discussion, on the last day of the discussion, on Sunday afternoon, uh, what I describe as the bottom line question came up because everything depended upon the contingent silence of the uh, seven individuals who had either been convicted or had pleaded guilty. Would they remain silent during the, the duration of these hearings? I was asked that question. I said I cannot answer that question because I don't know. All I know is that they are still making money demands. Preceding that, there had been a good bit of discussion between Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman and then back and forth to Mr. Mitchell as to who was going to raise the necessary money. I reported to them there was nothing I could do, this was out of my hands, that Mr. Mitchell uh, had felt it was not his responsibility to raise this money and he wasn't interested in doing it. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman and Haldeman said that they thought it was his. And so finally, they asked Mr. Richard Moore, who was also attending the meeting, to go to Mr. Mitchell and lay it on the line that it was Mr. Mitchell's responsibility. Now, I assume they did that because Mr. Moore uh, had spent time at the Department of Justice working very closely with Mr. Mitchell and knew Mr. Mitchell. Uh, he was an older man, uh, and they felt probably uh, sending Mr. Moore as a direct emissary from them rather than myself when I had failed to accomplish what they thought was necessary might solve the problem. I later learned that Mr. Moore indeed did go to New York and did raise this with Mr. Mitchell, but Mr. Mitchell virtually ignored the matter when it was raised by Mr. Moore. And w were these particular conferences at uh, San Clemente designed to just discuss the matter of Watergate? Uh, they were designed to discuss how to deal with this committee uh, so that the uh, cover-up would not unravel up here before this committee. That is all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Garner. Senator Garner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few questions. Mr. Dean, I'd like to go back to the comeback meeting again when you and he first uh, discussed this cover-up money. On the 29th, Senator. 29th of June. Of June. Yes. Uh, you're absolutely certain about that date. It couldn't have occurred in July, could it have? Uh, the first meeting I had with him was when he flew in. Uh, he took the last flight, I believe, out of Los Angeles. We met the next morning. Uh, the records, we, he very seldom stayed at the Mayflower Hotel, and he was staying at the Mayflower Hotel, and I would assume that if the committee investigators would check the, uh, the records at the Mayflower Hotel, they would... Uh, could confirm that date. I, that's the best of my recollection. It was the 29th. And this was the June 29th? Then. Yes. Was there anyone else at the meeting? No, sir, there was not. And uh, my recollection is that you had a, a short meeting in the coffee shop. Is that right? I was to meet him in the coffee shop, and I recall we sat down in a booth, and it didn't appear very private in the booth. So we decided to go to his room uh, to uh, discuss the matter. And that was there in the Mayflower Hotel? That is correct. Well, the committee has subpoenaed the records of the hotel. I have a letter here from uh, the Mayflower. And also <clears throat> one from the Statley Hilton. I'd like a, a committee staffer to give these copies to the witness. Now, 
now, as, as you will see, Mr. Dean, the letter from the Mayflower Hotel, dated June 27, 1973, addressed to Senator Gurney, Select Committee on Presidential Activities, U.S. Senate Office Building, Washington, D.C., to Senator Gurney. In reply to your request of June 27, 1973, to the best of our knowledge, our records do not reflect a Mr. Herbert W. Comback as being a registered guest during the period of June 1, 1972 through July 1, 1972. Very truly yours, Ray Sylvester, Senior Assistant Manager. And then the other letter from the Statler Hilton, again addressed to me, and this also <coughs> has the subpoena of the committee plus the photostatic copies of the hotel records. The hotel record photostatic copy is not very good here, so I think we're going to have to go by the letter itself. <clears throat> At any rate, here's what it says. Attached, please find photostatic copies of a previous subpoena served on the Washington Statler Hilton registration card and folio B96403 for Mr. Herbert W. Comback, who was registered in our hotel June 29-30, 1972. The original folio and registration card were received in compliance with a previous subpoena by Angelo J. Lano, uh, SAFBI telephone number 324-2685. We are unable to locate any further records on Mr. Comback. Sincerely, uh, William J. Utnick, General Manager. Now, as I recall, you have testified three times, very positively, that you met in the coffee shop of Mr. Comback at the Mayflower Hotel. That is correct. And then retired to his room in the Mayflower. How, how do you account for these records here? Senator, the only thing I can suggest is Mr. Comback may have been registered under another name. I Let me elaborate on that. Uh, Mr. Comback often discussed matters in a code name. For example, as after our discussion, uh, he began referring to Mr. Hunt as the writer. He began referring to Mr. Haldeman as the brush. He began referring to Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell as the pipe. These would be the natures of our discussions, and uh, uh, this might explain the fact that he decided not to use his own name in uh, registering in the hotel. And I think the person that could answer that best is Mr. Kambach, because I have a very clear recollection of walking into the coffee shop, meeting in the coffee shop, going to his room. It was a small room. He hadn't really had a chance to get a good night's sleep because he'd been flying all night. Uh, he, to maintain further privacy, I recall him also turning on a television next to the adjoining door. And we sat on the other side of the room and had the conversation in which I relayed to him everything I knew at that point in time. So I think Mr. Kambach will have to answer that question as to why his name doesn't appear on the register. Well, it, it also occurred to me that that could be the case, that he was using an assumed name, but then when we ran into this other record at the Statley Hilton Hotel, it just doesn't make sense. If he was coming into the city uh, under an assumed name so that and no one would know he was here, and no later record could be found, why in the world would he register under his own name at a nearby hotel, the Washington Hilton, and then engage another room over in the Mayflower to, to meet with you? It just doesn't now, add well, up. I, I see what you're saying. Uh, I have testified the Mayflower, and the, the I... I'm never sure which is the Mayflower, which is the Statler Hilton. Is the, May the, the one I, the hotel I recall is the one that's on uh, 16th Street. Uh, up from the White House. I know I walked up from the office to his to his room. Well, you say, how long have you lived in Washington? I've been here about 10 years. And you don't know the difference between the Washington Hilton and the Mayflower Hotel? I, con I continually get them confused, I must confess. Well, I must say, I am reminded of your colloquy with the chairman yesterday, Mr. Dean, when you said what an excellent memory you had right from school days right on down. And that's, that's why you were I able feel, to reconstruct I feel my this. memory is good, but I, I do have, 
I confuse some names often. Uh, I don't ha pretend to have a perfect memory. I think I have a good memory, Senator. But you can't remember really now, after testifying three times very positively, whether it was the Stadley Hilton or the Mayflower. Well, Senator, I, the, the, the point in uh, substance here is the fact that the meeting did occur. We met in the coffee shop. We went from the coffee shop to his room. We had an extended discussion of the matter. Uh, and uh, that is very clear in my recollection, the substance of, of the event. And one of the reasons I'm curious about this, uh, really it, it's less uh, an attempt to try to confuse you as it is to try to pin it down. There's, you haven't tried to conceal the meeting, and Mr. Comback, of course, knew, knows all about it, too. That's correct. And he's going to testify before this committee. There's no question about that, but I can't understand uh, the confusion in where it took place because it's an extremely important meeting, obviously. This is where the cover-up as far as the financial part of it first started. Are you sure the meeting didn't occur somewhere else? I can recall very clearly meeting Mr. Kambach in the coffee shop. Uh, the coffee shop was crowded, it was busy. We couldn't find a, a booth that was quiet. We went from the uh, coffee shop to his room. Uh, and that's, I, as I say, I recall very clearly him turning the television on because there was a door, an adjoining door next to the room, and then we proceeded to have our conversation. It was a rather lengthy conversation. Well, about the could, could that particular meeting you speak of at the Mayflower have occurred some other time? Could it have been a later meeting or an earlier meeting? Uh, no, sir. That, that, to the best of my recollection, this was the first time we ever talked about this matter, and these were the circumstances under which we talked about it. Was when he flew in from California, uh, he, had, he had taken a late flight, he was tired, and uh, we met in the coffee shop, went to his room, as I've repeated, uh, and then had the discussion. Let me uh, just try to refresh, re refresh your recollection. Could this meeting have taken place out in front of the Hay Adams Hotel? In front of the Hay Adams That's Hotel? That's right, that you walked over from your office and he walked over from his hotel and, and met outside of the Hay Adams and discussed it there? I've have testified to a subsequent occasion when we met uh, after he had the money in his possession, as he told me, and I believe he told me he was going to meet with Mr. Ulasowicz at that time, uh, and that was at the, uh, uh, in Lafayette Park. I can recall very clearly in being in Lafayette Park as we stood and we each put our foot up on the bench and we were looking back over towards the White House and talking. He had his attache case with him. I had walked out of my office, uh, and this uh, was sometime after this initial meeting. That couldn't have been the initial meeting, at least according to your recollection. No, sir. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait for Mr. Comback and find out what he remembers. Let's go back a, a little bit to the, the credit cards again. You know we had a discussion on that and the use of the 48 uh, fifty uh, uh, dollars, and I asked you uh, why you couldn't use uh, credit cards. And I responded that I preferred not to use credit cards. Well, now the committee staff has brought to my attention here <coughs> a list of some of the checks uh, drawn on your account. I wonder if the staffer would furnish the witness with a copy of these checks. Now, I can barely read the copy I have here on the, particularly the first one, Senator. I well, I can't read the first one either, but I really don't think that's important. The second one down, which is legible on, on my sheet here, is it on yours? Yes, it is. Now, that's a check, as I see, dated September the 21st, 1972. This was very close, of course, to the October taking of the $4,850. Here is a check made out to the American Express Company for $908.47. That's correct. Signed John Wesley Dean. Is this your check drawn on your account? Yes, it is. And is this in payment of 
of credit card bills? Yes, it is. Then we go down a little further on November the 3rd. There's another check drawn to Bank America for $250.51. Uh, is this also your check? That is correct. Is this also for credit card bills? Uh, yes, it is. Then <clears throat> going further down, there's another uh, check uh, dated November the 22nd, 1972, Bank America at $106.50. Is this your check? Yes, it is. And did that go for credit card payments? Yes, it did. And then dropping further down, uh, another in March to the American Express Company for $531.45. Is this your check? That is correct. And another in April, uh, American Express Company, $459.17. That is correct. Now, I don't know whether there are others or not, because we don't have all I'm of sure the there are, Senator. financial records. Do you have any recollection of what those were for? Uh, off, off the top, I do not. Uh, as I've told the committee, I am perfectly willing uh, to turn over all of my financial records to the committee, uh, where these can be fully analyzed. Uh, I believe in my own records will be found the stubs that indicate what each expenditure is for for a given credit card payment. Uh, I know that because of the result of some foreign travel, when I did use my credit cards uh, when traveling abroad, that some of the foreign travel particularly takes as much as six months to a year, I which see. surprised me to catch up to make a payment. Do you have an air travel credit card? No, I do not. You would pay for your air travel off either American Express or Bank America. That is correct, or, or by cash. Or Has, uh, let me ask the chief counsel of the committee, have we subpoenaed the financial records? We have subpoenaed all of the records of Mr. Dean, and we also have uh, one of our chief investigators, Mr. Carm Bellino, who will be going over those records with Mr. Dean. Uh, I might just go back to one point. Uh, the name of the coffee shop at the Statler Hilton is the Mayflower. Well... <laughs> <laughs> So please refrain from applause or demonstrating that their reaction to any testimony. Is that what your attorney just told you? Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> His memory apparently is much better than yours. <laughs> well, let me ask you, Mr. Dean. <laughs> What does that mean? Now, what is your testimony so that we can get it on the record here? Uh, what I would like to say is that I am, have a very clear recollection of meeting with Mr. Kambach in the coffee shop before our meeting in his room. I think Mr. Kambach can resolve, uh, uh, if, if it's important to the senator, the particular location of that meeting. Uh, to me, that was the substance of the meeting that was the important thing, well, and I what? think I've relayed to the committee in full the substance of the meeting and what occurred as a result of the meeting. Now, what is your testimony as to what hotel? To the best of my recollection, it was the Mayflower, but uh, I, I'm, if I'm incorrect, I'll stand corrected. Uh, now, to get back to the, uh, the payments for the credit cards here. Of course, all I wanted to point out is that you did frequently use your credit cards. Isn't that correct? Yes, uh, I did use them, but as I say, I prefer not to live on credit. When I made the reference to that, uh, I have other credit cards, as when my records will uh, reveal when they're turned over to the committee. Uh, when my full checking account is revealed, it'll note that most of my expenditures are paid for by check. Uh, there's nothing more shattering to me than to see a check come through like this September 27th check for 900 and some dollars uh, because I can never remember uh, uh, that I'm expecting such an amount and I live basically on my salary and, and do not like to reach into brokerage accounts and capital to, to make expenditures. So, uh, as I say, I think this will be fully revealed to the committee when, when my uh, financial materials are gone through in great detail, and the committee, if that uh, is their desire, are welcome to have those records. 
But it, it isn't your testimony that you use credit cards only for expenses in connection with your job. You do use credit cards also for personal expenses, is that correct? Well, for example, Senator, when I was at the uh, Republican convention uh, and often traveling on behalf of the government, I knew I would be reimbursed for some of those expenses rather than to go through some elaborate procedure. When you're checking out of a hotel, uh, I stayed at the Doral Hotel. I had a, uh, a bill there from several days. Uh, uh, with the easiest way to check out is to use a credit card, particularly when you know you're going to be reimbursed because it is a, uh, a government-related expenditure or a job-related expenditure and the like. And I think that that will be reflected when the uh, Mr. Bellino goes through my financial records. That, that was often the case in some of these expenditures. Well, I, I have no doubt it is. I'm sure that will be true. But my question was, don't you use credit cards for personal expenses, too? Uh, yes, I do. Well, that's all I was asking. Yes. Uh, another uh, point that I'm interested in here is this meeting of March the 21st with the President, which of course was an extremely important meeting. I was going over that yesterday, and there was one part of that that I must say totally confused me. I just didn't understand it. Summarizing briefly, uh, you mentioned, of course, that you talked to the President about perjury being committed. You talked about the cover-up, if it was going to continue, it would require more perjury and more money because of the demands that were being made upon uh, <coughs> by these uh, convicted people. And you said it was time for the surgery on the cancer itself and all those involved to stand up and account for themselves. In other words, a, a rather complete uh, briefing to the President on the whole Watergate affair. I've just touched some of the highlights there. But then you also made this statement. After I finished, I realized that I had not really made the President understand because he asked me a few questions. After he asked me a few questions, he suggested it would be an excellent idea if I gave some sort of briefing to the Cabinet and that he was very impressed with my knowledge of the circumstances, but he did not seem particularly concerned with their implications. Well, I, I must say I overlooked that, I think, totally when the testimony was first given, and I must say it doesn't seem to make any sense to me at all. If the President was now uh, fully knowledgeable about this uh, whole cover-up business and a part of it, as I think, you have indicated before the committee here, why in the world would he want the cabinet briefed? Well, as I, when the, when the matter came up, the conversation had tapered down and we were into a light question and answer session about some of the areas that I had gone into. And I must say that I had a, a similar reaction and I said to the, the President, uh, uh, Mr. President, I don't think that this is the sort of thing that we would, uh, I could give a briefing on, uh, even a tailored down briefing on. But he felt that it might be important that I explain some of the parameters of the problem and the like. And it wasn't a lengthy uh, matter. Uh, uh, I felt that sometimes during my presentation uh, that he was very uh, sort of impressed with the way I was uh, uh, giving the presentation. I tried to, I was trying to really uh, give one of the most dramatic speeches I'd ever given in my life. Well, it, it still is totally... And I might add, I never did give a briefing to the Cabinet, and that was dropped uh, immediately in the conversation. I added that because it stuck in my mind that uh, as one of the points that I really didn't feel that I had made uh, uh, the full implications of this thing clear. But that's the sort of thing that, as it, you noted in the testimony, it noted very clearly in my mind when the suggestion came up. Well, that occurs to me, too, that maybe the president didn't understand for some reason. I can't imagine a president of the United States knowing that uh, his two chief aides, Mr. Holloman, Mr. Ehrlichman, yourself, uh, Mr. Colson, uh, LaRue, Mardian, Magruder, Mitchell, all these people, 
being involved in this criminal activity and uh, or possibly involved in this criminal activity. I don't want to accuse them of crimes over this national television here, but these supposedly were all involved in this. And well, then there was given, a cover-up money given with, the, his, given with the his personal attorney, Mr. Comback. And all of these things went on, and if he knew that, as I understand your thesis is, how in the world would have he instructed anybody who had total knowledge of this like you to go before the cabinet and tell him about it? May I res respond to that in yeah. two parts? First of all, you have repeated on several occasions that I have a thesis. I do not have a thesis. I really have no uh, wish other than to report as compelled by this committee the facts as I know them. Secondly, uh, this was a part of a dialogue that followed. I don't think the president had any intention of sending me in to report in full as I had just reported to him. I, make, I made it the comment of my testimony because it stuck in my mind as evidence of the fact that the president uh, did not really still realize the implications of what I was talking about, and it recalled to me uh, the similar and earlier occasions when I'd tried to raise with him my own involvement in this matter uh, and explain the obstruction of justice involvement, and he didn't uh, seem to be want, want to hear it or get into it or anything of that nature. So that's why it's in the testimony, because it's the sort of thing, Senator, as you, when you reread the testimony, it pops right off that, uh, that page, and it stuck right in my mind the same way. Well, it did, and I must say, it, it rather startled me. I didn't really understand why I didn't hear it the first time, but... And that same thing occurred to me, that maybe even on March 21st, he, he wasn't totally aware of all of these things. Uh, that you testified to here these last five days. Otherwise, I, I can understand why he would have suggested to go to the cabinet with it. Well, let's get on here. Uh, late in March or early April, you did decide uh, that you had had enough of this business and that you wanted out of it and... Senator, and you said early April? Late in March or early oh, excuse April. Excuse me, I didn't hear that. Uh, you decided that you'd had enough of this cover-up and, and you wanted to get out of it and, and go your own course and, as I would put it, maybe come clean. Is that a fair way of saying it? Uh, Senator, what I wanted to do, I would, was trying to work internally within the White House. I was very anxious to get the president uh, out in front on this issue. I had conversations from Camp David uh, with Mr. Moore exploring further ideas. We'd explored this on countless occasions on how to end it, uh, how to get the president out in front of it, have the president taking the action to end it, uh, decisive action uh, that would end it. Uh, by, the, by the time I went to Camp David, I realized that I had not accomplished uh, what I was trying to do internally and began to think about uh, that I might have to be the one to stand up and take my own steps. And taking your own steps, of course, would be revealing and telling the whole story. Isn't that what you mean? That is correct. Well, now, you went before the grand jury last week, did you not? That is correct. Did you tell them the whole story? I decided to exercise my constitutional rights at that point in time. What do you mean by that? I invoked the Fifth Amendment. You didn't tell them anything, did you? No, sir, I did not. I hate to interrupt, Senator, but I... I might point out to the chairman, uh, because I do think that we ought to <clears throat> have the rules understood, that uh, the witness counsel may defend his constitutional rights, but the attorney can't testify here or make statements uh, on his own behalf or even on behalf of his counsel, as I understand the rules the committee are operating under. Is that correct? Well, I don't know uh, what the counsel wants to say. I, I will say it in a way that uh, is uh, a proper. I'd like to defend my client's constitutional rights. And by so doing, I'd like to call to the attention to the chair the fact that in 1959, our Supreme Court decided the case of United States versus Grunewald and in that case, the Supreme Court said that it's not proper cross-examination and it's not inconsistent for a witness on one occasion to take his Fifth Amendment right and on another occasion testify. And as a result of that decision, the case had to be retried in the Southern District of New York 
And the man that went, made the mistake went to the federal bench, and the man that retried the case lost it and went into private practice. Well, I might say to the counsel that just about all of the testimony that's been presented here before this committee, whether by this witness or any other witness, would never be admissible in a court of law, a good bit of it. So I think the counsel ought to understand that, too. I might also add, Senator, though, it would be admissible before the grand jury. The rule of law, as I understand it, while you have evidence tending to show that people, two or more people, conspired either to do an unlawful act or to do a lawful act in an unlawful method or by unlawful means, then any action or statement made by one of the parties to the conspiracy and furtherance of the objective of the conspiracy is admissible in evidence. And in my judgment as a lawyer, while we have some hearsay and we've had some questions asked that were not admissible in the court of law, I think the great bulk of the testimony that's been produced here would be admissible in the court of law. Well, I might also add, Mr. Chairman. I'll give any member of the committee and anybody else the right to disagree with my legal opinion, but that's my legal opinion. Mr. Chairman. Well, now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address myself precisely to the point we're talking about. Under the rules of procedure for the Subcommittee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Rule 20 says the sole and exclusive prerogative of the counsel shall be to advise such witness when he's testifying of his legal rights and his constitutional rights. Mr. Chairman, I think as no question has been posed that I know of to the witness at this moment that interferes with his constitutional rights. I simply asked him if he'd gone before the grand jury. He said he had, and he said he'd taken the Fifth Amendment. And also, while I was there, I tried to convey to the grand jury that I wished I could tell them the story because everything that I've told this committee would be admissible before the grand jury, and the grand jury was very anxious to hear it. I would also recall to the senator that I'd had extensive discussions with the prosecutors about the timing of my appearance before the grand jury. The prosecutors themselves were in the middle of the situation of whether there was going to be a special prosecutor or no special prosecutor. No resolution of that was mentioned, and I think that you'll find in an affidavit attached to a motion filed in the court regarding my appearance before the grand jury some of the facts that relate to that and the fact that I was being brought before the grand jury, the reasons I was being brought before the grand jury, and reflecting the decision based on the advice of counsel as to why I did at that point in time invoke the Fifth Amendment because there's some unusual cases in this jurisdiction, the leading case being the Ellis case, which I'd refer to the senator to read, as to what happens when one waives one's rights in this jurisdiction, being a unique jurisdiction. And being a lawyer as you are, I'm sure you'd understand, looking at that entire picture, the reason that I felt it was necessary to do that. Well, I don't know, of course, what the Ellis case provides. I want to say since the rules of the committee have been invoked, I would like to call the attention of the committee to Rule 16, which says any objection raised by a witness or his counsel to procedures or to the admissibility of testimony and evidence shall be ruled upon by the chairman or presiding member, and such rulings shall be the rulings of the committee unless the disagreement thereon is expressed by a majority of the committee present. In the case of a tie, the rule of the chair will prevail. Now, I understand, I interpret that as to give counsel the right to object to the admissibility of testimony. Well, I think so, too. So why doesn't counsel state his objection? I think I've already expressed it. I did, Mr. Chairman, and my objection succinctly stated is that it's improper examination of my client to raise the fact that on a previous occasion he took the Fifth Amendment. Well, I understood the counsel to raise a point. I'd state it a little differently, that the Supreme Court has held in the fact that the witness can be impeached by a testimony that on a previous occasion he pleaded the Fifth Amendment, that the Fifth Amendment, the value of the Fifth Amendment to the witness would be virtually destroyed. Well, 
I'm not exactly sure whether I asked him that question or not. I asked him if he'd been before the grand jury and told his story, and I think his reply was no, that he took the Fifth Amendment. My recollection of the answer. Well, I think the obvious answer, it was the only answer I had to give to your question, Senator, is why my counsel uh, came to his feet. Well, suppose we go on to what's happening here now. That's, I think, very interesting. Uh, here, of course, we've had testimony for five days. This is the fifth day. It started with a statement of 245 pages. And indeed, uh, you have endeavored to uh, tell the committee everything, of course, that you knew about the case. And the committee certainly is very grateful for that. But you are testifying here under immunity, are you not? I have been compelled to appear here to testify. Uh, the committee has made a decision, I understand, by a unanimous vote to grant me immunity. Uh, I don't come before this committee without substantial consequences on my future legal rights, even though I am under immunity. But none of what has transpired here, as far as your testimony is concerned, can be used against you in a, a further criminal proceeding. Isn't that correct? That is correct, if it's impossible or if it's possible to uh, take the lead problem out of an individual's testimony. Now, just in, in summary, uh, uh, Mr. Dean, <clears throat> I wonder if we can go over the salient points of the five days. Uh, again, as I understand it, uh, to your own knowledge, uh, you have no knowledge that President Nixon was ever involved in the planning of the break-in at Watergate. Is that correct? I have no direct knowledge of that. That is correct. And then in the year 1972, the only meeting you ever had with the president on Watergate was on September the 15th. Is that correct? Yes, and I believe we've been over that in detail. We have been over that in detail, and I don't think uh, it would serve any purpose to go over it again. In 1973, the two occasions uh, that you did discuss Watergate with him prior to March 21st was that meeting on February the 27th. Is that correct? Well, as I... In uh, answering Senator Baker's questions yesterday, I don't know if uh, you were present, Senator. Uh, we were going through all of the circumstantial situations leading up to the meetings that occurred in February and March, and the fact that uh, there was a, a d developing strategy that had uh, occurred in California at the La Costa meetings and on the tail end of those, and consistent with those, I had a number of meetings with the president where subjects related to that uh, particular California policy-setting meeting was being continually uh, discussed. Well, I understand that, but I mean the direct involvement of the possible criminal activities of Watergate. February 27th was the first meeting, was it not, when, as you testified, the question of obstruction of justice came up. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And you stated that you might be implicated in some way in that, and the president said, no, he didn't think so. Isn't that the substance of that? That is correct. Then on March 13th, you also That was, had... I believe, on the 28th that came up, Senator. 28th. All right. And then one other meeting on March 13th, you had another conversation with him that involved this executive clemency business. Isn't that correct? On March 13th, we discussed both clemency and the fact that there was no, no money. The way the, the clemency discussion came up, as you'll recall, is at the end of another conversation, I raised with him the fact that there were demands being made for money, uh, for continued money. There was no money around to pay it. Uh, he asked me how, you know, how much it was going to cost. I gave him my best estimate, uh, which I said was a million dollars or more. He, in turn, uh, said to me that, well, a million dollars is certainly no problem to raise, and turned to Mr. Haldeman and made a similar comment. And then he came back after uh, uh, just, just a brief discussion on that. I remember uh, very clearly the way he, he pushed his chair away from his desk as he was looking back at Mr. Haldeman to, to uh, get, you know, the same message through to Mr. Haldeman that, you know, a million dollars is no problem. Uh, then he came back up, uh, he rolled his chair back up towards the desk and said to me, he said, well, who is making the principal demands for this money? At that point in time, I said, they're principally coming from Mr. 
Hunt through his attorney, and he then turned to the discussion of the fact that he had talked uh, with Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Colson about uh, clemency for Mr. Hunt, and he expressed annoyance at the fact that Mr. Colson had come to him contrary to an instruction that the president was aware of, that Colson wasn't to raise this with him. So there were and discussions then we, went, then we went on to discuss the delivery, you know, how this, this money was delivered. Uh, and I told him that uh, it was laundered and I uh, told him I was learning about things that uh, I'd never known about before. And I recall very vividly how uh, Mr. Holloman thought this was very funny and started laughing. So there were really two main discussions on Watergate, the money, the cover-up money that you've just discussed, and also the executive clemency, and Mr. Holloman was present during these discussions. Well, Senator, not to, to, uh, to take anything away from your interpretation, uh, that, but uh, a lot of the discussion that occurred regarding the press conferences, the positions we were going to take on executive privilege, and the like uh, had direct implications on unraveling the Watergate. Well, I, I understand that. Indeed, I do. But I'm talking about the, the criminal activity. Certainly, press conferences, executive clemency do not involve any, any criminal activity. And I'm just trying to pinpoint the criminal parts of it. And then, of course, there was the meeting on March 21st. I might, I might add that in... Uh, in as I told you, at one point in time when I went to discuss this with counsel... Uh, who is an experienced prosecutor, he said that oftentimes intervening events show intention and purpose. Uh, that's why I've tried to report everything I know to the committee as fully as I know. I understand that, and, and I, as a committee member, am, am extremely uh, glad you did, because I do think it sheds a lot of light, and it will... To help the deliberations of the committee when other witnesses come before it. I'm not uh, in any way deprecating the importance of the, all of the events that surrounded uh, these transactions in Watergate, but I am trying to pinpoint the criminal parts of it. Uh, and that really is the sum and substance of your direct knowledge, direct conversations with the President on the criminal activity. On the March 13th meeting. Well, I also said the March 21st. Uh, that's correct. We have gone over the March 21st meeting. We don't need to go over it again. Right. I'm just pinpointing that time. Now, that day. Then, we, then we jump where, where the next in the series of meetings was in the April 15th well, meeting. Well, I, I realize that, but I, I really am not interested in that. I'm not trying to cut you off here, but, of course, the president himself later said that March 21st was the time that he first... They really realized the full implication, so I was just bringing us down to that day. I, I, I would, know the well yes, I would recall too. how that came up. Uh, the that the president uh, selected that date was as a result of uh, the discussion that occurred on on uh, March 15th or April 15th, uh, when he was searching his mind. Uh, I was being led through a series of, of rather leading questions. Uh, by the president at one point in the conversation he said to me uh, do you recall what day it was that you gave me the report on uh, some of the implications of the Watergate case and I and then he before I even got an answer out uh, that I didn't didn't remember the exact date in March he said I believe it was the 21st uh, and I said I will have to check uh, it was the next day that uh, when I was in his office again that afternoon talking about a press statement uh, that he was going to put out, he said, I've gotten a confirmation now, and uh, I believe it was the, uh, uh, the 21st. And he, kept, he referred to it at that time as uh, my cancer on the presidency statement. Uh, that's the way I'd let it off, and that's the way I'd referred to it, and that's the way he referred to it. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Well, there, Senator Gurney has completed his questions about Mr. Dean's finances in that meeting with Herbert Kalmbach. The debate over what is proper questioning is not finished, however, and we'll resume with more of that. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification.
Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearings, the senators and majority counsel Sam Dash are offering opinions on what type of testimony is admissible in court. Senator, you hear just a moment. Uh, Mr. Dash said he wanted to make a statement concerning um, his understanding of the rule of evidence. I, I think the question has come up from time to time and has been mentioned either by witnesses or by members of the committee as to the admissibility of certain hearsay evidence. A memorandum of law has been submitted to all members of the committee. The leading case of the Supreme Court is Krulowicz versus United States, and it has been the position. Uh, of the committee <clears throat> and the council working on the committee that even hearsay testimony and most of the hearsay testimony admitted falls within this rule is an exception to the hearsay rule. The Supreme Court <coughs> has ruled time and time again that where there is a conspiracy and there are overt acts, and I think at this stage of our hearings there has been sufficient testimony on which would go to a jury in a, in a criminal case indicating that a conspiracy <clears throat> has occurred and that there have been overt acts, that therefore the statements of a co-conspirator in the furtherance and in the course of the conspiracy, although hearsay is an exception to the hearsay rule and is admitted in every court in this country, and therefore even Mr. McCord's testimony, which was initially hearsay, following up on the evidence of other witnesses which established a conspiracy and overt acts that the Supreme Court has ruled in Krulwich and other cases that that testimony is admissible and goes to a jury and is used against the defendants that may be charged as, a, as conspirators as any other uh, testimony and is, it a, an, a, is a, an exception to the hearsay rule and therefore I think it should be made very clear and, I, and the memo has been given to every member of the committee that the hearsay evidence <coughs> that has been admitted before this committee would be admissible in any court of law in this country under the Krulwich decision accepting conspiracy, co-conspirator statements to the hearsay rule. Well, what the chief counsel is saying then is that some people may be indicted on conspiracy, is that it? In addition to obstruction of justice and other things? Oh, quite, quite certainly, uh, Senator. The um, uh, evidence uh, before this committee, and I understand the evidence being considered uh, by the prosecutors includes the doctrine of conspiracy when two or more persons engage in the commission of a crime that's a conspiracy. And I understand that even Mr. LaRue, who just recently pleaded guilty, uh, and this was made public knowledge, pleaded guilty to a conspiracy count uh, rather than any other count. And that conspiracy is a major uh, crime in this inquiry and is in the inquiry made by the special prosecutor. Chairman. Did you say Mr. LaRue pleaded guilty to conspiracy? Okay. Yes. I thought it was obstruction of justice. No, a conspiracy to obstruct justice, Senator. Mr. Chairman, could I say a word on that subject? Yes, sir. I don't mean to be facetious, and I certainly don't intend this to be critical of Mr. Dash, who's a fine lawyer, and Senator Gurney, who's a fine lawyer and a fine senator. But this committee is too far gone to start worrying about hearsay. And we are too deep into the business of finding the facts to try to second guess what a court will admit or won't admit. I spent a professional lifetime being continually surprised at what courts admitted or didn't admit, depending on my point of view. I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that liar, lawyers spend their professional careers shoveling smoke. And I have no desire to shovel smoke. So I, I really recommend, Mr. Chairman, and once again, this is not a criticism of the committee, but I recommend, or a council, I recommend, that, I recommend that we not think of ourselves as a court or a jury or a judge. 
and that we try to follow the facts wherever they lead us with the full foreknowledge that what we do will have little, if any, effect on how the rules of evidence are applied if there is, in fact, litigation, either civil or criminal, based on these same facts. So uh, I, I think that rules of this committee are important and the rule against hearsay and its exceptions, and the hearsay rule is virtually emasculated by the hundreds of exceptions to it. But I think the rules themselves are far less important than us getting along with the business at hand. So I very much hope we don't fall into the business of extensive ob objections, the argument of objections, and the arguments about rules of law that may apply. If we get too far out of bounds, I think we ought to qualify the quality of the evidence so that we can take that into account. But I don't think, and I hope we don't, start admitting and excluding evidence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to make the observation that I'm Felix Frankfurter wrote a very interesting article at the time about the Teapot Dome, and he laid great stress on the wisdom of the fact that the Congressional Committee should not be bound by technical rules of evidence. I do think, however, that it was well for Mr. Dash to make his statement because uh, I have read uh, a number of several articles uh, uh, by commentators who were not lawyers and who were criticizing the committee on the ground that produced, that had, had received hearsay testimony. I'm not concerned much about criticism because uh, I've got a, been criticized very much over the years and I'm sort of inured to it, but uh, I think it's well for the general public to know that <coughs> under the rules governing the admissibility of declarations of co-conspirators, that uh, the great bulk of the hearsay testimony that's been received in this case would have been admissible in a court of law upon an indictment charging the conspiracy to obstruct justice. And, uh, but I think the observations of my friend from Tennessee are correct Mr. that uh, we are not judges and not jurors. Uh, we are, are members of a legislative body seeking to determine whether or not the facts before us indicate uh, that uh, new legislation may be necessary. I might say, Mr. Chairman, that by explaining my point of view, I've fallen into the trap that the Chairman just warned me against. <laughs> he and I had a brief conversation a moment ago, and I'm sure he will not think it a breach of confidence to repeat it. He says, Howard, he says, don't try to explain. Your friends don't require it, and your enemies won't believe it. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you. I wasn't trying to explain. I was just trying to enlighten some of my commentators. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, one other point. I, 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 I'd like to put in the record a legal memorandum which sustains uh, the points made by Mr. Dash. Mr. Chairman, on that point, I don't want to belabor the matter. If I'm in error, I want to be corrected from my misimpression. But uh, I think what Mr. Dash has said is completely correct. But I think there might be one additional <coughs> consideration goes to the point of admissibility under any circumstance of what this witness thought another man was thinking at any particular time. His opinion as to what some other individual was thinking or the impressions of his thoughts. And I think that's a completely different matter. And just for that statement, I'd like to subscribe to everything that you and the co-chairman and Mr. Dash has said. Well, I, I certainly uh, agree with you. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I wonder if the witness can make a comment on this. Oh, <laughs> down in Waltoga County, North Carolina, where Rufus Edmiston comes from, <laughs> <laughs> this man has been over at the court in, uh, uh, in Boone, the county seat. And he came back that night and was in the country store. And he mentioned the fact he'd been over to court in Boone, and uh, somebody asked him what was going on there. And he said, uh, well, said there was the judge sitting up there. There was the jury sitting over in the jury box, and there were the lawyers. He said some of the lawyers were objecting, and the other ones were uh, accepting, and the costs were piling up. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, witness got some statement he wants to make. Well, you, know, you know, Mr. Chairman, if, if, this is, if this is storytelling time... <laughs> If, if this is storytelling time, my distinguished chairman is going to have to suffer for having set the example for me. 
but in the course of all of our testimony, to the extent that we have conflicts in it, I'm reminded of an old lawyer in Scott County, Tennessee, named Haywood Pemerton, who was employed to defend a man. And he said, I just shot a man, Haywood, will you defend me? And he said, of course I'll defend you. Did you kill him? He said, no, I just wounded him. And he said, well, that's all right, but just remember, he'll be an awful hard witness against you. <laughs> I, I just want to say that uh, I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, as you know, I'm here uh, under compulsion of, the, of the, the committee, and I have tried to withhold nothing from the committee at any time, uh, and I didn't want these conversations to reflect that uh, that uh, there's been any hesitancy on this witness to answer any question put to him and to answer it fully and honestly. Mr. Chairman, I regret I have no Hawaiian stories to tell. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, in order to avoid confusion, I wish to advise the Chair that the questions I'm about to ask Mr. Dean were not prepared by the Office of the Council of the President. Mr. Dean, I will refer to testimony received yesterday to the following statement you made your response, and this is the statement. Mr. Dean, you have depicted all others in the White House as excessively preoccupied with political intelligence, use of covert methods and security, and yourself as a restraining influence on these preoccupations. And, Mr. Dean, this was your response. I do believe I was a restraining influence at the White House to many wild and crazy schemes. I have testified to some of them. Some of them I have not testified to. Many of the memorandums that came into my office became a joke. In fact, some of the things that were being suggested. I think if you talk to some of the other members of my staff or if your investigators would like to talk to them, they would tell you some of the things that we would automatically just file, just like the political enemies project. Many of these just went right into the file and never anything further until extreme pressure was put on me to do something. Did I ever do anything? So I do feel I had some restraining influence. I did not have a disposition or a like for this type of activity. Mr. Dean, I would like to now refer to a memo dated August 16, 1971, <clears throat> and you have testified that this was prepared for Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and others at the White House. It is dated August 16, 1971. It's classified confidential, subject dealing with our political enemies. I'd like to read part of this, sir. This memorandum addresses the matter of how we can maximize the fact of our incumbency in dealing with persons known to be active in their opposition to our administration. Stated a bit more bluntly, how we can use the available federal machinery to screw our political enemies. After reviewing this matter with a number of persons possessed of expertise in the field, I have concluded that we do not need an elaborate mechanism or game plan. Rather, we need a good project coordinator and full support for the project. In brief, the system would work as follows. Key members of the staff, parenthesis, Colson, Dent, Flanagan, Buchanan, close parenthesis, should be requested to <coughs> inform us as to who they feel we should be giving a hard time. The project coordinator should then determine what sorts of dealings these individuals have with the federal government and how we can best screw them. Parenthesis, grant availability, federal contracts, litigation, prosecution, etc. Close parenthesis. The project coordinator then should have access to and the full support of the top officials of the agency or department in proceeding to deal with the individual. Now, this is a very important memorandum. Is this your idea of restraining influence? As I said, Senator, in the, in the memorandum, first of all, uh, 
as I answered in that question yesterday, it took a good bit of push before I would prepare even a document like that. I had request after request after request to prepare this. I didn't know a thing about how to handle something like this, so I went and talked to other people about it. I think that's indicated in the memorandum itself. I also made it very clear in the memorandum that this is something that I personally was not going to get involved in. Uh, whoever that project coordinator was going to be, it wasn't going to be John Dean because I just didn't want to get involved in doing the sort of things they wanted. Uh, as I say, when, when the, uh, the thing didn't float, they kept sending their political enemies' suggestions back to me. There was, I never did a thing to get a project coordinator. Uh, there was some rather loose talk about individuals who might handle this. Uh, I can't even recall their names now. I made no effort to find somebody to head this up. And while there was the conception on the behalf of some who kept sending these things in for my political enemies project, there was no political enemies project operating out of my office. So I thought that uh, while the memo had gone out and uh, you know satisfied uh, my superiors that something was being done, in fact, it was not being done. So I felt there was a restraint. It is your testimony then that this memo described an activity which in the minds of your superiors was considered important. That is correct. It was not a wild or crazy scheme. It was, to me it was a wild and crazy scheme because I, uh, I felt uh, I just didn't operate that way. Was and it considered a wild or crazy scheme to Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman? No, sir. In your testimony, you have submitted uh, several exhibits with lists of names, politicals, members of Congress, members of the media, members of the entertainment field, etc., etc. And taking this memo together with that list, I might add also, Senator, before we go forward, I don't believe that list is complete in and of itself. It just happens to be uh, a part that I received and had uh, access to uh, before my files were shut down. There may well be additional names and additional uh, information available on that. Mr. Dean, I believe one list would have been enough. Indeed it would. And on one of your exhibits, uh, you had a copy of a memo which suggested that uh, certain things can be done, such as calling the Internal Revenue Service. Now, in addition to that, you testify that in one of your meetings with President Nixon, you quoted the president as saying, we'll take care of them after the election, when the president referred to enemy newsmen. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. How was this memo implemented? As I said, <coughs> you give us examples, concrete examples. The, the memo itself was never implemented. I never did have a political enemies project that was in any way operational. However, I, we do have evidence here that, for example, uh, a TV commentator with CBS was, in fact, audited by the Internal Revenue Service just for the purpose of harassment. Isn't that correct? Uh, well, I know, <coughs> excuse me, I know Mr. Shore had an FBI investigation. Or well, was it an FBI? Yes, it was. Uh, I know there were other instances. Uh, these did not come from me. Uh, another uh, instance, many times members of the staff who were operating the political area would want to see a tax return. My office was supposed to be the office to have the facility to receive from internal revenue tax returns. I never called at any, any time I can ever remember while I was there to the director of the Internal Revenue Service recess, requesting he send over a tax return on any individual to my office. Have you ever seen tax returns? Have I? Other than my own? Other um, than your own? Only in connection with clearing individuals who voluntarily submitted them in relationship to a uh, nomination for a presidential appointment. In your memo, you speak of uh, granting availability, federal contracts, etc. 
I refer you to uh, exhibit number 34. It's a memo for you from Gordon Strawn, and it relates to Mr. Chet Huntley. And it says here, John Whitaker has ordered the Department of Agriculture to quit dragging its heels on Big Sky. Was this a political favor? And what's the number of the exhibit, uh, Senator? I believe it's 34, sir. I recall, I recall the exhibit you're referring to, but it's not 34 in my sequence here. Uh, I believe that might be in four, five, six, or seven. Uh, well, there's well anyway, I can, I can answer the question. I recall there's a notation on it. Uh, there was at one point in time an effort because of a comment, a rather uh, hostile comment that Mr. Huntley had made uh, regarding the president. Uh, there was an effort that I had, was initially unaware of to make it as diff difficult as possible for him to get his big sky project moving. Apparently he needed assistance from the Department of Interior. I would receive periodic calls asking me what's happening on that and the like. I would in turn call John Whitaker, who was the person uh, on the uh, domestic council staff who had dealings with the Department of Interior. Uh, at one point in time, apparently, there was a change in heart on Mr. on Chet Huntley, and uh, there was a turnaround, and he was given the signal, the Interior was given the signal, that they should sign off on whatever it was he needed to get his Big Sky project accomplished. Now, I'd have to review the document that you're referring to, to but that may well answer your question. I believe this line of questioning is very important because uh, your exhibits have listed, I would say, a couple of hundred names of very distinguished Americans, most of them, and other exhibits have suggested that uh, extra legal activities had been carried out in connection with these names. Now, there are members of the Senate, members of the House, whose names have appeared. But to date, you have been able to tell us of the possibility of uh, our man from CBS and Chet Huntley. Are there any other concrete examples? I'm asking you this because uh, Mr. Colson has gone on air suggesting that the lists you submitted were a social list. Uh, this was a list used by the White House so that they would not invite the names listed there for the White House dinners. I think you'll note in there at, at some point, uh, uh, first of all, that Mr. Colson, there's a memorandum to him in one of the exhibits where he was to call out uh, the 20 worst enemies and submit them. This was, again, because I was receiving through Mr. Higby and Mr. Strawn uh, a direct request from Mr. Haldeman that he wanted to nail this down as to the, the, the 20 or the minimum number that we could do something with. So we went through this big thing of taking all the lists that Mr. Colson had, and Mr. Colson went through and checked off through his lists what he thought were his candidates uh, he was the only one that I knew that uh, dealt in these areas. I certainly, none of these people were my enemies, and I, in fact, uh, most of these names uh, were unfamiliar to me. Uh, as a result of that, I sent a memorandum to Mr. Higby indicating, here are the list, don't let it go over 20, and this was sent to Mr. Higby for Mr. Haldeman's final review. Uh, it was sent back to me and went back in the file again. Did you know if anything ever happened to these 20 on the top hit parade? I cannot, uh, I cannot answer that because I think that uh, it was realized that my, my office had less than enthusiasm for dealing like, for thing, with things like this. Uh, Are you suggesting that these n listing of names uh, was just an exercise? As far as I was concerned, it was an exercise that I, wasn't, I had no intention of implementing. That is correct, Senator. And, uh, Are you aware of any person or any agency or any official using these lists they were, uh, to excuse me, do they harm were, or injury or to assist? They were principally used by uh, 
Mr. Colson and Mr. Haldeman, and I don't know what they did with them. I know on one occasion I had a call regarding the fact that some of the president's friends, uh, and these are in exhibits, and I just think it would be inappropriate right now to, to mention the, in, in, the individual's names, uh, were having tax problems, and I was to look into those. Uh, I had Mr. Caulfield, who had, it was the person on my staff, who was the only one I knew who had a relationship with the Internal Revenue Service, because I would, could only deal with the director. I did deal with one of his assistants from time to time on sensitive cases, uh, where they were just brought to our attention that somebody in the administration was having a normal audit uh, and just to alert the White House the fact that such an audit was occurring. But anyway, as I was saying, I learned that I was told that uh, I was to do something about these audits that were being performed on two friends of the president's, uh, that they felt they were being harassed uh, and the like. Uh, there's a third instance uh, where this occurred also. Uh, now, on the finally, when I got around to checking on it, Mr. Caulfield sent me some information, which I think is uh, evidenced in the exhibit, and a note went to Mr. Higby. Mr. Higby sent it in to Mr. Haldeman, and Mr. Haldeman wrote a note on the bottom, this has already been taken care of. So obviously things were happening that I had no idea on. Now, I, I would again like to defer from using names in this instance, but there was a request of an audit that was commencing on on a uh, uh, somebody who was close to the president, uh, and uh, uh, several people uh, got involved in this. And uh, they said, uh, John, you've got to do something about this because the president's just going to hit the roof when he finds out about it. Well, I went to uh, the Justice Department because it had already gone from Internal Revenue to the Criminal Division of the Justice Department. I spoke with Mr. Erickson about it. He said this this man is just up to his teeth in this problem. And uh, I reported back to the people who were asking me. I said, just don't touch this. Uh, there's just no way this man is in trouble, and he's got to be told he's in trouble. Uh, so that was the way I handled these situations, and I thought that was the proper way the counsel's office should handle them. Do you know from your own personal knowledge, Mr. Dean, if any member of the United States Congress was ever subjected to an Internal Revenue Service audit or surveillance by the FBI? Uh, the only, uh, I do not know from my own knowledge of any audits being commenced on any member of the United States Congress. I do know that there was extensive surveillance on Senator Kennedy, which I've testified to. Uh, Is this for political purposes? Yes, sir, it was. Who else? Uh, Senator Kennedy was the, the principal one where the, I would say the greatest amount of surveillance was conducted on Senator Kennedy, uh, and subsequently uh, politically embarrassing information was sought. Was on the FBI aware that this surveillance was for political purposes? The FBI didn't perform this. This was performed directly by the White House. Now, whether, the, whether any information was requested from the FBI, I don't know on this. Are you aware of any member of the press being subjected to uh, a special audit or surveillance by the FBI? I am aware of, of one member of the press uh, uh, being subjected to an audit, and uh, this was an audit that was initiated as a result of an adverse story he'd written regarding a friend of the president. Who is this person? Uh, it's, uh, I would have to check my records on this, which are unavailable to me still, as I've said. And uh, as I, I do recall, it was a reporter from Newsday who had worked on a story on Mr. Rebozo. Who do you think could assist this committee in testifying as to whether these lists were ever used for purposes described in your memo? <clears throat> well, I would say that the man who is most knowledgeable is the man who is described in the social list, so I don't know if you'll find out uh, what was done there. Uh, also, it's possible that Mr. Caulfield may be able to provide some assistance to the committee in this regard. Uh, and uh, 
I feel Mr. Caulfield would be very honest and forthcoming with the committee. Then your testimony is that with the exception of uh, this columnist and this television commentator and Mr. Chet Hunt Huntley and Senator Kennedy, you're not aware of how these lists were ever used? No, sir. I am also aware, and I would have to again be able to look through my files on this, that there were a number of requests uh, from various members of the White House staff to see if tax exemptions and uh, alteration of the uh, tax status could be uh, removed from various charitable uh, foundations and the like that were producing material that was felt hostile to the administration or taking position, their leaders were taking positions that were hostile to the administration. And on occasions I checked this out and their, their activities were deemed to be perfectly proper within the, uh, uh, the provisions of the Internal Revenue Code and nothing was done on these. And these files are presently available in the White House? Uh, yes, I believe uh, they would be in my files in the White House. Mr. Chairman, may I request that these files be made available, sir? Yes, staff will communicate with you. Well, I think I will have to, uh, at some point, there have been a number of requests for material uh, uh, that I get. Uh, I don't, I would hope that the committee would put the White House on notice, uh, or they may well not be there when I get there. Uh. Uh, in this connection, you testified the other day that uh, when you went to the White House to uh, see some of your files that you were uh, required to write them out, as I understand, longhand and would not allow, they would not allow, uh, somebody wouldn't allow you to uh, make uh, copies by, like the Xerox. That is correct. Uh, presently, I'm not allowed to Xerox any copies of anything, and I would hope, uh, particularly with the request of Senator Gurney uh, for my financial records, that I not have to sit and copy all my own financial records. Now, who, who did you, uh, I believe you also stated that you had to stand up to copy them. Well, I was, I was able to sit in a chair and write on a, on a table, on a safe that was uh, several uh, feet above the, the, uh, the chair. Did you make a request of anybody for the uh, opportunity to have these copied on uh, Yes, I did. Rocks. Yes, I did, yeah. and my counsel did, and I wrote a letter to the president requesting it, and I was denied. You, you have a copy of the letter to the president? Uh, my counsel can supply the letter that was written, yes, sir. Who originally denied you the right to copy them? Well, when, uh, when I was, uh, my resignation was requested in, in, uh, in, uh, on the 30th, I received a call from my secretary who said, what do I do? They're in here putting bands around all your safes and all the material. And I said, well, just let them band it all up. And then subsequently they transferred it all down to the basement of the executive office building. Well, did you talk to any individual up there about uh, having the right to access to them and right to copy, have your, uh, your files copied by Xerox or otherwise? Yes, sir. I, I had... Uh, I had my, my counsel sent a letter, and I sat down and talked with Mr. Buzzhard, and Mr. Buzzhard uh, just said, I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you about it. In other words, he's the White House counsel now? He is a special counsel on the special Watergate. Special counsel on the Watergate, and Mr. Buzzhard refused to allow you to, uh, at least he declined your request. To, to permit me to copy, yes, yes sir. In fact, uh, they were permitting me earlier to make some copies, of uh, my chrono files, which uh, I would like to have just for future use, uh, uh, and uh, my secretary was stopped from making any copies. Uh, so this is some objection from some member of the committee. I uh, uh, direct the, the staff of the committee to communicate with the White House and ask the White House to give uh, Mr. Dean access to his files and also the privilege of copying them by Xerox or other means. I think, I think that a number of the questions that uh, Senator Montoya asked about executive privilege could also be answered if I uh, had access to some of my files on executive privilege. I might add also that my office files were not only contained in my own personal files, but they're contained in other members of my staff uh, who I don't believe their files have been bound, and I'd hope to have the opportunity to check 
things that I knew they were working on for me that relate to many of these items. And without objection on the part of the committee, I would request to your counsel to supply to the committee a copy of the letter to the president asking for access to these files. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dean, you've just indicated that uh, one of our colleagues, the senior senator from Massachusetts, was uh, placed under surveillance. Was uh, this electronic? Uh, not to my knowledge. It was uh, uh, initially. Any, any break ins, burglaries? Not to my knowledge. Were members of his staff also subjected to this? I do not know. I think there was some effort to make uh, uh, contact or do some examination of uh, some of the, uh, the women who were also present during the Chappaquiddick incident, and there may have been some investigations made of them also. I don't have all the details on this, and I'm afraid that others, uh, Mr. Caulfield and Mr. Ulasiewicz, uh, can tell you most about that. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Hunt's going to appear, but apparently he did an investigation for Mr. Colson uh, of Mr. Kennedy, of Senator Kennedy also. On February the 10th and 11th, important meetings were held in La Costa. Uh, February. Yes, 10th, February 10th, 10th and 11th. 11th. Correct. It has uh, extra significance to this committee because from your testimony, I recall that on top of the agenda was the discussion of the makeup of this panel. That is correct. I believe the senator recalls my comment did, on that. Did the meetings go beyond just the discussion of the background of panel members? Did it go into how to influence, how to intimidate, threaten? Not at, not at that point, sir, and I don't recall that. Uh, it was more of just an assessment of who, uh, I think the White House was looking for a friends on the committee then, you know, who, who might they, so they could find out what the committee was going to do, uh, was the initial concern. I refer to an article which appeared in the Charlotte Observer, dated May 17, 1973, and it reads as follows, high officials in the North Carolina Republican Party confirmed Wednesday that H.R. Bob Haldeman, at the time President Nixon's chief of staff, made two attempts to get local party officials to, quote, dig up something to discredit Irvin and blast them with it, end quote. According to the sources, Haldeman placed two phone calls to former White House aide Harry Dent and asked Dent to delay the suggestion to state Republican chairman Frank Rouse. Who is Harry Dent? <clears throat> Mr. Dent is a, <clears throat> excuse me, is a former special counsel to the president. His principal area activity was uh, in the uh, political area with regard to southern states. Uh, I believe he is from the chairman's state. Uh, he is departed from the White House staff and is in the private practice of law. Uh, he was on the White House staff for a number of years. I believe he was in the 1968 campaign and he operates his law practice in both uh, North Carolina and Washington, D.C. Was this type of activity part of his job description? A part of his job description? Uh, I believe the activity that is referred to occurred after Mr. Dent had departed from the White House staff. Are you aware if this activity did, in fact, occur? No, sir, I have no first-hand knowledge of that. The only re recollection I have of any efforts to get any information on, on the chairman came to me when I had, uh, after returning from Florida, uh, from the La Costa meetings, I went, as you recall, on the 12th to Florida and spent a, a week down there. When I returned back, I wanted to reconfirm with Mr. Baruti that, that the, uh, the attack group which is a group of media-oriented people who had formerly operated under Mr. Colson, would no longer, or would, would stay out of the Watergate area, that they wouldn't have this on their morning agenda. And it was also in connection with this meeting uh, that the president was asking that a speech be prepared to counter offensive uh, 
the general thrust of these hearings by laying out the number of demonstrations he'd been subject to and the fact that these had been paid for by Democrats and the like. I can recall Mr. Baruti and I also uh, discussing other areas of counteroffensives and the like. It was at that time he told me uh, in, the, in uh, either that day, night or the next night uh, that he was meeting with some people from North Carolina and that they were they thought they might have some interesting information on the senator. Were any other member of this committee subjected to special treatment? Uh, One member to, suggested that he has been subjected to special treatment. Were other members subjected to special treatment? Not to my knowledge. I was not involved in that particular activity, no, sir. Did you ever discuss uh, special treatment? Uh, it, it very well could have come up at La Costa. Uh, as to... I am testing your power of recollection. This yes, sir. happened I, just I, recently. I, I understand. What did you... What can you recall, sir? With regard to other members of the committee. Because I can't imagine meeting for 12 hours and just uh, deciding that uh, Senator so-and-so is an attorney he practiced for 10 years. No, sir, that was, as I was say, born in that was a very brief part of the meeting in the early morning of the first day uh, in which there was a great disappointment at the fact that the White House had not had more influence on deciding who would be a member of the committee from the Republican side, certainly, and I would hope, and I would assume that if they could have had any influence on uh, the totality of the appointment of the committee, they would have been very happy. But they had at least hoped to have an influence on the appointment and selection of the uh, uh, minority members. I think that's very clearly reflected in the document that uh, I have submitted to the committee from Mr. Haldeman. Did uh, you discuss the possibility of digging up dirt on any one of the members here? Uh, we hadn't gotten around to that at that point, Senator. I, I said we, we had not gotten to that point yet. Uh, when that, did you get to that point, sir? I'm trying to, to recall specifically. Uh, I think that when we were going through the list, it was just to familiarize... Uh, uh, when I was reading from the Congressional Directory, uh, I, a number of the members of the committee uh, were men I did not know. I had had prior dealings with the chairman. I'd had prior dealings with Senator Gurney. I'd had prior dealings with Senator Weicker. Uh, they were the only members of the committee I knew. Mr. Timmons had given his assessment to Mr. Haldeman, uh and this was just a general session at this point as to the the composition of the committee, the general philosophy and, and makeup of the committee. You just stated that at a later time you came to yes, the Yes, I know. Stage. I'm, get, I'm getting to that. When did you get to the digging up dirt stage? That must have... That must have uh, I can only recall an, an allusion to the fact that, uh, that we, you know, this would be worth looking into at some point in time, but it really was not the focus of any discussion I can recall. Who suggested this, sir? Uh, the only comment I can recall making myself is, and I had made a similar comment with regard to the Patman Committee hearing, and you will recall that I requested, after a discussion with Mr. Haldeman, uh, that... Uh, uh, we check the the uh, financial or the, the campaign filing requirements of the members of the Patman Committee. I did receive a document. I've submitted that document. To this day, I have not read that document, and I can't tell you what it says. Uh, I didn't have any interest in that. I'd also been suggested, had a suggestion from Mr. Haldeman to call uh, Governor Conley to ask him about Mr. Patman, and he said, I think Mr. Patman might have one soft spot, but uh, uh, he also indicated some Republicans might have similar soft spots, and uh, when Mr. Timmons and I discussed this, we re realized that uh, this might create more problems than it would solve. Uh, now, coming back to this committee, uh, I can recall a comment uh, when this discussion came up that... Uh, uh, 
that it would be very difficult for some members, possibly some members of this committee, to throw stones when they were living in a glass house. And that's the, the comment I recall making. Returning to the President's statement, which you quoted, that we'll take care of them after the election, did the President ever tell you what he meant by that? To me, the, uh, uh, the way the conversation was evolving, and it moved right from there to the uh, Internal Revenue Service, uh, and there may have preceded that, and because I'm taking such care in any reference I make to any conversations I recall with the President uh, to something about the Internal Revenue Service that led into the fact that I should keep a good list, and then he went on to talk. I do recall him very clearly telling me to take to make a good list of those that are giving us problems, because we'll take care of them after the election. We'll uh, make life less than pleasant for them. And uh, it moved, the conversation moved directly from there to a discussion of the Internal Revenue Service, and I told him how, uh, well, I was really telling him the fact that I couldn't call Mr. Walters and tell Mr. Walters to get an audit started. Uh, and the president was rather annoyed at this, and I told him the reason why when he asked me, and I said, well, because the, the, the bureaucracy of the uh, Internal Revenue Service is primarily democratic, and something like this cannot be done. Uh, Did you ever call Mr. Walters to attempt to provide special treatment for anyone? To provide special treatment? Yes. No, I, recall, to... I, rec I called him and asked him a number of questions on occasions on various tax cases, yes but I don't recall ever calling and asking him for special treatment, and to the contrary, Mr. Walters is the type of man that he and I discussed on a number of occasions the extreme danger of the White House doing something that would politicize the Internal Revenue Service, and he felt very strongly about that uh, and the like. Now, I got criticism... Mr. Walters was not the man to see. Who was your contact man in the Internal Revenue Service? Uh, Mr. Caulfield had a contact man, and he'll have to tell you who that is because I do not know. I thank you very much, and I thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Senator. I sort of regret that anything was brought out about the alleged uh, attempt, uh, the request of uh, Bob Holden about me. But I'm glad it happened because uh, uh, President Nixon's campaign manager in uh, 1968 and again in 1962, Charles R. Jonas, Jr., made this statement that it would, and I can't refrain from reading it because I'm very grateful to him for it. He said, uh, Charles R. Jones, Jr., who headed Nixon's re-election campaign in North Carolina and has recently said he might run for Irvin's Senate seat, said he had not been contacted by anyone about discrediting Irvin. That would be an impossible task and almost foolish to attempt, Jonas said when reached by phone. I think that Senator Irvin is one of the handful of people in the Senate whom it would be impossible to discredit. I think that's why he was chosen. He has a record of impeccable honesty and integrity. If I had to depend on any one person in the Senate to proceed fairly and in a way that would protect the innocent, it would be Senator Irvin. I'm deeply grateful for that. <laughs> and furthermore, when I was, <laughs> when I was asked about this, I said it didn't disturb me at all because uh, all of the indiscretions I regretted, uh, deeply regretted to say that all of the indiscretions I had committed were committed, were barred by the statute of limitations and lapse of time, <laughs> and that I lost, had lost my capacity to commit further indiscretions. <laughs> This article of the state that uh, Secretary Butts went down to North Carolina and uh, made some uncomplimentary remarks about me in connection with this investigation, saying I should call it off as if it was my investigation rather than the Senate's. And I was called and asked if uh, I had any comments on Secretary Butts' statement. I said only one. 
And that was if the secretary could come down before the committee and testify on his oath and on his personal knowledge that the Watergate affair had never happened, I'd be the happiest man in the United States. <laughs> he, <laughs> the committee was standing in recess for two o'clock. <laughs> So, with another touch of Southern humor, the morning session ended on a very relaxed note. In a moment, the grilling of John Dean will again take on a very serious tone. For now, public television's complete coverage of the Watergate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington... NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As the committee reconvenes, Senator Irvin has another question about that White House enemies list. Subcommittee will come to order. George Wallace, for some strange, I mean, Jim, Jim, Adam, George Wallace. He told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told him that I'm sure you will. Yeah. I see you now. Calvin's is not there. It's you and me. Uh, uh, Calvin's is supposed to be him. I can ask him about that. That's all, right. all I can do. Uh, <clears throat> Was uh, George, Governor George Wallace of Alabama on the list of enemies? Uh, Senator, I never really have gone through the list uh, of enemies, so I can't uh, name that. The only thing I know about Mr. Wallace uh, in that relationship at all is that the fact that I understand that during Mr. Wallace's, Governor Wallace's last uh, gubernatorial campaign, that a substantial amount of money was provided by Mr. Kambach, uh, somewhere between two and four hundred thousand dollars, to Mr. Wallace's opponent. That was provided in the last governor's race in Alabama. That is correct. Yes, between two and four thousand dollars. Two hundred. Two hundred. I mean, two hundred thousand dollars. Yes, I don't know the. I do not know the precise figure. Yes. I have no further questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Do I understand that you know that of your own knowledge, Mr. Dean? That was told me by Mr. Kambach, who apparently made the arrangements. Thank you very much. Mr. Dean, this is your fifth day on the stand, and it's, I hope, the last session for this committee and for you, and therefore I intend to abbreviate my questions, although following the same technique I did yesterday. Let me tell you in advance the two questions I want to ask, which will require multiple answers, and try to suggest a format for the purposes of abbreviation. Obviously, if you have an elaboration that you wish to make on any of these points, you're free to do so, but if you could answer them first and then elaborate, it would help us along. My primary thesis is still, what did the President know, and when did he know it? On yesterday, I asked you to respond, and you did respond, in terms of the quality of your knowledge. That is to say, whether it was direct first-hand information, whether it was circumstantial knowledge, or whether it was second-hand or hearsay information. And I also believe I added documentary And knowledge. documentary evidence, that's correct. And what I'd like to do today is to limit that inquiry to the remaining meetings that we did not cover and to direct information only. This is not to imply that I'm not interested in the other, but I hope to contain this to about 20 minutes. And if you could tell me, at Syriatum, what you know firsthand of your own knowledge, of the President's knowledge, and the date of that knowledge, uh, beginning where we left off yesterday in February and working your way through the uh, ending of your employment at the White House, I would be grateful. Now, the second question I'm going to put to you after we finish that is one that really is, uh, I'm afraid, cumbersome and awkward. But you're a lawyer, and I'm a lawyer, and we both understand the necessity for this. Rather than me asking you <clears throat> detailed and probing questions 
on potential areas of conflict in your testimony and that of other witnesses who've already testified or witnesses we may have hereafter about which you have personal knowledge. Would you identify for me important elements of controversy that you know or suspect to exist? Now, this is once again for the sake of organizing your other voluminous testimony so that we have some idea how to test it against the testimony of other witnesses. Now, if you think either of those questions unfair, I'll try to revise them. If you're agreeable to trying to proceed in that manner, I'd appreciate it if you'd begin first with your first-hand knowledge of presidential involvement in February, where we concluded our interrogation yesterday. I believe with, that we stopped yesterday with the meeting on the 28th, uh, at which time uh, I was just told, I mentioned to you the fact that uh, I had told the President that I also ought, thought he ought to know of my involvement uh, in the matter. And then I will have to, to move along. Now, again, it's, it's, it's hard for me to, to separate, in a sense, uh, what what is defined as involvement because uh, there was an evolving pattern that came out of the La Costa meetings when I began having my direct uh, dealings with the president, and many of these things related directly to that. But even, uh, even though the pattern of activity I and understand. the circumstances involved are important for the purpose of this abbreviated interrogation, would you please tell me what you told the president, the president told you, was said by the president in your presence, or was said by you to the president? I guess that third one is unnecessary, but would you please do that, limiting it only to direct first-hand information for the purpose of this interrogation? Well, I think we ought to go to the, the next, uh, as I say, the testimony yes, speaks sir. for itself on, on a number of these matters I've just referred to, and we ought to move then to the meeting on March 13th, uh, at which the uh, towards the conclusion of that meeting. All right, would you stop just a moment, yes. Mr. Dean? Mr. Chairman, there's a vote in progress. I would like very much to finish this line of inquiry. I would hope that the chair would permit me to continue, and if the rest of the committee will go vote, I'll continue with this interrogation. Fine. Um, during the, the, during the, the conclusion of the meeting on the 13th, uh, the question of money and how to pay this support silence money came up. And I explained, uh, or the president, had, I was telling the president of the problem. Where were you? I was in the president's office. In the Oval Office? In the Oval Office. Who else was present? Mr. Haldeman was present. Anyone else? That is all. All right, go ahead, sir. Uh, I was telling the president, uh, I don't believe Mr. Haldeman was present during the entire meeting, to the best of my recollection, but he came in to the meeting uh, at some point. At, when, at the point he came in, it was on an unrelated matter. Uh, the meeting is interrupted to resolve his particular problem, and uh, he stayed in while I was finishing uh, my discussion of this because it had come up shortly before he came in, and uh, he sat and listened for just a moment while we were talking, then he took care of his business with the president and then stayed because it was quite obviously the end of, towards the end of my meeting with the president. It might be useful to know how the meeting was arranged, at your request, or the president's request, or through Mr. Haldeman, or how? Uh, the uh, meeting was arranged per the request of the president. All right. Would you continue, please? Uh, as I have testified, the, 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 uh, the question of, I got into the discussion of the fact, uh, because I had had countless uh, cross pressures and the like uh, as to who was going to raise this money that was being demanded. And Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman were unwilling to do it. Mr. Mitchell was unwilling to do it. And Are these things you were saying to the president? I'm, I'm, I'll get to that. I was, I'm prefacing what uh, the circumstance was that wrote, resulted in this coming up during the, uh, the meeting with the president. I don't mean to hamper you, but it, would it be possible to tell me of the conversation first and then to explain right. the background? Uh, I told the president at some point that the, uh, towards the end of the conversation uh, of the meeting, that the uh, individuals who had either been uh, convicted or pleaded guilty were continuing to make their demands on the White House, and that it 
would be sometime in the not too distant future that these individuals would be up for sentencing and the demands were at this point again growing towards a crescendo point. Um, the president uh, asked me, well, how much uh, are they demanding and how much is it going to cost? And I said, uh, well, to the best of my uh, estimation, it'll be cost a million dollars or more uh, to continue the payments. Uh, at that point, the president, uh, I can recall this very vividly, leaned back in his chair and, and he sort of slid his chair back from the, the, uh, the desk and he said to me uh, uh, that a million dollars was no problem uh, at all. In fact, I have a very clear visual picture even of the president that he, in the fact that he had his hands uh, somewhat in a position like this when he repeated it, when he looked over at Mr. Haldeman and said a uh, million dollars is no problem to raise. Uh, I take it from that that Mr. Haldeman was present during this portion yes, he, of the yes, yes, he was. Yes, Go he was. Go ahead, sir. Uh, it was then he asked me who was putting the pressure on for this, and I said it was principally coming uh, through Mr. Hunt, through his attorney, and uh, at that point the, the uh, president raised the fact that Mr. Hunt, uh, or he'd had discussions with Mr. Haldeman, I mean with Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Colson regarding clemency for Mr. Hunt. I'm sorry, I, my mind wandered. At that time, he, the president said that he had had conversations. That is, that is correct. And he also went on to, to tell me that uh, with some expression of annoyance that uh, Mr. Colson had been told not to raise this with him. Uh, and he also said that uh, Colson had, had raised it with him, though contrary to an instruction that he had received from Mr. Ehrlichman. Was Mr. Haldeman present during this portion? Yes, he was. Go ahead, sir. And from there, uh, uh, he then asked me, he said, how is this money handled? And I said, well, I don't know all the details, but I know that there is a laundering process, so it can, the money cannot be traced to any source. And I uh, explained what I knew about the laundering process, uh, and I said, I'm learning about things I never knew about, and the next time I'll uh, know better how to handle these matters. And I do remember very vividly at this point that Mr. Haldeman uh, commenced uh, with a rather good belly laugh. He thought this was quite funny. And that was what uh, the meeting really ended on that note. There wasn't uh, any further discussion of it at that point. Thank you, sir. Would you move on to the next occasion? Let me, while you're looking, let me... I just don't want to miss any of the points I have in here. Uh, I'm very clear in my mind on the, on the principal ones, but I don't want to make sure there's no minor point that, uh, that I miss also. All right, I, and I fully understand that I'm asking you to hurry through this, and you should fully understand, Mr. Dean, that if there are other points in your testimony that bear directly on this question, the fact that you don't identify them now does not mean that you do not stand on your statement as previously made. I'm simply trying to organize it for I understand. Uh, the committee's purposes. While, you, while you're looking, I'm, let me ask you this. It seems that Mr. Haldeman was present during that meeting most of the time. Was there any significant conversation between you and the president before Mr. Haldeman came in? As I say, this conversation had commenced before Mr. Haldeman came in. It was interrupted, and I went back. Mr. Haldeman sat down while I was telling the president about this and then just stayed on during the remainder of the conversation. Do you remember at what point he came in, what point in your conversation? I don't think I had gone much further than telling the president that there were problems in raising money. So it's fair to say, I assume, that Mr. Haldeman was there for virtually all I, of the Yes, I think that's correct. All right, sir, proceed, if you will. At least, uh, you know, 90 percent of the conversation, I would Great. say. that we. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, occasion that uh, I raised the matter with the president myself was when he called me on the evening of the 20th. I had gone home. Uh, I was at home. As I recall, it must have been about, oh, I don't know, 7.30, 7.15, sometime in that uh, period of time he called me, and, and uh, 
I went down to, to my living room to take the call. This was on March 20th. That is correct, March 20th. And uh, we were having a rather rambling conversation. I, at that point, because of events that had preceded uh, uh, over the last uh, couple days, told the president I would like to meet with him the next morning to discuss uh, the implications of, of the Watergate case that I thought I ought to bring to his attention as they affected the White House staff and uh, himself. And he said, well, why don't you try to meet with me about 10 o'clock the next morning? And then we go to the meeting at 10 o'clock. And that was on the 21st. As I told you, after the conversation with the president and on the, on the evening, the preceding evening, and the next morning I thought, uh, both on my way to work in the morning and when I entered the office in the morning, uh, uh, how I could most dramatically present the situation which I thought had to end that very day uh, and couldn't proceed another hour as far as I was concerned uh, uh, in, a, in a way that would uh, be very meaningful uh, to the president. And based on, on my thought and my pre discuss, some discussion I'd had with Mr. Moore the, the preceding day, I decided I would tell the president that there was a, a cancer growing on the presidency and something had to be done about the cancer, cancer because it was growing daily. And if there were not immediate surgery, uh, it was going to kill the president himself. So I started uh, with lines to that effect. Where, where did you meet with the president? This was in the Oval Office. And who was present? No one other than the president and myself. And it was at 10 o'clock in the morning? That is correct. Would you Approximately 10 o'clock, as I best recall. Right, sir. Would you proceed with as much uh, exactitude as you can? Right. Uh, I then told the president uh, that what I would like to do is give him a broad overview and let him come back and ask any questions he might like to ask. And I wanted to explain to him how uh, the continued support would be necessary, uh, how continued perjury would be necessary. Uh, to perpetuate the cover-up. Did you use those terms? Yes, I did use those terms. All right, sir, go ahead. Uh, that, was what, that was my definition to him of how the cancer was growing. Uh, in other words, that more people would have to perjure. The, did, you, did you say these things as an advocate, that is, that further support and perjury should continue, or as an example why it should not continue? as why it should not continue. Did you make that clear to the President? Absolutely. In what terms? Well, as I say, I tried to make it as dramatic as the fact that the cancer of this type of activity was going to kill him and kill the presidency if something wasn't done about it and it wasn't stopped by surgery, and that meant ending that sort of activity. Very good. Go ahead, sir. Uh, well, before you do, what, what was the President's reaction to that? Uh, the president, uh, uh, as I recall, and I, and I wasn't looking for reactions at that point as much as trying to be as forceful and dramatic in my presentation. Uh, like it's, it's like asking me what was my reaction to the answer to any member of this panel to a particular question uh, uh, in my now, uh, sitting here answering these questions, I really haven't watched for the reactions of the senators and the like, so I don't, I think you can I understand, understand that circumstance. I understand that, Mr. Dean. It's fair to say, then, that you do not recall a reaction. I do not recall a reaction, no. Go ahead, if you will. I then uh, proceeded to give the President uh, the broad overview of what I knew of the entire situation. Uh, where it started. Uh, you might take us through that, if you will. Tell us as close as you can what you told him. Well, as, as I recall, I told him about the, uh, the meetings that had occurred in Mr. Mitchell's office, that the fact that I had come back from Mr. Mitchell's office. Is this the first time you told him of the meetings in Mitchell's office? Uh, it is. All right, go ahead, sir. Uh, 
that I uh, had come back to Mr. Haldeman and told him of the circumstances uh, of those meetings, what had been presented. Just for clarity, these were the meetings at which the plan for uh, bugging and mugging and illegal and entry were discussed in Attorney General John Mitchell's office. There were, that's right, the two meetings. Uh, the, one, the second meeting at which I uh, don't know the full extent of the discussion there, but uh, uh, I know that, uh, you know, what I did here was... All right. But you began telling the president of those meetings, and would you continue from that point? I told him, uh, I didn't, when I was telling him the broad overview, I did not get into an awful lot of specifics. Because uh, I, I told him, I said, any point that you want to either question me or uh, we can come back and, and have, I'll answer any of your questions subsequently. Uh, then I told him of the, the fact that uh, I had reported this to Mr. Haldeman that I had been uh, distressed by the situation myself, had told Mr. Haldeman what I had seen and advised Mr. Haldeman that I didn't think anybody in the White House should have any involvement at all in this, and that I told him I was not going to have any involvement in it, and Mr. Haldeman had agreed that I should not have any involvement in it. Did you tell the President when that conversation with Mr. Haldeman took place? Yes, I did. I told him it occurred shortly after the meeting in... in uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell's office after the second meeting in February. All right, sir, go ahead. I also recall that I told him I did not know uh, how the plans had been finally approved. Uh, I didn't know what precisely had happened uh, uh, as to the final decision to sign off on some phase of the plan. Did you say that uh, on your own initiative, or did he put a question to you in that respect? No, at, at the outset, I was doing most of the talking and uh, giving him my general presentation of this, of this matter. And uh, I can't recall when I basically presented it to him, uh, interruptions by him. It was towards the end that he began asking me questions that... Uh, are now not very clear to me as the questions he did ask. Uh, right. If you would, Mr. Dean, work your way through the conversation and then particularly right. try to recall what the President may have asked you. I told the President that I had learned that there had been pressure uh, from Mr. Colson's office uh, on Mr. Magruder, that I was aware of that degree of pressure from the White House, but I didn't have all the details on that at even that time. In fact, I might want to add this in testimony at this point, uh, because as I recall, I, I may have mentioned this to the President. I'm not certain, but this is, I recall one occasion uh, on walking from the White House Executive Office Building uh, to the re-election committee to one of the meetings in Mr. Mitchell's office. Uh, and I met Mr. Magruder as I was walking over there. He was returning to the re-election committee. Uh, we were standing at the stoplight at the corner of 17th and Pennsylvania Avenue on the, uh, across the street from the uh, executive office building. At that very moment, and I recall very vividly, Mr. Magruder telling me that uh, because of the pressure from Mr. Colson, that they were afraid that Mr. Colson would take this operation over, and they were concerned about his taking it over. And that had been one of uh, Magruder's expressions of concern as to why that the matter had gone forward. Did you, do I understand you? No, I'm not saying, I, I don't recall getting into that detail with the President, but I don't believe I had testified to that before, and I wanted to put that in the record for the Is sake of Is it your impression of that you did tell the President something or all of this? I told him of the pressure from Mr. Colson's office on, on Mr. Magruder, because I was aware of this conversation. All right, go ahead, Mr. Dean. I told him I didn't know if Mitchell had approved the plan, that I had never, I had never asked Mr. Mitchell directly uh, whether he had, but I was aware from my conversations uh, with Mr. Magruder that Mitchell had been the recipient of uh, wiretap information and that Mr. Haldeman had also received through Mr. Strawn uh, some of the information from the Democratic National Committee. 
that Jenny generally covered what I told him of my knowledge of the pre-June 17 situation. And then I again went into rather broad generalities as to what had occurred after June 17th. I told him I raised the principal points that I thought were of concern, that the, the uh, individuals that had been involved had been paid for their silence. Uh, and in fact, this involved Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and myself, and Mr. Mitchell uh, in giving instructions to Mr. Kambach. I had mentioned this, I might add, uh, the fact that I had been a conduit for this type of information uh, at an earlier meeting with the president back in, in February, and he had disagreed with me as to the fact that I had had any legal problems from being a conduit. We did not get into great detail on that matter, and he didn't seem to want to get into de detail at that point when I raised that. Is that the essence now of this meeting? No, sir, it is not. Uh, Incidentally, I've forgotten the date. Now, tell me the date in March. Is this March 21st? Mar the morning of March 21st, correct. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I mentioned to him the fact that uh, I had after the decision had been made that Mr. Magruder remain at the re-election committee, that I had assisted Mr. Magruder in preparing his testimony for the grand jury, which was perjured testimony. Did you use that term? I don't believe I used the term perjured. I think I used false testimony, as I recall, something like that. But in any event, it was a description of your preparation of Mr. Magruder for testimony before the grand jury. That is correct. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I also mentioned to him the fact that as a result of the, the lack of money at the, uh, that uh, was available, that uh, finally they, the, there had been cash at the White House that had been used uh, to pay for these individuals. Uh, silence. Uh, and I was referring then to the 350, and I did not get into detail at that point in time. This is the $350,000 fund that was at the that White is House correct. in cash. Now, any one of those points, uh, which were the principal points that were in my mind at that point, there may have been varying degrees of elaboration on, but I uh, cannot uh, give the, the degree of elaboration uh, at this point, but I do recall clearly the principal points I raised with him. The record should show that you're testifying to, at my request, a general outline of the conversation, and this is not meant to omit uh, other detail or statements that have been included in your previous testimony. I'd like to reach the point when you're ready, and you can tell us in whatever uh, detail you can what the President said to you or what questions he asked. You indicated, I believe, that toward the end the President did ask some questions. Yes, you he have a perfect memory of that, but would you? I have the, the, the question that uh, the, the questions were running along a tenor, there were not many. Uh, that indicated that the president still did not realize the, the implications of this matter. And the one that really stuck in my mind is when he suggested to me uh, that maybe some sort of presentation or briefing ought to be provided to the cabinet. And I believe he also suggested the, uh, uh, the leadership uh, that this be explained to. And, and to the congressional leadership? Congressional leadership. I understand that there is a meeting with the congressional leadership usually on Tuesday mornings. Was this what the president apparently was indicating? I don't know which particular day he was, he was referring to, uh, and I don't recall which day of the week the 21st was. I'd have to check my calendar on that. So go ahead, Mr. Dean. Uh, it was after, uh, oh, one, another point that certainly came up in the conversation, because we talked about this subsequently on the 23rd when he called me, was I told him that I did not think that all of the individuals involved would remain silent. I had very much in mind uh, the matter of Mr. McCord. Uh, now, I would like to put something else that uh, has just occurred to me that I don't believe has come out in the question and answering with regard to Mr. McCord. Shortly before the sentencing, uh, I had a call from Mr. Mitchell, and he suggested that Mr. Caulfield get back in touch again with Mr. McCord. 
I called Mr. Caulfield and, and uh, talked to him about it, and he said, uh, well, I think I'd better talk to you. And I said, well, fine. And he said, I want to come to your office and see you. And he came into my office, and he told me, he came in with a, a small diary that he uh, had found in his car, and he said that he had described one of the meetings that he'd had with Mr. McCord, that he had driven into the country with Mr. McCord and had an, a discussion with him. And just shortly before this, this meeting in January, uh, or no, it was much later in January, excuse me, it was in, uh, in March, uh, that he was cleaning his car out, and he found this small uh, diary, and apparently it was Mr. McCord's diary. And then it was noted each meeting that he had had with Mr. Caulfield and others and all of the subsequent events that he had done. It was a daily diary, and it was up to the day that Mr. Caulfield had met with him. Now, I, Mr. Caulfield handed it to me, and I handed it back to Mr. Caulfield, and he said, I don't want this. And he tore it up and put it in his pocket. Uh, it was based on that that I told Mr. Mitchell that I didn't think that it was very wise that, uh, that Mr. Caulfield and Mr. McCord meet further because it was quite obvious to me, as it was to Mr. Caulfield, that Mr. McCord was keeping a very accurate diary of all of his activities. Let's go back to your conversation with the President. We're on March 21st still. Uh, can you recall any other... Well, I, I was explaining that is that was the... the uh, but even before this, uh, well, you know, before the sentencing, I was quite confident uh, that McCord was the most likely individual who would not remain silent. And uh, I didn't, without specifying who it was, I told the president I didn't think that it was possible that all of these individuals would uh, remain silent forever. But, you, but m m Mr. McCord and the incident you've just related are what you had in mind when you made that statement to the president. I, that's correct. Go ahead, if you will. I also, and without repeat, unless you want me to repeat it in full again, uh, because I have repeated it several times now, is the, uh, uh, the matter about the fact of Mr. Hunt's demand that came directly to me through Mr. O'Brien came up in the conversation. Uh, conversation with the president. That is correct. On March 21st. That is correct. Is it fully noted in your in your testimony? Yes, it is. And is the language used in your testimony, the prepared statement, uh, exact enough for us to assume that that is precisely what you said and the president said, to the best of your recollection? Mr. Vice Chairman, I have exercised the greatest degree of care. Uh, particularly with my conversations with the President in my written statement. I have tried to not overstate anything and, and pursuant to the Committee's desire to have the facts to, to not understate anything. All right. Now, how many, just so I know whether to ask you to do that again or not, how many more meetings are there that you need to describe? Uh, well, there is a, uh, uh, there are several meetings. There's a meeting on the, on the 20, afternoon of the 21st, there's a meeting on the afternoon of the 22nd, and there is a meeting when some of these things were repeated on the uh, 15th of April. All right, we have three more meetings to discuss, is that right? That's correct. And I'm, I think for the sake of time, I'll accept your written statement in that respect. And would you move on then to the afternoon of March 21st? This was a meeting that was attended by uh, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and myself. When the meeting first commenced... In the Oval Office? No, this was in the Executive Office. Uh, when the meeting first commenced, Mr. Ziegler was in the President's office, as I recall, and as the meeting settled down, uh, Mr. Ziegler departed the meeting very uh, shortly thereafter. I have no recollection of how long he was, was in there, but I wouldn't say... Uh, Oh, uh, four, five, ten minutes at the most uh, was he there, but there was no conversation because he was still conversing with the president about uh, some press matter at that point in time. Anyway, for the purposes of your narrative now, can we assume that Mr. Ziegler was not privy to any of the Watergate conversation? That is correct. All right, so go ahead. And uh, 
that meeting uh, is the meeting in which there were uh, there were discussions about having uh, Mr. Mitchell come down, and there were some discussions about this committee, and there were some discussions about uh, uh, the fact that I was going to go to the grand jury, as I recall. Uh, but I, my, I was very, I have a, a very difficult time recalling that meeting for this reason. I was very upset that what had occurred that morning uh, had not accomplished the goal that I wanted it to accomplish. And will. so the most important thing, Senator, if I might finish, that occurred during that meeting is that the President would, as was an often practice with the President, would go around to each individual to ask them for their judgment on a given point. And every time he got to me, I would say, no, I disagree. And finally, it got around to, well, why do you disagree? And for the first time, I said in front of the, the President and in front of Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman, I said, I think that Mr. Holloman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and m myself are indictable. Now, you anticipated my question. I was about to say, if you would, please state the important feature of that conversation. Is there any other significant and important part of the afternoon conversation? Other that, is, that, that is certainly the most significant thing, because I can recall that uh, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman was rather unhappy that I said that uh, when I when I said that. What did Mr. Ehrlichman say, or how did he express his unhappiness? Well, it was kind of a, not, you know, a look and a, you know, kind of a pained expression, and uh, 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 he didn't uh, uh, reach across the table and swing at me or anything of that nature, but it was quite evident that uh, uh, when one man looks at another man, you can tell if... Uh, in addition to that nonverbal communication, did Mr. Ehrlichman say anything to you at that point that might be significant to this record? I, I think it's uh, I, my recollection of, well, of his particular response is not that good because I just had the very clear impression that, uh, uh, that uh, he was unhappy. I know that subsequently to that, and I don't want to confuse subsequent events with the events that occurred in that, during the course of that meeting, that Mr. Ehrlichman uh, got into a little discussion with me about obstruction of justice laws. And I told him that he ought to pull his, his uh, code down because I'd had a rather interesting engage, in, encounter with Mr. Ehrlichman the very first time I'd met him back in 1970 when he was becoming counsel of the president. He's, I met him in Senator Haruska's office, as a matter of fact, and he said, well, I've just been down in my new office where I'm going to be counsel, and they don't have any law books down there, and that's the first thing I'm going to do is have some law books put in there. Well, when I went to Mr. Ehrlichman's office after he was counsel, he didn't have any law books in his office then either, and so he said, would you bring me a copy of uh, that uh, section of the code? Because I did have the law books in my office, and I taught, thought, told him he ought to look up Section 1503 of the... Title 18 of the United States Code, and particularly read the annotations thereunder. All right, sir. What did Mr. Haldeman say, if anything, when you indicated to the President that you disagreed because you thought Ehrlichman, Haldeman, and Dean were indictable? What reaction did you have from Mr. Haldeman? Particularly, what did he say? I had discussed this with Mr. Haldeman on earlier occasions. I, I don't recall a reaction at the meeting that afternoon because I'd already talked to him about this in a meeting he and I had had shortly after the, uh, uh, the election and before the uh, version of the Dean report, which uh, was put in writing and has been submitted to this committee as an exhibit. But more to the point, and just for the moment, did Mr. Haldeman say anything to you at that juncture? I cannot recall him saying anything at that point, no. Did the President say anything at that point? Now, this was towards the end of the meeting, and... Uh, uh, I'm sure the discussion uh, was that uh, Dean is wrong uh, because there was no uh, uh, no change, and there was discussion about the fact that Mr. Mitchell, uh, that was part of the discussion at that meeting, that Mr. Mitchell should come down the next morning. In fact, when Mr. when uh, during the morning meeting, uh, at the conclusion of the meeting, the president called for Mr. Haldeman to come into the office. And what he told, the, uh, Mr. what the President told Mr. Haldeman was 
is that uh, that John Mitchell should come down and we should and and you all should have a meeting with him. We're back to the morning meeting. We're now. back to the morning meeting. Go ahead. But that's because I'm not going through every detail and I'm all jumping right, back and no, forth no, to explain go it right to you. Ahead. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the next meeting with the president, uh, and I'm leaving out the intervening meetings with Haldeman and Ehrlichman at this point, the next meeting with the president occurred on the afternoon of the 22nd. Before you go to that, Mr. Dean, did the president say anything that you can recall? Well, let me put it in two parts. Did the president say anything when you said that Ehrlichman, Haldeman, and Dean might be indictable? And if he did say something, if you can recall, what did he say? I cannot recall what the president said. Uh, I thought I had uh, uh, dropped a bomb, uh, which I obviously had in front of the president, and uh, certainly the explosion was still going off in my ears, and I wasn't listening. Uh, I was looking at uh, Mr. But you have no recollection that the president did or did not speak? No, as I recall, that the, the, the meeting ended on the note that let's uh, have Mr. Mitchell come down and, and you all have a little discussion with Mr. Mitchell about these problems in the next morning. Who suggested that? Uh, I, I don't know. Oh, I'm fine. trying to be would very you move, careful. Would you move on to the 22nd of March? To the meeting with the president that yes, afternoon? Yes, sir. Uh, the meeting with the president on the 22nd was like many, many meetings that I had attended, uh, in which there was a general discussion of this committee, uh, questions of executive privilege. At one point in that meeting, uh, the president picked up the telephone and called the attorney general because he had a report from, from Mr. Timmons that uh, uh, apparently Mr. Kleinings was not dealing with you uh, uh, on working out problems with this committee. And uh, Mr. Mitchell referred to the fact that the president had uh, no problems accepting the fact that uh, there's probably an over he's overstated the executive privilege position, and he's taking a beating on that, and there should be some retraction or pulling back to a point on that. This was John Mitchell's advice? That is correct. Go ahead, sir. At one point during the discussions, I ex asked the president to excuse myself because I was working on a statement with Mr. Ziegler regarding the gray comment that I had probably lied. I went from, uh, you're familiar with the, uh, the president's uh, uh, executive office office. We were sitting on the sofa in the office. Uh, Mr. Haldeman was sitting in a, in a chair, uh, or Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman were on the sofa. The president was on the chair as you would face the sofa on the right. Mr. Mitchell was on the chair on the left, and I'd pulled up a chair uh, in, at the other end of the table uh, between the president and Mr. Mitchell. And I asked to excuse myself to, to go handle this matter. The president asked me what it was about. I explained to him what it was about. He said, uh, go over to the corner and use the phone by the table, uh, which I did, and went over and had a quiet conversation with Mr. Ziegler for 10 minutes or so on the telephone. Uh, and then I rejoined the meeting, and the discussion was still focusing around this committee and the executive privilege question. At that point, the president turned to me and said, uh, uh, John, I think that you ought to go up and discuss with Senator Irvin uh, the parameters of executive privilege. And I said to the president, I thought that would be very unwise because I am the point and issue in the gray hearings, and I'm up there negotiating my own position. Uh, he agreed, and Mr. Ehrlichman said that he would come up and visit with Senator Irvin on discussing uh, executive privilege vis-a-vis -vis appearances of White House staff. Uh, the meeting uh, was very much of this tenor. There was nothing that dr dramatic that happened, uh, and again, this was somewhat to my surprise. Uh, the, uh, the meeting concluded. Uh, Holloman and Ehrlichman departed the office. Mr. Mitchell stayed and had a social conversation with the president. They were talking about... Uh, were you there at the time? I was, I was in and out for this reason. Uh, now, here's a point that I, I had, had really forgotten about uh, that occurred in front of Mr. Mitchell. Uh, the president said in front of Mr. Mitchell uh, that uh, uh, John has doing, been doing an excellent job on this whole problem, and, and uh, it was just a compliment he paid me 
in front of, of Mr. Mitchell. I was trying to make an arrangement for Mr. Mitchell to meet with Paul O'Brien, who had been wanting to meet with him. And as you know, outside the president's suite there, there is an empty office that he makes available for guests. Uh, I was talking to the receptionist as to Mr. Mitchell's availability of that. I went to that office myself. I called my secretary to tell her to make arrangements for Mr. O'Brien to come over uh, to meet with Mr. Mitchell in that office. I meanwhile went back in the president's office and told the president and Mr. Mitchell that that office had been set up and that my secretary was trying to arrange the meeting so that Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Mitchell could meet. And as I recall, I departed then for Mr. Ziegler's office again to see what had happened with the uh, White House response on Mr. Gray's statement regarding myself. All right. Does that conclude the important aspects of the March 22nd meeting? Uh, I think that does, yes. And once again, with the caveat that whatever else you've said in your prepared statement will be incorporated for the purposes of our uh, colloquy here. Do we move then to April 15th? That is correct. All right. Would you go ahead, please? Well, I might add, now, I had a conversation with the President on uh, March 23rd. All right. Would you tell uh, us In which uh, the President suggested, as he had on previous occasions, and in fact, my wife had, and I had, had talked about it, he had said, uh, uh, John, have you ever been up to, to Camp David? And I said, well, only once on a very brief visit, which had been on November 15th. Where, where was this conversation? These were in the Oval Office, uh, and they would come up at the end of a meeting or something uh, 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 in which he had suggested I go to Camp David uh, to enjoy Camp David. Uh, what, what time during the day of March 23rd? Did I receive the call? Well, I'm not quite sure I understand. All right. Well, there was a meeting. No, I was, I, was referring, I was referring to the fact, I know that there's, has, uh, uh, there's been some, I've, I've read in the press that, you know, the President was continually trying to send me to Camp David. Well. Uh, the invitations I was getting to go to Camp David weren't to go for any person reason other than to go up and enjoy Camp David and relax uh, as during the gray hearings as my name was coming more to the forefront and uh, president was telling me don't bother to read the newspapers that I've been through this sort of thing before and he told me that on countless occasions uh, uh, to ignore the newspapers and, and not let this get to me. Uh, and I had relayed this to my wife and, and told her that uh, the president has been very gracious in saying that uh, we should go to Camp David and enjoy the facilities up there. Was there a meeting on March 23rd? Uh, no, there, there was a telephone call that, that came in. Uh, it must have been after lunchtime sometime. I don't recall precisely when, uh, at what hour, uh, but it, we arrived there at about uh, 3.30 or so. So I would say that the call probably came in, given the fact that's about an over a two-hour ride, about 1, one thirty or so. And I would assume the president was calling from, by then he had left for Florida. Uh, the, uh, the president said to me, he said, uh, uh, the, the most interesting thing I remember that's relevant to your inquiry now is, he said, well, John, your prediction was, was correct. And that was in reference to the fact that on the 21st, I had told him I thought that one of the defendants would uh, uh, would not remain, not all of the defendants would remain silent. And here, in fact, this had occurred when Mr. McCord had submitted his letter to the uh, court on the 23rd. Let's examine that just a moment, Mr. Dean. Did the president say that you were proved correct because McCord has said so and so, or is this an inference you draw from the circumstances? Well, he was quite aware of the fact that McCord had, uh, in the conversation that came up, he was aware of the fact that McCord's letter had been read in court that morning. Tell me what he said, please. Uh, he just acknowledged the fact uh, that uh, uh, the fact that Mr. Mc he was aware of Mr. McCord having sent submitted a letter to the court. Can you recall the language? No, I cannot. But it was your. It is your recollection that the president conveyed to you the information that he knew of the McCord letter to the court. Yes, and then he told me, he said, well, John, your prediction uh, uh, was right. All right, sir, go ahead. And that did stick in my mind very clearly. Um, 
it was after that we entered into a discussion about going to Camp David. He suggested I go up and, and relax. I thought, and were, I thought you were at Camp David. No, sir. I was, I was at my home. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was at my home. Thank you. Uh, I had been surrounded by the press that morning as a result of the preceding day's comment by Mr. Gray. Uh, I, have, I have not made myself terribly available to the press. Uh, at any time during this matter, and my house has been, I might say, uh, staked out almost 24 hours a day by the press. Is this the time when a newspaper or a television reporter tried to interview th through the mail slot? No, that was that was rather recently when uh, when I refused to open the door, and, and she kept pounding on the door, and so I finally opened up the mail slot. And to correct the record on that, I was not on all fours. I was merely... <laughs> on my bending down. <laughs> just to keep accuracy in media. <laughs> and just for the sake of chivalry, we won't say who that was. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> All right, Mr. Dean, go ahead, please. Uh, it was... Then we entered into a discussion about going to Camp David, and I, I uh, uh, told him, yes, that sounded good, because I told him that, that I was surrounded by the press, and he again repeated what he'd repeated to me earlier, that I'd been under you know, a lot of press, press uh, coverage as a result of this. But the important things that you're interested in, he told me not to go to Camp David to write a report. Rather, he told me to go up, relax for a couple of days, take my wife, and he, he told me he does his best thinking at Camp David, and that what I should do is go up and assess the entire situation and figure out where we go from here. And I told him I would do that. I told him I would go up and, and think over the entire matter. This was on March 23rd. That is correct. Now, it's when I arrived at Camp David on March 23rd, I might in, we, had, uh, we had some incidental... Uh, uh, conversation about that as a result of the fact that some of the other first family was up there, but I don't think that's relevant at all, and I don't think it's even relevant to my testimony at this point. Um, the um, uh, when I arrived at Camp David, the phone was ringing in the in the uh, cabin that my wife and I were staying in, and, and the operator came on and said, it's the president's calling. And when I, and I waited, and uh, the president didn't come on. Rather, Mr. Haldeman came on the phone. And Mr. Haldeman said, uh, uh, we had a little further conversation, brief conversation about uh, uh, McCord's letter, because I had not spoken with him during the day on the, on the McCord letter. I'd talked to Mr. Ehrlichman earlier that day about the McCord letter. I uh, recall Mr. Holloman saying that he had understood that uh, McCord basically had hearsay, and I said that was my understanding. Uh, so I, I assumed from that that Mr. Uh, Holloman had obviously talked to somebody also about the matter. Uh, and then he said, while you're up there, uh, why don't you write up a report on this matter? And I asked him, was it for internal or external use, and he said that would be decided later. So I was very much in a quandary as to how to write, to what he wanted to write, uh, but I'd also, uh, by the time I got to Camp David, had well evidence to, to everybody I was dealing with that uh, I was thinking far differently about the continued cover-up than I think others were. This is a conversation with Mr. Haldeman. That is correct. All right. Would you proceed to the next conversation with the President? That will take us to April uh, 15th. Now, this, this meeting was at, indirectly at my request. On Saturday the 14th, I had presented a list to Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman uh, and told them 
that I thought, based on the conversations that my counsel had had with the prosecutors and my counsel's assessment of the entire facts of the circumstances, that they were also targets of the grand jury along with myself. Uh, they expressed uh, concern about this and indicated that this was contrary to what Mr. Kleindienst had told them uh, just a short time pre um, preceding that regarding what the grand jury was doing and what it was, uh, which way it was going. Well, now, of course, my conversations with the prosecutors were off the record at this point in time. Uh, so, obviously, the Attorney General would not know it. So, it, uh, after Mr. Ehrlichman, this resulted in the Attorney General meeting with the President on, on, on Sunday, and I believe Mr. Peterson might have been there, I don't know for a fact. Uh, and I uh, had a call from Mr. Ehrlichman all day on Sunday, but I was with my counsel, and uh, we were in another meeting. and. I didn't answer the call until about 7.30 that night, and Mr. Ehrlichman said he happened to be going back into his office, and uh, wouldn't I drive along in and, and have a chat with him about some things he wanted to chat with me. Now, it was quite evident to me that what had happened is that after the President had met with the Attorney General and Mr. Peterson, that uh, Mr. Hallam and Mr. Ehrlichman had gotten, been informed of this, and he wanted to talk to me about why I'd been to the prosecutors. I did not want to talk to Mr. Ehrlichman, Dane, I'm sorry, but it's 3 o'clock, and I'm going to run out of time, and I'm going to miss another vote. But would you tell me of your conversation with the President on the 15th? All right, I'll go right into that. Um, I was a little rattled by the fact that I had not been to the President to tell him I'd been to the prosecutors when I went in. Uh, to be rather specific, he, he, was, he realized I was rattled, and I had had enough rapport with him by this time that I was comfortable in dealing with him. Uh, I had thought on the way in, uh, I wonder if I am being set up by the President. Uh, now, this was an awful thought to run through my own mind, uh, because I knew that Haldeman and Ehrlichman knew uh, that anything the President asked me, I would answer. And I would answer truthfully, uh, uh, you just don't lie to the President of the United States. Move on to the conversation. Right. Well, I'm telling you, all right, the conversation. So the, uh, the President offered me uh, a cup of coffee. First and of all, where so was the meeting? This was in the Executive Office building. All right. In the President's office there? In the President's office, and correct. Who, and who was present? Uh, the only person that was uh, present were the President and myself, other than when uh, uh, Mr. Sanchez came in with some Coca-Cola for me and went back out. All right, sir, go ahead. I told the president I'd been to the prosecutors. Uh, I told him I didn't believe this was an act of disloyalty. I felt I had to go uh, and do it. I, I said I thought in the end that it would be considered an act of loyalty, and I felt that, and I feel that uh, when I made my decision to go that uh, uh, that was the way I felt. Uh, I told him I thought the matter had to end. I told him that, uh, 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 that in my discussion with the prosecutors, uh, that I had discussed my own involvement and the involvement of others. I told him that I had not discussed any conversations I had had with, with him, with the prosecutors, and I had not had any uh, uh, dealings with the prosecutors vis-a-vis -vis myself and the president. Uh, at one point in the conversation, I recall the president asking me about uh, whether I had reported to him on the fact that Mr. Haldeman had been told by me after the second meeting with uh, Mr. Mitchell on, on February 4th of 1972 about what occurred in that meeting. And I said, yes, I had. And then the president raised the fact uh, that uh, this had come up in a discussion he'd had with Henry Peterson. And Peterson had raised with him uh, why, uh, why hadn't Haldeman done something to stop it. 
And then the president went on to tell me, he said, well, now, John, you just, you, you testify to that when asked. Now, I, I want you to testify to that when asked, uh, that you told Mr. Haldeman. Um, at one point in the conversation, and I'm just r rambling through the high points and not going through every detail here. Uh, at one point in the conversation, we talked about the fact that Liddy was remaining silent. Uh, the president at this point, I told him that I thought that Mr. Liddy was looking for some sort of signal, or he told me that he got from Peterson, I believe, that, that the president uh, had the impression that Liddy was looking for signal. I said, yes, that's my understanding also, that Mr. Liddy is looking for some sort of signal. And I said, what might be the signal is if you were to meet with Liddy's attorney. At this point, he picked up the telephone and called Mr. Peterson. He being the president. He being the president. Uh, and told Mr. P and once he got Mr. Peterson on the telephone, he uh, winked, the president winked at me and said, uh, well, I'd had, like I wasn't in the office, uh, and began his conversation with Mr. Peterson about the fact that he was willing to, uh, to talk to Liddy's lawyer if necessary to give Mr. Liddy the signal to talk. Uh, Mr. Peterson, I don't, I didn't hear the other end of the conversation, but he talked about some other things with Mr. Peterson that uh, uh, I don't know what they were. What else? We're speaking of April 15th. That is correct. I recall also the, the president asking me about Henry Peterson and my assessment of Henry Peterson, and I assume this was prompted by the message that I had sent to the president earlier uh, regarding Mr. M Mr. Peterson when I sent a message through to him that I didn't want to talk to Ehrlichman. I told him I thought that Mr. Peterson was a man who was one of the most able uh, uh, criminal lawyers uh, in the business, that he could give the president a good assessment of, of the entire circumstance. Uh, and I told him that he ought to take his own personal counsel from Mr. Peterson. Now, I didn't feel like telling the president that he had problems but I thought that I was giving the president a very clear signal that he ought to, might want to talk to Mr. Peterson about uh, his own situation. I told him that I didn't think that Mr. Peterson would want to do anything to see the presidency harmed and uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Peterson was a, a very, very well-respected uh, man at the Department of Justice who uh, uh, plays it right down the middle and he'll give you the best advice in the world. And that's uh, my assessment of Mr. Peterson. What, did, what else happened? What else was said by the president or by you? Uh, the, the president at that time uh, expressed appreciation for my uh, evaluation of Mr. Peterson. I recall, and, and this is not in my testimony because it's now falling on the uh, something I've remembered at the end of the Peterson conversation, there was also some discussion about my feelings about appointing a special prosecutor, and he said something to the effect that uh, uh, I don't think we need a special prosecutor at this time, do you? And I said, I think that Mr. Peterson is an honorable, uh, capable man to handle the job. Was there anything else? At some point in the conversation, and I believe this was towards the earlier part of the conversation, uh, the question came up as to whether I had immunity from the government uh, in, as a result of my dealings with the prosecutors. And I told the president uh, that my lawyers had discussed this with the government, but I assured him, and this is very clear in my mind because it later uh, came back to, to surprise me at, when I read a subsequent statement of the president, I told the president that I have no deal, I can assure you, with the government at all. The, uh, 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 the president at that point said, and I remember this very clearly, he said, John, well, I will do nothing, I assure you, to interfere in any way with your negotiations with the government. And that would be fairly close to the words uh, I believe he used. I think I mentioned earlier also, I don't, I don't know, just in this sequence of going through this particular meeting, that uh, 
the president asked me if I remembered the date at which I had given him uh, uh, the report on the implications of the, of the Watergate, and I said that uh, before before I got my answer out, he said, I think that was on March 21st. Uh, do you recall if that's correct or not? And he said, no. I, I said, I'd had to check my own records uh, to, to find out what date that was. Now, now, let me examine that a little more. The president asked you what? He, he asked me if I remembered what day it was in March that I had given him my report on the implications of the Watergate. Some, some words to that effect again. And I, before I got my answer out, as he said, I believe it was on the 21st. And I said to him, I would have to check on my records or check the records to determine uh, exactly what day that was. And I might add that that came up again on Monday afternoon when he told me he had checked and determined that, indeed, that was the 21st. Was it the 21st? Yes, it was the 21st. What else, sir? We had some discussion about the fact that, uh, that uh, I had discussed no national security matters uh, with the prosecutors. Uh, or he, he instructed me that I could not to, to deal with uh, national security matters or any uh, matters with regard to executive privilege, and I assured him that I had not at that point uh, had any such conversations with the prosecutors. Then it was towards the, the end of the uh, conversation that he raised on his own uh, and asked me if I remembered when he had mentioned the fact that uh, it wouldn't be any problem to pay a million dollars. And I said, yes, I recall that conversation. And he said, uh, uh, well, of course, I was joking. I was only joking when I said that. And uh, then shortly after that, I recall uh, uh, that he got up from his chair and walked behind his chair to the corner of the office. Uh, I don't know if you're the chair he normally sits in when he's in the executive office uh, building, but he has one favorite chair over beside his desk. He got up and went around the chair to the back of the chair, and in a barely audible tone to me, uh, but I could hear what he was saying, he said, do you, uh, he said, I was, I, w I was foolish to talk with Colson about executive clemency for Hunt, uh, wasn't I? And I don't recall making any statement uh, or response to that. It was sort of a declarative statement, and I, uh, I said nothing. What else? Well, as I say, shortly after he got out of his chair, I don't recall him getting back in his chair, and we began exchanging some pleasantries as I was leaving the office. And uh, as I was leaving the office, uh, uh, he said to me, uh, uh, say hello to your pretty wife and, and uh, uh, some things of this nature, uh, which I came home and conveyed to her because she always liked to hear those things. And then also, but it, it's, as I was standing by the door, I remember I had the door open, and I turned to the president, who was standing not uh, ten feet away from me, and told the president that I certainly hoped uh, uh, that the fact that I was going to come forward and tell the truth uh, did not result in impeachment of the president. And I told him that uh, uh, I hoped the thing would be handled right, and he assured me that it would be handled right, and that the meeting ended on that note. Is that the last meeting or conversation you had with the president? No, sir. I met with him uh, the next Monday morning in which he uh, called, called me and asked me to come in the office. I received the call while I was... I re before uh, I'd really left to come in. Hold just one minute. The next meeting would have been April what? Uh, April 16th. All right. And is that the last meeting? No, sir. Uh, well, there were two meetings on April 16th. One call on, on the uh, uh, 17th, and then a call on Easter morning. It's 3.15, and I promised to take 20 minutes, and I've taken an hour. 
and I'm sorry for that, and I have not the slightest intention of proceeding even to my second question, which was to ask your assistance in identifying the probable areas of conflict between your testimony and that of other witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this time, and I'm willing to yield at this point. Mr. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I might just comment briefly on, on, the, on your second question. I'm quite aware of the fact that in some circumstances, it's going to be my word against one man's word. It's going to be my word against two men. It's going to be my word against three men. And probably in some cases, it's going to be my word against four men. But I'm prepared to stand on my word uh, and the truth and the knowledge and the facts I have. And uh, uh, I know the truth is my ally in this. And I think ultimately, the truth is going to come out Mr. Dean, I, I might say that the reason I had intended to formulate that question was in anticipation of conflict and the very point that you make. The alternative way to handle that, of course, would be to have rebuttal or sir rebuttal from you after we receive the other testimony. That is, if there is conflict, the committee may wish to recall you to uh, testify further, or it may not. But since time is moving on, I think it's better to wait and make that judgment later, and I assume that you, like every other witness, would be willing to return if that seems indicated. I stand uh, at the subpoena of the committee at this point in time, and if the committee desires me back, I will return. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I found the record in the exhibit. I asked you a question as to whether Governor George Wallace of Alabama was among, listed among uh, the enemies and I find that uh, on the page about uh, uh, 12 black congressmen, the, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, nine, the 12 congress, uh, uh, congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and uh, uh, 11 congressmen were named. And then there's uh, miscellaneous politicos. John V. Lindsay, Mayor of New York City, Eugene McCarthy, former United States Senator, and George Wallace, Governor of Alabama. Now, before I, I guess silent, I've been uh, furnished by the Library of Congress through the agency of uh, Senator Norrie, a extract, Xerox copy of uh, extract from the New York Tribune, February the 14th, 1862, which has an item of uh, historical value. It's entitled, The Premature Publication of the President's Message. President Lincoln today voluntarily appeared before the House Judiciary Committee and gave testimony in the matter of the premature publication in the Herald of a portion of his last annual message. Chevalier Wil Wilcock, Will Will Wickham, I guess the way it went was then brought before the committee and answered the question which he refused to answer yesterday, stating as is rumored that the stolen paragraph was furnished to the Herald by Watt, the President's gardener, who was reported as disloyal by the Potter Committee and whose nomination to a lieutenancy the Senate so decided refused to confirm, but who is still to be seen in the White House and is said to be an applicant for a foreign appointment. The public can learn from this case in what source it is the taste of the Herald to fish for sake of state secrets. The Chevalier is still in close confinement to capital in quarters at which his fastidious tastes revolt. <laughs> An iron bedstead was purchased for him today. His most frequent visitor is said to be General Sickles. The first paper taken by the officers out of the pocket book of the special representative of the New York Herald, now in Fort McHenry, was a pass admitting Dr. Ives at all hours to the War Department signed George B. McClellan. That's the uh, item concerning the matter in which uh, President Lincoln voluntarily appeared and testified for the House Committee. Mr. Committee. Chairman, I, I might say in that same respect, although my precedent isn't nearly as old as your precedent, that I believe in 1919, in conjunction with the efforts to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, that rather than a president appearing before a committee of the Congress, that in fact the president invited a committee to meet with him. So, as we say in Tennessee, there are lots of ways to skin a cat. <coughs> and I wouldn't presume to say how we go about it, but I do hope that 
there is some way to supply additional information on these crucial and important points. Mr. Chairman, might I say one other thing on an unrelated matter? Congressman Gary Brown has written a letter to this committee that references directly to certain statements made by Mr. Dean. Congressman Brown has also indicated to me that he wishes to file a sworn statement in compliance with the rules of the committee. And I would ask if there is no objection, but both the letter and the statement that Congressman Brown may later submit be included in the record at the appropriate place. Without objection, it's so, it's so altered. So with those precedents for bringing the president into the congressional investigation, we're going to take a short break. Next up is Senator Inouye. Public television's complete coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPAC continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we return to the hearings, the committee is going into a dispute over what it is empowered to investigate. Senator Inouye is about to examine the witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dean, I, I have a few questions I'd like to follow up on. In your colloquy with uh, Senator Baker on the meeting of April 14th, which time you've testified that you had a discussion with the president on April the matter of April 15th, Senator. 15th, yes. On the matter of immunity? That is correct. And you've indicated that the president told you that he will make no effort to interfere in your negotiations with the government? He made that very clear to me, Senator, and I might say that that was one of the things that led me to issue the statement that I did regarding my unwillingness to be a scapegoat in this matter. Do you think at that time the president was aware that you had evidence that might incriminate him? I'm sure he was aware of the conversations we'd had, and as I have indicated to the committee, uh, because of the nature of the conversation, because of subsequent events, uh, I had reason to believe that that conversation was being taped. Uh, the subsequent events that gave me further confirmation of that were the fact that the prosecutors indicated the president had indicated to Mr. Peterson that he had taped my conversation, uh, or allegedly taped my conversation, and then I had said that I had immunity in exchange for the testimony of Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman. This is my final question relating to the matter of friends and enemies. Uh, first, may I touch upon the matter of friends? You indicated earlier that uh, the White House was looking into a tax matter involving a very, uh, involving a person very close to the president. And I believe you indicated that he was guilty up to his teeth? That is correct. Was this matter at that moment in the hands of the Criminal Investigation Division? When it was first brought to my attention, it was still at the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, I was asked to see what I could do about it. I called uh, and spoke with Mr. Walters on this case and told him uh, what the concern was. Uh, I then, he told me at that point in time, he said, uh, uh, well, let me back up just a moment. The individual involved was said that he thought that he was being harassed by the agents of the Internal Revenue Service. This, I raised this with Mr. Walters. He said he assured me that that could not be the case after he looked into it. He said that th there's a very strong case against this individual uh, and uh, that ultimately it's going to be transferred to the uh, uh, tax division at the Department of Justice for further analysis. I merely asked to be kept advised of the status of the case because I felt that the president may want to know uh, because this was an individual the president saw with great regularity and I got questions on it with uh, considerable regularity. Did the president personally express interest in this? Um, it's, 
it gets more and more painful to bring these names out, uh, as it was. It's painful to bring the president's name out. It's painful to bring out other people. It was Rosemary Woods who kept asking me the status of the case uh, because this individual was seeing the president a good deal. What is the status of the case? Well, as I say, it was ultimately referred over to the um, uh, to the civil Divi or the tax division of the uh, Department of Justice. I asked to be advised on the various status of the case. I told uh, Ms. Woods at one point that she should just stay as far away from this case as possible. She was seeing the individual, uh, would have encounters with the individual who was the subject of the, of the tax case, and he would protest his innocence to her. He's a fine man, and, uh, he, and she was quite uh, uh, convinced of his innocence and couldn't believe that uh, he wasn't being harassed by agents that uh, uh, were trying to get somebody who was close to the president. Uh, the individual was using the president's name a great deal. Uh, he was traveling with the president to uh, China and Russia and other places and uh, the like. Uh, as a result of this, I merely asked that I be kept advised of the status of the case. When it was at the Justice Department, uh, the Justice Department assessed it. Uh, I had a conversation with Mr. Ralph Erickson. He said, there's nothing we can do with this. There's one thing more we can do, and that is there are some weaknesses in the investigation. We may send it back to Internal Revenue Service for one last look to make sure that this fella, it really is a solid case. They did that. It came back an absolutely solid case. I said, well, don't touch it. Send it right on through. And that's what they did, and the case is proceeding forward. Has it been indicted? I don't know what, uh, if he's been indicted yet, uh, uh, but I... Uh, know that there is no, to my knowledge, or, uh, from my knowledge, there is nothing that has been done to impede the case. Mr. Erickson was fired, wasn't he? Was he fired? Yes. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think that is quite accurate. No. Would you wish to tell us who this important individual is? It might affect his tax case. Then please don't tell us. <laughs> I'd like to now uh, discuss a case involving an enemy. Mr. Dean, I'm certainly aware that these hearings, unfortunately, may have permanently damaged the reputations of good and decent people. Furthermore, uh, reputations have been destroyed in past months and past years by activities uh, allegedly related to activities in the White House. In your statement, uh, you mentioned that on February the 28th, 1973, you were asked to look into the case of Mr. A. Ernest Fitzgerald by Mr. Clark Molinoff. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. This gentleman is the one, the fellow who worked in the Air Force, Department of the Air Force? That is correct. And he is the person who was requested by a duly authorized Senate committee to testify on the C-5A? That is correct. I believe it is very important to Mr. Fitzgerald to learn whether he was re released or fired because of uh, reduction in force in the Air Force, as the Air Force claims, or whether he was fired either by the Air Force or on the orders of the White House or the President because he told the truth about the $2 billion cost overrun of the C-5A. If we can clear the reputation of one man, I think this committee would have done well today. So may I ask a few questions? Senator. Was the President of the United States concerned about the Fitzgerald case? Um. May I preface my uh, answer with, with this? Uh, I believe it was in the January 31st night of this year that uh, Mr. Mullenhoff raised this at a press conference. Uh, the president was caught totally off guard by the answer, and uh, uh, what you might say is he, he sort of was winging it on how to respond to Mr. Mullenhoff's answer. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation that got into the 
into the record, the president apparently confused two or three other cases he was aware of. He had remembered the name Fitzgerald, and as a result of that, Mr. Ziegler had a conversation with the president. After having other conversations with Mr. Uh, Mullenhoff, uh, Mr. Ziegler said, the president wants you to get into this. I subsequently had that uh, instruction directly from the president also. Uh, I had a man on my staff uh, handle this. I was not directly handling it, and as I told Mr. Mollenhoff when he and I had several telephone conversations, that uh, uh, I said, Clark, this is one I'm going to have to study, but I haven't gotten into it right yet. I still have not had a chance to get into it, and I think uh, based on my testimony, you can see what I was doing, why I wasn't uh, able to get into the, the Fitzgerald case. So I'm not terribly familiar with the substance of the Fitzgerald case. So it'll be very difficult for me to answer those questions. And I had full intention uh, of looking into the matter, but before I got to it, I was uh, relieved from my duties at the White House. Did the president ever tell you why he was interested in the Fitzgerald case? No, he merely said uh, uh, he merely said that he didn't want Mr. Mullenhoff to keep re-raising it at every pro press conference, and so would I work with him. Do you know if Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman are, were interested? Uh, there is a rather extensive file in the White House on Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, that uh, was retrieved at one point by the member of my staff who was bringing the material in so I could at last read it all. There were, there were the hearings and a book that Mr. Fitzgerald had written, and then there was uh, correspondence and the like. I never got the opportunity to read those materials to make an assessment. Uh, based on my conversations with Mr. Wilson uh, of my staff, uh, I thought that Mr. Mullenhoff, frankly, had a very good point and I thought it was something that should be looked into. And I thought there might have been errors that should be corrected. You've indicated that this case was assigned to someone on your staff. That is correct. Who is this person? Uh, Mr. David Wilson. Is he still in the office of the No, council? sir. He, uh, he has now gone to, I believe, the Cost of Living Council. Mr. Chairman, uh, And I've... his departure is totally unrelated to the Watergate. He, uh... Uh, uh, went over there because he was looking for a, another job. He'd grown in the job he was in. Uh, there was a general staff reduction at the White House. I was also to tailor some of my staff. Uh, and there was an excellent opportunity for him. He's a very bright, capable uh, young lawyer, and uh, he's still there, and I'm sure he may still have some familiarity, or if he were to re-examine the records, uh, uh, he might be able to be of some assistance to the senator on this matter. Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Fitzgerald's reputation has been unjustly injured, and if this committee can in any way uh, assist Mr. Fitzgerald in well, regaining his reputation... Senator, I, I don't believe that this matter falls within the jurisdiction of this committee under the resolution. I think it's uh, alien to the, what we authorized to investigate. I, I brought this up because we were discussing all day the matter of friends and enemies, and uh, I presume this man was on the enemy list. I don't know, but uh, we, uh, uh, as I, I, I don't believe we're authorized to investigate Mr. Fitzgerald's case. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it might be well to invite Mr. Wilson to help clear Mr. Fitzgerald. Otherwise, once again, thank you very I, much. I, Mr. Would, I would merely offer this to the, uh, the senator. I think that uh, uh, if Mr. Mullenhoff re raises it at one or two more press conferences, it may be given attention again. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Uh, senator Garner, do you have any further questions? Just one, uh, Mr. Chairman, to clarify the record. In the morning session, uh, Mr. Dean in Mr. Inouye, Senator Inouye's questioning on pressure being brought to bear on any of the members of the committee, you did mention that you had had prior dealings with the chairman, with Senator Gurney, and with Senator Weicker. Now, this came up in a context of pressure being brought to bear on members of the committee and also... No, sir. I, I, as I my recollection of the question was... Uh, when we were assessing members of the committee, 
uh, who was I familiar with on the committee? And the only people that I knew uh, uh, by reputation or any personal dealings on the committee uh, were uh, you from your uh, years in the House, uh, Senator Weicker from my knowledge of him in the House, and uh, that was about the extent of my knowledge. Well, I realize that, but it did come up in context, uh, this questioning about pressure on the committee of digging up dirt, and I thought we ought to clarify what the prior dealings were. None of these prior dealings with the chairman, Senator Irvin, or myself, or Senator Weicker had anything to do with Watergate, did it? No, sir. The, my uh, recollection of my own personal contacts with you is only one, although yours are two. One occurred in Senator Ruska's office during the Kleindienst confirmation hearings when you met with the Republican senators, and I was among those, on the Judiciary Committee and discussed the uh, pending uh, request to have Peter Flanagan, a White House counsel, I guess his uh, job is, to testify before the committee in response to a request by our Chairman Senator Irvin on the committee. That was one of the occasions, and I recall that we uh, suggested with our advice that the White House had better send him up. This was a matter of executive privilege, otherwise he wouldn't be confirmed. Is that your recollection of our meeting? Uh, that uh, I have a vague recollection of because I wasn't the principal uh, actor in that. The meeting I recall was during the uh, same set of hearings when you were going to appear on either Face the Nation or Meet the Press or one of the national television shows, and I was instructed to provide you uh, with briefing material for you and your staff to go over in preparation for that appearance. This was and a I discussion. Brought Mr. Yes, I brought Mr. Fielding up with me, and we had a very cordial brief uh, meeting. Mr. Fielding, I understand, had some subsequent meetings with you and your staff and uh, uh, prepared you for that briefing session on, uh, on national television. That was the discussion with Senator Tunney, as I recall it, on the whole matter of executive privilege that came up during the Kleindienst hearings. Is that correct? Uh, I think that's correct. It definitely had to do with the, uh, with the Kleindienst hearings, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, I'd like to state uh, uh, my impression was this matter that uh, referred to the allegation that Mr. Haldeman had called down to North Carolina about me had reference to the time I was fighting the impoundment and no reference whatever to this committee. And I was very sorry it was brought out here. I never attributed any importance to it. And uh, it didn't bother me at all. And the, I, my, understanding had no, my understanding had no relation whatsoever to my service on the, uh, the Senate Select Committee, but was that Mr. Haldeman was apparently distressed because I was taking a very strong stand in respect to the presence of power on the Constitution to impound funds. I think that was what it, uh, if he did anything, I think that was what provoked him and not my service on this committee. And I just think in fairness to everybody that I will state that. Chairman, uh, I just have uh, one further precedent along the lines of the precedent cited by the chairman and the vice chairman, and that uh, appears in uh, Carl Sandburg's book uh, on Abraham Lincoln, The War Years, where he writes, yet the talk of a southern woman spy in the White House arrived at the point where Senate members of the Committee on the Conduct of the War had set a secret morning session for attention to reports that Mrs. Lincoln was a disloyalist. So the story goes, though vaguely authenticated. One member of the committee told of what happened. We had just been called to order by the chairman when the officer stationed at the committee room door came in with a half-frightened expression on his face. Before he had opportunity to make explanation, we understood the reason for his excitement and were ourselves almost overwhelmed with astonishment. For at the foot of the committee table stood solitary, his hat in his hand, his form towering, Abraham Lincoln stood. Had he come by some incantation, thus of a sudden appearing before us unannounced, we could not have been more astounded. There was almost 
unhuman sadness in the eyes, and above all, an indescribable sense of his complete isolation, which the committee member felt had to do with fundamental senses of the apparition. No one spoke, for no one knew what to say. The President had not been asked to come before the committee, nor was it suspected that he had information that we were to investigate reports which, if true, fastened treason upon his family in the White House. At last, the morning caller spoke slowly with control, though a depth of sorrow in the tone of voice. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, appear of my own volition before this committee of the Senate to say that I, of my own knowledge, know that it is untrue that any of my family hold treasonable communication with the enemy. Having attested this, he went away as silent and solitary as he had come. We sat for some moments speechless, and by tacit agreement, no word being spoken, the committee dropped all consideration of the rumors that the wife of the President was betraying the Union. We were so greatly affected that the committee adjourned for the day. Mr. Chairman, on another subject, having already cited my precedent for the day and not wanting to one-upsmanship one my colleagues, I have something entirely different. I have before me a letter from Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina. If there's no objection, I'd like to include it in the record and read it briefly. Stated June, June 22, 1973, from Senator Thurmond. Earlier testimony in today's hearings carried the impression that a friend of mine, Mr. Harry Dent of South Carolina, might have done something improper. I would greatly appreciate it if you gentlemen would set the record straight before today's hearings are completed. The testimony that I referred to came about during the questioning by Senator Inoue regarding attempts by Republicans to, quote, find dirt, close quote, on Senator Irvin. Mr. Dean said that Harry Dent had been contacted, but no one stated that Mr. Dent declined. I suggest that this be brought out by questioning or by permission to insert a number of news stories which appeared in the press which indicated that Mr. Dent had declined to do any of that type of research against Senator Irvin. Thank you for your cooperation in this matter. If I may add to that, the, the newsman who wrote the article informed me that he had contacted Mr. Dent, and Mr. Dent had assured him that he had, had nothing whatever to do with that matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In fairness to Mr. Dent, Mr. Well, Chairman, I, I believe, believe I also answered no question that indicated any wrongdoing or misdoing on Mr. Dent's behalf. I was merely asked what his role was, what he was doing now, and I think I misspoke myself when I said he was practicing law in North Carolina when I meant South Carolina is the only uh, And if I might state further on that thing, I, I, I stated what uh, Charles R. Jonas Jr. had stated, and I want to state that um, I appreciate that much. I had known his grandfather, Charles A. Jonas, who was congressman of my district, elected in 1928, and a very fine gentleman. And also his father represented... Uh, a North Carolina district, which included in part my county for many years, and he rendered a very distinguished service to uh, North Carolina and the nation as a congressman for a period of 20 odd years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dash. Uh, Mr. Dean, uh, first, I think the record ought to be corrected from yesterday's testimony. I think it's an error in the record and would uh, ask your assistance in correcting it. We received this has to do with your reference to uh, Mr. Fielding's knowledge, and we received a letter from Mr. Ronald P. Wertarm, uh, counsel for Mr. Fielding. The record as it presently reads on page uh, 2824 of yesterday's transcript uh, has you testifying, quote, I think Mr. Fielding probably had a general awareness about the specifics of the fact that I was involved in assisting with the cover-up. The recollection of Mr. Wertheim, who heard your testimony, was that you, in fact, said, I think Mr. Fielding probably had a general awareness without any specifics of the fact that I was involved in assisting the cover-up, which is correct. I think the latter is correct, as I recall the, the statement. I then we'll see that the, rec that the record is correct to reflect that. Uh, now, 
Mr. Dean, what I'd I know that we've gone through all of these hearings or meetings with the President, and I'm going to be, try to be very brief. There's only one, there's one particular meeting that I do, do want to go back to because I think it's a very crucial one. And I just want to hit the highlights with you because I think that, and this is the meeting of September 15, uh, 1972, that you had with the President. I think it's significant. One is, as you testified, frankly, it was, a, it was the first meeting you had with the President on a one-to-one -one basis was, was, was your language. And two, it was the date, September 15th, when the indictments came down of the first Watergate trial, which cut off the involvement at Liddy, and that you were called in to have a meeting with the President. <coughs> now, I think that what I want to just clear up is what was a realistic version of the meeting and perhaps an unrealistic version that may have come up in questioning concerning that meeting. Uh, as I understand that what you testified to was that when you came in and leaving out other areas, but getting to the specifics, that the President told you that Bob Haldeman had kept him posted on how you had handled the Watergate case. And you were asked a question as to whether or not the President had in fact told you about his knowledge of the Watergate had, uh, case, uh, had indicated any knowledge on his part of any of the cover-up. And I, the question first I'd like to ask is, would you have expected in any relationship with the President for the President to ask you to come in and said that Bob Haldeman had told me about your covering up of the Watergate case, your assisting Jeb Magruder in committing perjury, or things of that kind? It wasn't uh, the nature of that type of conversation, so I wouldn't have expected that type of uh, further follow-up questioning, no, sir. All right, but when the President told you uh, that Bob Haldeman had told or kept him posted on how you would handle the Watergate case, and he also indicated from your testimony that he appreciated how difficult a task it was, uh, you were asked, did you, did you tell the President? what you in fact had done, uh, that you had assisted Magruder in committing perjury, that you had persisted in the cover-up, that you had limited the FBI investigation or actually got the CIA involvement. Now, would it have been realistic in that circumstance if the President had said that Bob Haldeman had kept him posted for you to say, and was congratulating you on how you had handled your job, for you to say, that's right, Mr. President, uh, you know what you're telling me is that, and what I want you to know is that I had got Mr. Magruder to commit perjury before the grand jury, and that I had also uh, limited the FBI investigation, et cetera. Uh, would that be a realistic response of yours in such a meeting? Uh, I don't believe it would be, no. As a matter of fact, when you were told that Bob Haldeman had kept, when the President told you that Bob Haldeman had kept him posted on how you had handled the Watergate case, you knew very well how you would handle the Watergate case, did you not? That is correct. And in fact, that did, that did involve your uh, s having Mr. Magruder perjure himself before the committee and other types of things, such as payoffs and limiting the FBI investigation. That is correct. And you knew that Bob Haldeman knew that? That is correct. From your knowledge of Mr. Haldeman's relationship with the President, and you've said that when you were with the President and in that Oval Office, you never lied to the President. From your knowledge of Mr. Haldeman's relationship with the President, would it be your opinion that Mr. Haldeman would lie to the President? It would be to the contrary. I don't think Mr. Haldeman would lie to the President. I don't know of anybody that would walk into the Oval Office and lie to the President. So that if Mr. Haldeman had kept the President posted on exactly how you handled the Watergate case, he would have told the President exactly how you handled the Watergate case, which included the cover-up? That is correct. Then you told the President, according to your own statement at that time, that you had only been able to contain the case and that you could not assure that someday it would not become unraveled. Is that not right? That is correct. Did the President ask you what you meant by that? No, he did not. Now, also at that time, you discussed the civil case. And isn't that the time you told the President that the lawyers for the Committee for the Re-election of the President had developed an ex-party relationship to influence uh, the judge? That is correct. And then the President, according to your statement at that time, say, uh, that will be helpful. That is correct. And during the course of that meeting on September 15th, you got into the Patman Committee hearing. That's correct also. Now, on the Patman Committee hearings, what was, what was the concern about those hearings 
Well, look, the concern was twofold. One, that would cause further embarrassment to uh, the White House um, prior to the election by more headlines about the Watergate. And secondly, it could uh, uh, result in the Patman investigators stumbling into something that might start unraveling the cover-up. Well, do you have a copy of Exhibit Number 20, which you have submitted to the committee? Yes, I do. All right, now, that exhibit has uh, attached to it, uh, there's a letter or a memorandum uh, under the letterhead of the United States House of Representatives uh, Committee of uh, Banking and Currency, and it's from uh, Chairman Wright Patman, and there's attached a list of individuals that were to be subpoenaed before the Patman Committee. Now, was there anything significant in that list of individuals who were going to be subpoenaed before the Patman Committee? Yes, there was. I might add, Mr. Dash, that the, the list that was submitted or made public on this date had informally, the bulk of the list was already in the possession of the White House through the Congressional Relations staff long before this was actually made public. Well, your name appeared on that list, didn't it, that on is page correct. two? That is correct. And Mr. LaRue's name? That is correct. And a number of the witnesses have already appeared here and have been questioned by the grand jury. Jeb Magruder on page three, Robert Martian, John Mitchell. Robert Odell, Herbert Porter, Hugh Sloan, Maurice Stans. Now, what were, now if all those witnesses had been called by the Patman Committee at the time those hearings were going to be held and had answered according to that subpoena, what in fact was the concern of the White House? Well, if those hearings had been held, there was a good chance these hearings wouldn't be held today uh, because I think that would have unraveled the, the, uh, the cover-up. What was the instructions that you received with regard to that on that day? On the, on the president. On the 15th? Yes. After reporting to him who was handling it, he told me to instruct. Uh, it was, this was really something that was said to both Mr. Haldeman uh, and myself, that Mr. Timmons should get on top of this, this matter. All right. And now I think you've already testified exactly what did occur. And as a matter of fact, those hearings never went forward. That is correct. Now, after all of those events, after the president having told you that Bob Haldeman had kept them posted on your handling of the Watergate case and that you had, and appreciated how difficult a job that was, and your own statement to the president that you had only contained it and then someday it might unravel, and your own statement to the president that in the civil case an ex-party relationship had been established to influence the judge, and then the discussion on the Patman case, frankly and honestly, Mr. Dean, when you left the president on September 15, did you just have an impression as to his knowledge of the cover-up, or did you have a, con a conviction concerning that? Mr. Dash, there was, there was no doubt in my mind uh, that the president was aware of it, and I would have to, to use your language, say I had a conviction, or I was convinced. Now, Mr. Dean, I don't want to go through the other meetings because they've been thoroughly gone through, but the uh, March 13th meeting, which again was a significant meeting, March 13, 1973, you've testified concerning the discussion about the, that the possible requirement of a million dollars, the President's response to that, and the discussion of executive clemency. Now, the committee does have in its possession uh, some confirmation uh, from uh, the White House uh, that uh, at least the subject matter of the million-dollar discussion did occur, as well as uh, the discussion of executive clemency. And I think we know now that Mr. Fred Buzzard contacted the committee by phone call and that Minority Counsel Mr. Thompson reduced uh, his notes in the form of a memorandum. And those notes have been reviewed in my office by Mr. Buzzard and Mr. Garment, and just with some minor exceptions, which do not relate to this particular reference that I'm going to read to you, uh, Mr. Buzzard and Mr. Garment have informed me in my office that they were not verbatim uh, or detailed, but roughly accurate rec uh, memorandum of the conversation. These were submitted to us for use by this committee in the purpose of questioning you at this time. And I'd like to identify that I am using them for that purpose at this time. Now, according to the memorandum that Mr. Thompson prepared based on that call, this meeting, when the discussion 
according to the White House, on the million dollars in executive clemency took place was March 21st rather than March 13th. Now, uh, that's not correct, uh, to the best of my recollection. I'm very, in fact, I'm very clear on the fact it occurred on the 13th because the, uh, the meeting on the, the 21st was uh, uh, a totally different range of topics than the way this rather casually came up on the 13th. Well, all right, regardless of the date, because I'm sure there'll be disagreement on the date, and you have already testified what date this discussion came up, I think it's important, however, that I read to you the reconstruction of this meeting from the point of view of the White House's that meeting and what it was said. And this is from Mr. Thompson's notes, which, as I've indicated, was uh, his putting down what he recalled from a telephone call from Fred Buzzart, special counsel to the president. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dean stated that Hunt was trying, quote, Mr. Dean stated that Hunt was trying to blackmail Ehrlichman about, about Hunt's prior plumber activities unless he was paid what ultimately might amount to $1 million. The president said, how could it be possibly paid? Quote, what makes you think it would be he would be satisfied with that? Unquote. He stated, the president stated it was blackmail, that it was wrong, that it would not work, and that the truth would come out anyway. Mr. Dean had said that a Cuban group could possibly be used to transfer the payments. Now, is that, to your recollection, a correct statement of how that conversation took place, or is your statement the correct? No, sir. My recollection is there was no discussion of the, uh, uh, what it appears to me what they've done is taken what I did raise on the 21st regarding Mr. Hunt's direct threat of a blackmail nature to John Ehrlichman and confused it with an earlier meeting which occurred on March 13th when the million dollar conversation came up and put the two together some way. Now, did the, do you recall the president ever telling you that it was wrong to uh, pay this million dollars? To the contrary, he said it would be no problem to raise a million dollars. Now, also, the next item in this memorandum states that the president spoke of the, uh, I think this was, your, uh, Mr. Dean spoke of Haldeman's return of the $350,000. Mr. Dean said that Haldeman and Ehrlichman possibly had no legal guilt with regard to the money matters. Did you make such a statement? No, sir. Now, Mr. Dean said, excuse me, let me go back up again. That Mr. Dean said that nothing of his role, said nothing of his role with regard to cover-up money. He said nothing about his discussion with Magruder helping him prepare for the grand jury. He said nothing of his instructions to Caulfield to offer executive clemency. Uh, was, was that true on the 21st? I think the contrary is too true, and I'll rely on my statement, Mr. Dash. Now, there's another reference on that meeting of the 21st, which we have uh, from this communication, oral communication from the White House. It says, Mr. Dean said Colson had talked to Mr. Hunt about executive clemency, period. Uh, is that the way you would put it to the president? No, sir. Uh, as I recall, this initially came up on the 13th was the first time it came up, and the second time it came up was on the 15th, and I believe I've testified several times to the way that it did occur, and uh, I respectfully disagree with that interpretation. Well, but as even stated, uh, if in fact the uh, Mr. Dean had said that Colson had talked to Hunt about executive clemency, and there's nothing further in this memorandum. If the president had not authorized executive clemency, uh, would you have expected the president to have raised a question about that and have called upon you or somebody who had authority to have Mr. Colson retract that? Only the president can promise executive clemency, and Mr. Colson was quite aware of that. Uh, and I think that uh, the facts are that, uh, in fact, Mr. Colson had talked to the president, who in turn had, uh, and then Colson had talked to Mr. Bittman, who in turn had talked to Mr. Hunt. Well, I just want the record to show that in this submission uh, by the White House uh, to the committee, uh, the reference to the executive clemency merely shows that Mr. Dean said Colson had talked to Hunt about executive clemency. There was no reference to any reaction on the president 
whether he had said that he had not authorized that and whether, in fact, he indicated that who had ever done that with, uh, especially Mr. Colson, with Mr. Hunt, that that was to be uh, retracted. The, rec uh, the submission does not have that in it in the a reconstruction of the so-called White House log. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just have this introduced as part of the record, which is I've already identified as a memorandum based on a call. Without objection, be so identified that it made a part of the record. Mr. Chairman, I think that's appropriate to make that a part of the record, but I think its character ought to be clearly understood. This does not, as I understand it, represent a definitive statement of a, quote, White House position, but rather are the transcribed notes of the telephone conversation between Mr. Bussard, an attorney at the White House, and Mr. Thompson, which were turned over to Mr. Dash and reviewed subsequently by Mr. Garment and Mr. Buzzard. Yeah, and, and, and I just want to give their, their statement as to what they intended to do, and that was their reconstruction, having talked to persons who had knowledge of what had occurred in these meetings between the President and Mr. Dean, but basically a reconstruction given to us for the purpose of use in questioning Mr. Dean. I think, Mr. Chairman, that that, as I said a moment ago, is appropriate for that purpose at this time. But I caution against, if I may, taking that as a statement of a White House position or a presidential statement at this time. And I'd rather keep the record open on that to see if we can't do a little All better. Right. I, I, I appreciate that, Senator Baker, and I accept that. And I only submit it as you limited it. Well, I'll make the same the same statement about it that I made at the time that uh, Mr. Dean was cross-examined about uh, the statement from which uh, had come uh, it, at least indirectly from Mr. Buzzard that this is not evidence. It's uh, a statement of Mr. Buzzard's position or, or supposed position as counsel. I'm informed yes, on yesterday Senator Montoya suggested that we, the committee issue a subpoena for Mr. Buzzard. And I suggested at that time, that instead of so doing, that we should have inquiry made of Mr. Buzzard if he claimed to have any personal knowledge of the matters mentioned in his uh, uh, the so called Buzzard statement. And I'm informed that uh, Mr. Buzzard says he has no personal knowledge of those matters. And, I think that, uh, that uh, I've just I informed the chairman that I had such a call with Mr. Buzzhart, and he, uh, as to personal knowledge, uh, he referred to both his reconstruction and uh, to the statement that this is something he prepared as counsel, having uh, discussed it with others or used other information in preparing it. Now, with regard to your involving Mr. Kalmbach in the raising of cash and in the so-called payoffs to maintain silence of the defendants. I think you were questioned, I think by Senator Gurney in his very thorough cross-examination, as to whether or not Mr. Kalmbach really understood from your discussions with him just what he was doing when he was being, or being asked to do, uh, when he was being asked to raise money for the payoffs. And you had indicated that you clearly understood that he did understand because you had fully informed him as to the circumstances. And the question really was raised whether or not Mr. Kalmbach could have got the impression that this was for humanitarian purposes, sort of to raise a defense fund. Now, first, Mr. Dean, I think you testified that you told Mr. Kalmbach just prior to asking him to undertake this assignment what the circumstances were. That is correct. Could you just briefly and very briefly tell us what did you tell Mr. Kalmbach? Well, I told him everything that uh, I knew about the case at that time. I told him that I was very concerned that, uh, that this could lead right to the president. I didn't have any hard facts. I hoped I was incorrect. Uh, I explained to him in full the seriousness of the matter. I related to him the fact that uh, some records had been destroyed, and uh, uh, I told him virtually everything I knew at that time, and I think uh, there was no doubt in his mind about the sensitivity of the, the entire situation. As a matter of fact, Mr. Dean, if there was a general feeling, and I think this was the reference, that is there anything wrong, for instance, if somebody working for you, and after all, Liddy and McCord did work for the committee to reelect the president, is there anything wrong if somebody works for you and gets in trouble uh, for you not really picking up their 
expenses, their lawyers and things like that. I mean, the defense funds have been raised. Now, if that were the attitude, if that were the attitude of the White House and that was the attitude of the Committee for the Re-election of the President with regard to Mr. Liddy, Mr. McCord, whoever else they involved, uh, would they not have at least tried to dig up a collection from all those who are working at the White House and the Committee in order to raise that defense fund? Isn't that the way you usually raise a defense fund for defendants? I'm not familiar with ra raising defense funds, but you generally don't use covert means to ra raise uh, humanitarian funds. Do you raise money that have been given for the campaign for the re-election of the President of the United States? In a covert fashion? Well, in and, and, and raising a defense fund for those who may have been caught in a criminal act who may have worked for the Committee for the re-election. No, sir, you do not. Is that not. a proper use for campaign funds that have been given for no. re-election of the President? No, it's not. And then you mentioned covert activity. Uh, could you please describe what your knowledge of the clandestine or covert nature and the manner in which these payoffs were made? Well, all I know is that uh, Mr. Kambach asked me if I would have Mr. Ulasewicz call him when he returned to California. He said he didn't have his phone number at that time and, and uh, would like to have him reach him as soon as he got back. Uh, in uh, a few subsequent conversations I had with Mr. Kambach, he was, had developed what he called code names for various individuals. I think I referred to these earlier. He called Mr. Hunt the writer. He called uh, Mr. Haldeman uh, uh, the brush. You know what he called uh, Mrs. Hunt? The writer's wife, I think, maybe, or something. I don't know. <laughs> like who's buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, the, uh, did you know, by the way, whether Mr. Ulasewicz had a code name? Did you know that he was called Mr. Rivers? Uh, in the conversations with Mr. Comback and Mr. Uh, Lasswitz. I, th I think I did hear that from, subsequently from Mr. Comback that he had referred to him as Mr. Rivers. Now, again, if one were to, uh, on the basis of decency, humanitarianism, whatever way you want to call it, raise a defense fund, would one go about clandestinely using code names of that kind to secretly make these payoffs? No, sir. I think we'll have Mr. Kalmbach here to testify as to that in much more detail. Now, you know, did Mr. Kalmbach uh, tell you about any of the instructions that he had as the manner in which to pay, make these payoffs off? He told me uh, when we met in Lafayette Park that he was going to meet uh, uh, Mr. Ulasewicz, uh at that point in time and that he was going to have the money uh, laundered, uh, and that's the only thing I know about that. Uh, he never did tell me exactly how money was laundered, and I asked him, and he said, I don't know. I don't know if he goes to the racetrack and, and exchanges it there, or he's got friends in New York that exchange it. I was never clear on exactly how money was laundered. Did uh, Mr. Kalmbach ever tell you that uh, he had any discussion with Mr. Ehrlichman concerning this role? The only time I heard of any discussion was when, uh, well, M Mr. Kambach had numerous discussions with Mr. Ehrlichman I was aware of, and they would, Mr. Kambach, when he would come into town, would have a, a list uh, that he would keep in his pocket that he would check off each item with each individual he wanted to talk with. He was a, he was a very thorough man. Uh, he never told me what he was going over with Mr. Ehrlichman on his list. The only time I heard about his discussing this at all with Mr. Ehrlichman was uh, after April or, uh, let's see, March 29th or 30th when they were in California uh, for the, the President II visit. He said to me he had met with Mr. Ehrlichman that week to discuss the fact that he was concerned that when he appeared before this committee that he didn't want to ever have the name of uh, the contributor come out, uh, the person who had raised this money, and he'd had some discussion with him then. What other discussions? I know he met with Mr. Ehrlichman on countless occasions. Well, did Mr. Kalmbach ever tell you, to your knowledge, that uh, Mr. Ehrlichman had indicated that the president had approved these payments? Did Mr. Kalmbach tell me that? Yes. Uh, no, he did not. Did you learn it any other way? No. Not now, that I recall. I don't really now, ever heard in, that. Now, in your exhibit, number 43, uh, Mr. Dean, 
You list Mr. Stans. I think you've pretty well identified a number of the others, and I think it may be interesting to the committee, I mean, Mr. Stans having testified with this committee, why th this is a list of, of people that you had made up, and you, I, this was the list I, to recall it for you, that you put certain stars by those who were lawyers, and it was a list of those who you thought had problems so far as criminal charges. Uh, why was Mr. Stans put on your list? Well, this was based on, on uh, first of all, you'll note on the list I've got question marks beside certain people. Uh, on some of those people, I knew what I knew. Uh, I knew what evidence I had in my mind of their own involvement. Uh, I didn't know about Stans. Uh, I didn't know uh, how involved he had or had not been. And for that reason, I put a question mark beside his name. Uh, because I hadn't had any direct dealings with him that would indicate it, but there were certain circumstantial situations, and uh, I wasn't sure. So that's why the, the question marks on some of these. Now, Mr. Dean, just going back very briefly to the testimony concerning the 15,200, which had been given to you by Mr. Strawn, I think Mr. Higby, uh, uh, excuse me, Howard, Howard, Mr. Howard and Mr. Strawn that you put in your safe, and the fact that you had taken from that an amount about 4,850 4, 4, 4, 4, for your own personal use. That's correct. I think this has not been brought out in the testimony. I'd like to ask you this question. Could you tell the committee when was the first time you told anybody about your removing Four thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars from that fifteen thousand two hundred. Uh, when I first went to my lawyer, I sometime shortly after I had gotten through an explanation of all the facts that I knew, uh, I got into this particular problem and raised that with him. Now you, then therefore you were the first one of the world, so to speak, first learned of your doing that from you. That is correct. If you had wanted to conceal that borrowing of the money, or the term has been used here, embezzlement, if you wanted to be conceal your use of that money, could you not just as well, before turning your law telling your lawyer about that, have replaced that money and just told your lawyer that you had 15200 in the safe? Yes, I could have. Well, why, why then did you tell your lawyer about it? Well, because I thought that would be a... Uh an untruthful thing to do, and I thought I'd tell him the facts the way they were. Now, uh, Mr. Dash, I might also add that uh, I also asked my lawyer to go to the government with this information right away so they knew that. Mr. Dean, I think it's important since we've discussed that and the fact that your lawyer and you opened up a trustee account and deposited the full 15200 which was the balance left in the safe of the cash plus your own personal check of 4850 which you replaced the original check with so that you made it whole. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to give uh, the some photostatic copies we have of that transaction to Mr. Dean if he could identify them for us. You want me to identify these for the record? Yes, would you for the record? The first document is a, a, uh, a check dated April 12th, uh, 1973, written out to Mr. Hogan and Mr. Schaffer, trustees, for 4850 and signed by myself. Uh, there is a receipt written out by Mr. Schaffer of that amount. No, if it's for the full amount, I take that back. I can't even read the writing here. Let's see it. Uh, It indicates the full amount. The next document is a uh, cashier's check uh, written out for 10350. Uh, what does that cashier's check represent? Drawn on the uh, on the uh, suburban trust company. Uh, 
it represents the, the cash that was deposited at that account. Uh, the next are signature cards that were prepared with Mr. Hogan being stricken and uh, uh, Mr. McKeever being replaced on there as a trustee as a result of Mr. Hogan having to withdraw from the case for other reasons. Uh, then the, there are additional signature cards in the next document. Uh, it looks like on the next document there is a repeat of the, the earlier document for the suburban trust check. The numbers are the same at the top, so we've already identified that check. And then there is a, a subsequently issued check uh, when Mr. Uh, uh, Hogan withdrew from the case and uh, it was necessary to put Mr. McKeever on a new check. Uh, so there's a new check drawn by me to the order of Mr. Schaffer and Mr. McKeever for 4850. Uh, the next appear to be endorsements on the back of that, these checks. And the last document is a signature card. And the last document uh, dated April 24th is a letter from Mr. Schaffer. Uh, would you read that letter uh, for the committee, please? Dear Mr. Dear uh, Garnet, enclosed you will find one. Who's it addressed to? Uh, Garnet D. Insco, Suburban Trust Company, 255 North Washington Street, Rockville, Maryland, dated April 24, 1973. Dear Garnet, enclosed you will find, parent one, client's check dated April 20, 1973, numbered 1647, payable the order of myself and Mr. McKeever as trustees in the amount of 4850, which we have suitably endorsed to the bank. Two, <clears throat> bank's treasurer's check dated April 19, 1973, in the amount of $10,350 covering the cash I delivered to you for safekeeping on Friday, April 13, 1973, pending the opening of an account. And three, the two signature cards assi signed by Mr. Dean and myself and my partner, McKeever. As you know, when we first discussed opening the account, I contemplated that Thomas Hogan Esquire would be co-trustee with myself inasmuch as he then also represented Mr. Dean. However, subsequent developments, conflict of interest in parentheses, have required Mr. Hogan to withdraw from the representation and accordingly my partner, McKeever, is acting as co-trustee. This change also required Mr. Dean to substitute his enclosed numbered check 1647 for his check numbered 1643, originally payable to Mr. Hogan and myself as trustees. I have had Mr. Dean void the latter check by tearing his signature therefrom, and it remains in our files. Should you be inquired of by competent authorities as to the opening of this account, please tell them all you know, including whatever I have told you. Thank you for your cooperation. Sincerely, uh, Charles Norman Schaffer. All right, now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have that uh, identified and introduced in the record. That will be done. The uh, reporter will, uh, will uh, number it appropriately as uh, exhibit and uh, receive it into the record as such. Mr. Dean, I don't know whether you... Chairman, uh, there is one statement I could make with respect to one of those documents that would clarify what I think would be confusing. Uh, I'd be glad to do it under oath or off oath, and if any member of your committee objects to me making a statement and you rule that I can't, I won't, but I'd like to. And it relates to the, to the uh, Suburban Trust Treasurer's Check. Yep. May I make the statement? Is there any objection from any member of the committee? I suppose you stand up, my ministers, all of us for taking all the evidence. Do you swear that the evidence you should give the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mr. Chairman, uh, after my client had given me the uh, 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 cash and a current check made payable to me and Hogan, and after I had gone to the government with the currency so that they could look at it, 
Xerox would do whatever they wanted with it. Uh, I got to the bank. Uh, I was carrying it around about a day. I was a little uncomfortable. And I got to the bank at about five after two on a Friday. And it was in April. It was, I would believe, in early April. And uh, the records will show, the receipt there will date it. And I knocked on Mr. Insco's window and he came around to the door and he opened it up because he knows me. My law office is right near the bank and I have a very small account there and he treats me as a good customer nevertheless. And I said, Garnet, I got all this cash and I don't want to have it over the weekend. W will you take it? So he said, yes, he took, he'd take it and he'd give me a receipt. Well, then on Monday and Tuesday, we were having trouble with Mr. Hogan and his conflict of interest problem, and we never got the signature cards back. And finally, Garner says, look, I can't hold this cash around here forever. I'm going to give you a treasurer's check at the bank so that I can then pass the currency through the account. That's how that treasurer's check came into being. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anybody want to cross it down there? I'll be glad to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Schaffer, no, I don't want to you, but I can't resist the temptation to let the record note that you claim and continue to stand on and have not waived the attorney-client privilege. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. Only, only the client can waive the privilege, I believe. Is. <laughs> no. uh, Mr. Dean, on, on page 202 of your statement, you state down towards the bottom, Mitch, Mr. Mitchell raised the fact that F. Lee Bailey, who had been very helpful in dealing with McCord, and then you went on and had a problem. Uh, what are the details or what, to your knowledge, was meant by Mr. F. Lee Bailey, who had been helpful in dealing with McCord, from Mr. Mitchell's point? Well, I believe I testified to this uh, fact earlier, Mr. Dash, that at one point when Mr. Ulsh, uh apparently was not having a, a uh, full rapport with his client, Mr. McCord, that an arrangement or a discussion was to be had, and I testified, I believe I didn't know if in fact that had occurred, uh, in which Mr. Mitchell was going to call Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey was going to fly in or call or visit with Mr. McCord and promise Mr. McCord that he would represent his case on appeal uh, and take it to the highest court in the land if necessary. Uh, that was what the reference is to. Now, I don't know whether you fully replied to Senator Montoya's question when he questioned you concerning the President's news conference of August 29, 1972. And the question had been put to the President. Mr. President, wouldn't it be a good idea for a special prosecutor, even from your standpoint, to be appointed to investigate the contribution situation and also the Watergate case. And the President, quote, reg with regard to who is investigating it now, I think it would be well to notice that the FBI is conducting a full field investigation. The Department of Justice, of course, is in charge of the prosecution and presenting the matter to the grand jury. The Senate Banking and Currency Committee is conducting an investigation. Now, have you identified who the President meant to Senator Montoya, when he was referring to the Senate Banking and Currency Committee, is also conducting an investigation? Well, I think that, the, was, that was a known fact that the Patman Committee was holding. Well, that was the Patman Committee. Yes, correct. And here the President was responding that the Patman Committee was making an investigation. That is correct. But what, in fact, it, when the President was making that statement, was the White House strategy toward the Patman Committee investigation? It was to try to halt that investigation. Mr. Dean, in your statement, page 101, you stated that the lawyers at the re-election committee were hopeful of slowing down the Democratic National Committee suit as a result of ex-party contacts with the judge. Now, what was the extent and source of your information on the subject? I first learned of this in a meeting in Mr. Mitchell's office uh, in which I was told that there were some arrangements had been made to have somebody, at that time I didn't know who, uh, talk with Judge Ritchie about the, the problems the case presented for the re-election committee and potentially for the White House uh, without getting into specifics with the judge. Uh, I later learned uh, and was present when Mr. McPhee had a direct discussion 
with Mr. Mitchell about this subject and the fact that he was going to go visit with the judge. Uh, and then as late as March 2nd of this year, Mr. McPhee came to my office, uh, to, or not to my office, he came to have lunch with me at the White House and told me that very weekend that he was going to go take up a matter which uh, he said Kenny, referring to Ken Parkinson, had said was an aspect of the case that he was concerned about. Well, this so, you... so there were several, there were several people, I, I think, that were aware of this. I think Mr. LaRue was aware of it. I think Mr. Mitchell was aware of it. Well, did, you, did you have personal knowledge of this, other than what you had been told? Only what I was told directly by Mr. McPhee, that uh, he, in fact, was going to visit the judge. No. I wasn't present at any meetings with the judge, no, sir. Now, do you know that at a hearing on September 21st, 1972, before Judge Charles R. Ritchie, that the judge to whom the case was assigned, uh, counsel for the plaintiffs, the Democratic National Committee, agreed... Uh, as a practical matter, that the case could not be tried before the election. Do you know, do you know of that I, hearing? I didn't follow the civil cases at all to speak of, other than just general awareness. I probably was aware of that at the time, but uh, uh, I don't know what the... I know there were countless meetings with Judge Ritchie with all counsel present. Uh, in fact, virtually every meeting he had uh, directly relating to the case he would call all counsel and all interested parties. The meetings I'm referring to uh, did not involve all counsel. Do you know uh, at the same hearing uh, that the judge ruled that depositions should cease to be taken uh, for the time being on the ground that the taking of depositions might jeopardize the pending criminal case? I was aware of the fact that uh, about that time that the, the depositions had been cut, cut off temporarily anyway. Are you personally familiar with any of the other rulings of Judge Ritchie that were made during the pendency of the Democratic National Committee case that occurred prior to the election? Uh, no, I'm not. As a matter of fact, you have no other knowledge, really, of that matter as to, other than what Mr. Parkinson or other lawyers told you about that. That is correct. Now, you indicated that on April 15th meeting with the President, the President, in bringing up the question of the million-dollar discussion, told you that he was joking. When he first mentioned that to you, Mr. Dean, did he indicate in any way that he was joking, or did you understand him to be joking? Uh, no, sir, I didn't understand him to be joking. He repeated it twice uh, and indicated there would be no problem to raise a million dollars. Uh, he looked over at Mr. Haldeman and raised the same matter. Uh, and was very confident that a million dollars was nothing to raise at all. Uh, when he re-raised it on the, uh, on the 15th, when he said it was, he was just joking, uh, I'd have to characterize his, uh, his characterization uh, as being a rather uh, nervous laughter, kind of, I was just joking. I think you testified, and you may have given us information on this, that you believe that that April 15th meeting with the President was taped and that you were being asked leading questions. Have you ever asked the White House if you were taped or any official of the White House? I raised with my lawyer, and I don't know what he, whether he raised this with, with the prosecutors or not, that after I was told that uh, I had been taped... Who, who told you, Mr. Dean? Mr. Sh my lawyer, Mr. Schaffer, told me that he had received word from the prosecutors that I had been taped, and I thought there was only one occasion where that could have occurred that I was aware of, where I had a direct conversation with the President, uh, because all the circumstances seemed to indicate that, and uh, that was on this uh, April 15th meeting. Now, I don't know for a fact whether I was or was not taped, but suggested that the government might want to listen to that tape, because if they listened to that tape, they'd have some idea of the dimensions of uh, what was involved. Mr. Dean, I just want to refer you to your exhibit, number 13A, and this is the exhibit dealing with, uh, it has first a memorandum uh, from Mr. Charles Colson to you, reference Howard Hunt, and the memorandum itself also includes, includes a short memorandum from W. Richard Howard, who I understand was Mr. Colson's assistant. Is that not correct? Do you have that exhibit? Right. 
Mr. Howard was Mr. Colson's assistant. That is correct. He? Yes, I'm, I have your exact right, on, memory. On, March, on that March 30 memorandum from Mr. Howard, on the second paragraph, the opening line is Howard, meaning Howard Hunt, has been very effective for us. Do you have an understanding what he meant by that? It's a memorandum for Bruce Curlie. Uh, no, I do not. I am not fully familiar other than what some of the things that I recall, and I recall to this committee that I saw in the files uh, of Mr. Hunt that related to Mr. Colson, that in fact he had a close relationship with Mr. Colson. Who's uh, your understanding of the us in that? Howard has been very, Howard Hunt has been very effective for well, us. That would be a reference to, to, uh, to Mr. Colson and Mr. Howard and Mr. Colson's general office. Now, would you look at your exhibit number 34A? Now, this exhibit, dated February 28, 1973, which has the heading administratively confidential, is from is for Larry Higby and John Dean, and is from Jerry Jones. Who is Jerry Jones? Uh, he is the head of the personnel office, and I might add that while this was addressed to me, it took me several days to get this memorandum. It did not come directly to me, and I finally got the copy I had uh, after having to make several calls to get the copy. So the, the memorandum really wasn't directly to me, and I think I didn't get an original. Rather, I got uh, a Xerox. Well, now the subject matter says what? Options for Jeb Magruder. That is, that is correct. Well, what was it all about? Why was this memorandum written, and what do they mean, options for Jeb Magruder? Well, it was shortly before this time that Mr. Magruder had been making some statements uh, to Mr. O'Brien, which I, in turn, relayed to Mr. Haldeman. And these statements were the fact that uh, Mr. Haldeman, uh, uh, that he was aware of Mr. Haldeman's involvement in certain aspects of uh, the pre-April or pre-June uh, 17th aspects of the uh, Watergate, and uh, uh, he was indicating to Mr. O'Brien that, in fact, uh, it was his understanding that the president might have had knowledge of this. When I reported this back to Mr. Haldeman, uh, the interest in finding Mr. Magruder a, a job uh, uh, increased about tenfold, and this is the product of that. Well, then this it would be fair then to characterize this memorandum as a memorandum to show what could be do, done for Jeb Magruder to help him out in that case. That's right. right. As a matter of fact, uh, let me read to you the opening part of that memorandum, which indicates that perhaps some pressure might have to be brought to get him a job. Uh, listed below are nine possible options for Jeb. Some will break more China to secure than others. Where there are problems, I have so noted them. Now, what, what's your interpretation of some will break more China than others? Well, I don't know exactly. That could mean one of many things that, uh, uh, that given the given head of an agency might have been uh, at a various level of tolerance with the White House uh, continuing to place people in their agencies. Uh, it could mean that uh, uh, people would want to know about Magruder's awareness, which I don't know if uh, Mr. Jones had any awareness that Mr. Magruder had problems, but I... Whether Mr. Higby had related that to him or not, I certainly did not. Uh, uh, so it's very hard for me to interpret exactly what that phrase means, and I think only Mr. Jones could testify to what uh, he well, meant by that. Well, I think then it's for fair for the record for this committee. Is it your testimony that Mr. Jerry Jones, who had been asked to prepare this memorandum and seek out these options, did not himself, from your knowledge, know uh, what Mr. Magruder's problems were or anything about the not, Watergate not, of the company? Not from my knowledge, uh, did he? Uh, in fact, I was, when I was talking about this with Higby uh, before Mr. Jones prepared this, one of the jobs I had heard of after talking with uh, Jeb that he might be interested in is the job that ended up as number one, which was the assistant to the secretary or deputy undersecretary of commerce for policy development. <coughs> and apparently uh, uh, Mr. Higby relayed that on to 
to Mr. Jones. Now, I don't know where I first heard of that job, but when I did, when Magruder came by, I mentioned that I'd heard of that job, and he was expressed immediate interest in it. Mr. Dean, uh, you have testified, you were asked by Mr. McGregor to tell him the true facts, and that you testified that you checked with Mr. Ehrlichman, and Ehrlichman said no, that you shouldn't uh, tell Mr. McGregor the true facts. Do you recall what Mr. McGregor's reaction were, was when you refused to tell him the true facts, or how did you handle that? Well, what I did is I gave him uh, uh, the most evasive song and dance I could to uh, weave him through the problems he was going to have down there, and I recall that uh, as soon as Mr. McGregor would have a, a press conference that uh, uh, people at the White House would hit the, hit the ceiling because he would say something that uh, would create more problems than it would solve. And I felt very sorry for Mr. McGregor because he didn't know uh, uh, what he should say and what he shouldn't say, and he had been given a lot of assurances that were assurances he, should, he shouldn't have been given. And I'm, think, I'm sure I'm not the only one he asked for assurances. Uh, I'm sure he asked others for assurances and was given them, that there was not, nothing to be concerned about. You've also testified, Mr. Dean, that after the President's August 29th speech, and that's the speech of the so-called Dean Report, and no White House involvement, that you discussed with Mr. Moore and others the possibility of your becoming the fall guy. Now, how could you meaningfully discuss with Mr. Moore without Mr. Moore having the facts? Did Mr. Moore have the facts at that time? Not at that time. Uh, I, uh, it was long after that that I began, well, I, I don't recall exactly when. Uh, when I first started discussing this, uh, as I recall, I was discussing it with Fe Mr. Fielding, and I thought uh, that if this statement crumbles, uh, I crumble with it. I'm the man that's out in front saying that everybody is, is clean, uh, and this is something I didn't exactly uh, want. And that's why I began to talk to people about, am I being put out in front? I can recall discussing it with Mr. Mitchell at one time, and he assured me, he told me, his answer was, if you ever see any sign of that, please tell me, because I'll speak directly with the President. Well, Mr. Dean, you've testified, of course, quite at length this week. First, a full day of statement, and all these days of examination, cross-examination. But I think in the course of your testimony, you've made it fairly clear that, uh, that you've had experience both in the legislative branch and the executive branch, and very full experience in this unfortunate occurrence, which was the cover-up of the Watergate, and perhaps some complicity in the Watergate itself. Now, a good major reason for this committee sitting and hearing all these facts certainly is not that of a prosecutor, but a committee of the Senate in order to come forward with legislative recommendations, and especially in this case, legislative recommendations to prevent this kind of thing from ever happening again in this country. You were a major and key figure in so many intimate parts of this massive cover-up and activity which became the Watergate scandal and cover-up. Can you give this committee any recommendations, either now at this point in brief and later in writing to the committee, which can assist this committee in formulating its recommendations to the Congress so that this kind of thing can never happen again in our country. Uh, Mr. Dash, I'm <clears throat> quite aware of the fact that the, the, the purpose of this committee is legislative, and you're looking for answers to problems, and as a man who's been right in the middle of those problems, and uh, right in the middle of the White House for quite a while, and have seen the way uh, things have operated down in the, ex in the executive branch, I've given this considerable thought, and with the permission of the chairman and the committee, what I would like to do at some point, because I have made some rather lengthy notes as I've thought about this uh, over the last uh, several months, as to potential legislative steps uh, that might be taken by this committee uh, under consideration that I feel might uh, provide some answers to uh, preventing this sort of thing from occurring again, and I would like to submit that at a subsequent date to the committee rather than go on to 
what would be a rather extensive discussion of legislative remedies. Thank you, Mr. Dean. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I might add, since the document which I dictated subsequent to my conversation with Mr. Bazart has been made part of the record that it was submitted to me, and it was with the understanding that uh, it would be made available for committee use. There was no discussion as to exactly how that document or the subsequent document that I might prepare would be used, although there was certainly no limitation on any, in, in any manner as to how it might be used. I might also add there was no discussion as to the source of the information which uh, Mr. Bazart was imparting to me, but that it was one lawyer's position uh, to another lawyer. Mr. Dean, you have testified uh, uh, in referring to your statement on page 144 <coughs> that you had a meeting with uh, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. Mitchell, and Mr. Alt. Uh, Mr. Alt has testified Mr. here. Mr. Alt, I have never met with Mr. Alt. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get to that page. I'm sorry, you're right. It was a report of a meeting. I'll read the, the portion that I'm referring to. Sometime during this period that as a result of my reports of Caulfield meeting with McCord, that O'Brien, Brian Mitchell, and Alts discussed having F. Lee Bailey uh, meet with McCord, etc. I assume then that discussion was not in your presence either? That is correct. Uh, do you know uh, Mr. Alts's relationship with either Mr. O'Brien or Mr. Mitchell at that time? No, I do not. Do you know why he was present in that particular meeting at that time? Uh, it's my understanding that Mr. O'Brien, uh, I'm not sure Mr. Mitchell was present. Uh, which paragraph? I haven't seen the paragraph you're referring to yet. First, first full paragraph. That On page 145 of my testimony? 144. That O'Brien, Mitchell, and Mr. Alsh discussed having F. Lee Bailey. I assume that was a discussion, uh, uh, one discussion with all these gentlemen present. Well, this is, I'm, I'm referring to here, if you read it, is that it was sometime during this period that as a result of my reports of Caulfield's meetings with McCord that O'Brien, Mitchell, and Alch discussed. That doesn't indicate a meeting, uh, and I'm not aware of any meeting. I see. I'm, so that, it's so intercommunication amongst see. these individuals that I'm referring to, and I uh, was not directly privy to any of these, but I had a general understanding that Mr. O'Brien had frequent contacts with Mr. Alch, and he in turn would report back to Mr. Mitchell. I'm not aware of any contact between Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Alch. I, uh, I see. So you assume that uh, your information was from Mr. McCord, Mr. Uh, O'Brien, and that he had gotten his information directly from Mr. Alch. That is correct. That's your assumption. All right. Let me ask you. Uh, this about this three hundred and fifty thousand dollar fund of which you received uh, fifteen thousand two hundred dollars uh, did i understand you to say that you understood that part of this money came from the nineteen seventy uh, congressional campaigns my understanding was that the money came from the nineteen sixty eight primaries nineteen sixty eight primaries that's correct do you know uh, what uh, particular route that money traveled in order to get from those primary campaigns uh, uh, to the committee to reelect? To the best of my recollection, what I was told is that it went to New York during 1968, was kept in safety deposit boxes in New York. It subsequently came from safety deposit boxes in New York to safety deposit boxes in Washington. Uh, and whose custody was it uh, in New York? Uh, I believe it was in Mr. Kambach's custody in New York, but I don't have the actual facts as to who uh, uh, had the actual safety deposit boxes. Would it not be uh, appropriate to that, for that money to have gone to the Congressional Campaign Committee? The uh, 1968 primary money? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Thompson, I wasn't making any decisions in 1968 about, uh, or 1970 about that. money. This is, this is strictly a collateral matter, but it's a matter that uh, you wound up with money uh, uh, in your safe, or perhaps a part of it, or the committee to reelect wound up with money that they were using, uh, according to some of the testimony that we've had, uh, in paying these defendants. 
That's correct. And I was wondering, for my own information, what, where that money should have gone after the 1968 primaries were over. And whose custody was Well, I gather what it was, the intention was, was to, after the 68 primaries and then the 68 general election, that there was, I recall, a figure of 1.9 million being left. Now, uh, I'm sure your committee investigators are trying to reconstruct uh, uh, the totality of this cash, and uh, uh, I don't know what happened to all that money. I know Mr. Kambach told me what happened to some of it, that some of it was spent for polling, that I mentioned earlier today that some of it was spent for uh, payment to Mr. Wallace's opponent's uh, campaign, and uh, the remainder of it uh, was still surplus money. Now, there was other surplus money that came in from the 70 uh, campaign, the congressional campaign effort, uh, that apparently was kept separate also, is my understanding, but I, you know, I'm not intimately familiar with these, these details at all. Where did you get your information concerning the money going to Mr. Wallace's opponent? From Mr. Kambach. Combat told you that? Yes, did he correct. indicate that he had uh, personal dealings in that matter? Yes, he did. What did he say exactly about that? Uh, he indicated to me that uh, he had made a disbursement uh, of the surplus money uh, to a, he didn't give me the mechanics of it, to that purpose. Who was Mr. Wallace's opponent? That I think it was Mr. Brewer, as I recall. Governor Brewer. And that he said what? that money had gone to that campaign from these funds. Did he indicate whether there were any intermediaries in, in that particular transaction? This discussion uh, was, oh, I guess it was in late February of this year, uh, in which he was recounting to me uh, generally what had happened to the money he had had in his custody uh, because he was trying to reconstruct in his own mind. Apparently, he had no records at this point in time, and he was trying to reconstruct the, the areas that uh, he could recall at the, as to how the disbursements of the money that had come from New York had traveled. And this, is, and this is all I just recall this point sticking in my mind as one of the things he said. He, did, he indica did he indicate that money had gone to any other Democratic candidates? I'm not sure that Mr. Brewer was a Democratic candidate, was he? Uh, I believe he was. Was he a Democratic candidate? Uh, he was not governor of Alabama. Well, I, I am not familiar with what I know that there was an extensive fundraising effort in the 1970 congressional campaign, and the records of those fundraising efforts and the disbursements as well uh, came up in another conversation with a, with another interrogation by the committee. Those records, to the best of my knowledge, uh, are still in a safe uh, in Mr. Fielding's custody. They have never been reviewed or read by anybody in my office. They were placed in that safe with those instructions that no one was to read them. They were given us the, we were given these records by Mr. Colson, and I, as I recall, Mr. Colson had collected the records uh, from Mr. Gleason, who was also involved in this uh, activity at this time. Mr. Dean, let me leave that and ask you a few questions concerning the $4,850 which, which you took from the safe. As I understand, the reason you took that money instead of using your personal funds was that you had let the time, in effect, run out on you and you had failed to go to your New York, uh, New York account you had. Uh, would that be your stock account? Or? That is correct. I had not only forgotten to take care of money matters, I had forgotten to get a wasn't I had forgotten, I had gotten too consumed to, uh, to get wedding music. I had forgotten to get a, a minister to, or a judge to handle the proceedings. And uh, it was a general uh, bit of panic there in the final hours, I might say. The chairman presented to you a uh, statement from the Shearson and Hamill Company of your stock account, I believe, uh, yesterday. Do you happen to have that, uh, a copy of that with you? Right 
I have two extra copies here, if that would expedite matters any. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the committee's final hour with John Dean, Minority Counsel Fred Thompson has some questions about campaign money. No, I don't have a copy. I'm sorry. This is a matter of confusion for me. I believe you indicated yesterday that you had a $26,167 uh, credit. Is that not, the copy is not clearly, extremely clear. Let me, may I say something about these uh, uh, documents? I uh, had a standard practice of not opening these. In fact, originally they were not even sent to me. They were sent to my ex-wife's house where they remained and I would collect them in bulk, unopened, and take them to my secretary and she would just file them. I, this is a margin account we're talking about and I have uh, not a lot of expertise in the market. The arrangement I had with my broker is that he had a total discretion uh, in all handling of all trading. Uh, I would sign at the outset of all, of, I think, well, I, about periodically he would send me a, a, a sheet to sign that he would have total discretion for all trades. I've never been able to fully interpret these sheets, so that's why I hope that somebody else can, can look at them to do the interpretation when I turn all this information accurate, over to the committee. It would be accurate to say that, that that is a debit instead of a credit. Well, I don't know. I think what it indicates to me is that the uh, uh, that it's a it's a credit. I'm I'm sure there was at least twenty six thousand. In fact, I'm sure there's quite a bit more than twenty six thousand in the account at that time. Be, could it possibly be that you had a this was a debit, but you, that you the value of your stock at that time was such that uh, if you sold your stock, that you would have a twenty something thousand dollar credit. Well, yeah. I th I think that. Uh, <coughs> If you were to back, when your when your investigators uh, do an entire audit of this entire matter, which is of interest to you, that they will find that uh, uh, there were ample funds, including more than twenty six thousand dollars. I think this indicates merely one tw one transaction that had occurred at this period of time. So you had ample funds there to to uh, take care of the honeymoon expenses. That is correct. I believe you stated that you placed some of the money back at one time, and then you took some money back out again later. That is correct. Uh, again, you did not go to your stock account, although you had, as you say, twenty-something thousand dollars either in stock value or uh, readily available cash, whichever it might be. Was this again because uh, you had uh, forgotten to do that, or? Why didn't you go to the stock account on, on that occasion? It was merely a matter of convenience. I had already made some use of the funds, uh, and I merely decided to make more use of them. So you received $15,200 in, uh, what, June of 72? That is correct. And then you took uh, $4,850 on October 11 of 1972. Uh, the remaining, uh, what, $10,350, did you ever use any of this money for any other purposes? The, the other cash that was in? Mm -hmm. As I said, I, um, when I, uh, at one time I recall I put some money back in and uh, I could have very well at that time commingled other money that I had. I sometimes did carry cash with me uh, and I have told the committee I will do my best to uh, go through my entire records and reconstruct this with the uh, uh, committee investigators. Well, did I understand your testimony in uh, response to Senator Gurney's questions that you took some money out and you don't really know how much, and you put some back in and you don't really know how much? I have not sat down and tried to figure this out, no. 
So you don't really know how much. That is correct. How did you know that you owed the fund $4,850? Because I had a check in there for that amount, and I sat down and recounted it uh, and double-checked that before I turned the money over to my lawyer as well. You still have that check, incidentally? Which check? The $4,850 check you placed in the safe. No, I do not. Uh, when the, um, uh, my lawyer and I discussed this, he told me that uh, we'll have to negotiate a new check, an updated check, uh, because the old check will not, would not pass with the old date. Uh, he said, issue me a new check and tear up the old one and, and uh, uh, get it over to me, which you I did. You tore up the check that you had placed in, uh, in the safe? That's correct. Do you not consider this as possible evidence of your good intentions, which you have uh, relayed to us here? <laughs> Mr. Thompson, if I, if I was trying to be deceitful, I could have very easily written another check uh, to put in there, but I'm not trying to be deceitful. I tore up the, the first check, and I didn't uh, try to pretend that there was... Well, you realized, I'm sure, that you had a problem. You said the reason you didn't place the money back in, still telling your attorney, was that you wanted to be completely truthful and let everybody know exactly what you had done. You realized that that might be questionable, I assume, based on that statement. Would it not be logical for you to, keep, to have kept that check to say, yes, this is a check I placed in the safe from the very beginning? Well, if, if uh, you want to place something sinister on this, you can't because it was a very uh, sort of incidental activity. Mr. Schaffer and I didn't really talk at length about it. He wanted to get the information to the prosecutors. He said, I also need a new check. An, incident, uh, an incidental activity? At this time, when you went to your attorney and you explained the situation, and as you said uh, in your own testimony that uh, you wanted to make sure the truth uh, was out about this matter and you might be questioned about it, you wanted to be truthful about it, you didn't, you considered this an incidental matter at this time, the only evidence possibly that you had besides your own testimony that you had indeed uh, placed your personal check in there? I didn't feel it a, a major matter at that matter. I was prepared to reveal it and, in fact, did reveal it to the prosecutor. You didn't feel like it was necessary to have any documentary evidence to, to bolster your, or support your testimony on this particular point then? No, I was perfectly willing to, to uh, say everything I knew about the matter. What about a check stub? I, I would surmise there is no check stub because I kept, uh, the way my checkbook is composed, it's, there are no stubs to the checks. You slide new checks into the book and run the other, the uh, stub section in another area of the book, and I would keep uh, in my desk drawer uh, non-sequential number checks far down the line, and I, when I wrote the check for cash, I took one out of my desk drawer because my secretary would keep the sequential checks in her desk, and at the time, I don't recall her being in the office when I needed the check, and I just wrote one out of my desk drawer. Are you saying you didn't stub this check at all? You didn't, no, you didn't I, make a stub? I did not make a stub. I believe you previously to testify that you stood ready to make good this check at any time. Uh, is, uh, was it not necessary in, in keeping the records of your account? Uh, if you considered this an obligation which you had covered, so to speak, that you were, of course, you didn't, you didn't have enough money in your account to cover it. You've already testified you only had $1,600 in your account at that time to see in how my, much you in were in the hole. In my banking account, I certainly felt I had enough uh, to cover them through my brokerage account. I... Um, you had 20-something thousand dollars in my brokerage account. I had over $20,000 in my brokerage account at that time. All right, and you, you, uh, you took the money out on October 12, 72. Yes, sir. And you place you place the, the checks in the trustee account when? I don't recall the exact date the trustee account was set up because, as I say... April? In April? Yes, in April. So from October 72 to April 73, you had this money in your stock account. And you never did take any money out of the stock account and place it in the bank and take this check. That is correct. When did you tear up this check? Uh... Shortly after my attorney told me that he wanted me to issue a new check, and he said uh, in a, in a uh, manner that was uh, without uh, any, to my knowledge, any sinister thought at all, that merely issue me a new check and tear up the old check and bring the, bring the new one over here, I'm which is what I did. I'm not sinister knowledge. Of course, you've got a right to do what you want to with your own personal checks. There's nothing sinister 
connected well, with... Well, we have uh, talked about this, uh, Mr. Thompson, after the fact, and uh, I wish I had the check. If I were not I'm going sure to be you do. I'm, if I were not perfectly candid with this committee, uh, it wouldn't be very difficult to manufacture another check. Well, I assume you wouldn't do that, Mr. Dean. You I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No, well, sir. I, I don't think we need to discuss All possible right. further perjury or, or uh, creating evidence or anything of that nature. Well, I object to further. Chairman. Beg your pardon? I, I just object to the word further. That objection, I think, uh, the chair will allow me to uh, comment on it, is well taken. Thank you. And I, but it's your intent. And what was in your mind at the time that, that puzzles me, Mr. Dean? Uh, under ordinary circumstances, I would say that a man of your dealing, dealing in stock, I might, a man I might business, correct if you I, right if, I, if, I, if I might finish. Uh, the personal affairs involving great sums of money, then even in ordinary circumstances, it would be highly unusual for anyone, for, for anyone in, in those circumstances to, to tear up a check for any reason. Maybe, maybe not, but it would seem that way to me. But under these circumstances, when you knew in your own mind that there might be some question about it, to the extent that you, you went through these, these gyrations to set up this trustee account, when you realize there might be some question that you would destroy the only documentary evidence that might uh, substantiate that testimony. Well, let me repeat something I uh, think should be very clear on the record. Uh, I at no time uh, thought there was any way in the world that I wouldn't have to account in full for that money. Uh, too many people were aware of it. Mr. Howard was aware that it had come to me. Mr. Strawn was aware it had come to me. I had told Mr. Fielding that I had it in my possession. Uh, I assumed that they uh, had possibly told other people about it, uh, the fact that the money had ended up in my safe. And uh, the, well, first, the first occasion that it came to my, uh, uh, the point where I thought it ought to be revealed to the government, it was after I went to my attorney. I revealed it as it was. We discussed the fact at that time that uh, after we made the moves to open up the trustee account that uh, really through inadvertence rather than serious thought, I had destroyed uh, the first check based on a comment my attorney had made. He said, tear up the first check and issue me a new check. It'll be negotiable. Now, I, uh, uh, that's the way the facts are. Had you already started preparing your statement uh, that you were ultimately going to, to use here today? Uh no, sir, uh, I hadn't time? started preparing a statement then. I was trying to go through, at that time, just my chronology of my knowledge uh, as to the sequence of events, because uh, I was having meetings with the prosecutors. Some of this was just by, uh, you know, trying to give them the facts as I knew them. Maybe I got the wrong implication, uh, impression a minute ago, and in response to a question to Mr. Dash, I thought... The impression I got was that you were stating, in effect, that you never would have had to return that money, uh, but you came forward and did it anyway because no one would have known about it, something to that effect. And now you uh, state that uh, correctly, Mr. Howard knew about it, Mr. Strong knew about it. You assume that they had told others about it. So, well, I'm saying that I, no one would have had to ever known I had taken out any money. I could have very easily put cash back in. That is not my intention. When I, in fact, knew that I had handled that money, I felt that I ought to say, state that I'd handled that money. I raised it with my lawyer. I told him what I'd done, and uh, that's the way it occurred. But at the time you went to your lawyer, of course, you were, shall we say, estranged from the White House. Uh, uh, they realized that... Uh, I believe you said you got a different impression when you came back from Camp David, uh, that uh, you said you weren't going to play the cover-up game any longer, and you got a different impression from Mr. Haldeman as to his relationship with you and what he thought about you, that sort of thing. Did it ever occur to you that uh, they might have access uh, to your safe or that they might be talking to Mr. Howard, they might be talking to Mr. Strawn, and they could go to the, to the safe at any time? At that point, they were on their way to California. There was no problem of that happening. Well, uh, so there were other people in the White House who I assume were still their friends at that time. Well, there was only one person that had a combination of that safe, and it would have been 
uh, an extraordinary act if they would have come in at that point when they were still dealing with me and trying to uh, solicit my testimony as to what it was going to be uh, for suddenly one night my safe to disappear. So I don't think that that is a, a fair assumption or Let me even... ask you about this entire, entire fun. I think this merits some questioning with regard to the remaining money that was there, the $10,350 that you said was not used. So you took the $4,850 because you didn't want it to be used in cover-up activities, be used to perpetuate the cover-up. Let let's place this in context with your own situation at that time. Is it not true that uh, on October 11, Mr. Hunt had filed a motion to suppress in the criminal case in which he was involved at that time? alleging that uh, in an affidavit as part of his motion that certain uh, documents or certain materials had not been turned over uh, to the authorities when his safe was cleaned out? I don't recall the date that he had filed that motion, uh, whether it was October 11th. I recall there was a motion filed to that effect. In fact, I recall that we received a letter um, at the White House that was a draft letter by Mr. Bittman to Mr. Colson that I received from Mr. O'Brien indicating the fact that uh, such a uh, motion might be filed. And in that letter, the question was raised as to where given items that were in the safe were located. Uh, this immediately raised to me the problem of the fact that material had not gone directly to the FBI, but rather had gone directly to uh, Mr. Gray. So I was aware of the fact that that motion, you know, was in the works and was going to be filed. Well, the, the basis of that motion was that, uh, at, least, at least one of the points, as I understand, in the affidavit, was that certain materials had not been turned over from his safe, had been withheld, and something had happened to him. Is that not correct? That, that is correct. All right, and you were one of the ones involved. Uh, I believe you said Mr. Ehrlichman told you to see that the safe was uh, cleaned out. And you were the one, you were the one uh, who, I believe, withheld a suitcase for a while, carried around in the trunk of your car. That is correct. You're the one who turned over documents uh, to Mr. Gray. For that is correct. In order that uh, they would not be leaked, I believe you said. Uh, did you not consider when this motion was filed, when this affidavit was filed, that there was some amount of pressure on you, that you might be called uh, in uh, a hearing in the, federal, uh, in the, in the criminal case, in order to explain what might have happened to those documents? Indeed, I was quite aware when the motion was filed and I was called down to visit with the prosecutors uh, that the fact I was going to be called to testify, and that's what compelled me to go tell Mr. Peterson that, in fact, the documents had not all been turned over directly to the agents. And so you were concerned about that at that time? I was concerned about what? The uh, fact that this motion had been filed and you knew that uh, you had been actually the one who had, in fact, diverted some of those materials. Well, let's understand this. I had been asked to deep six and shred documents. You testified as I didn't want to deep six and shred documents. As far as I was concerned, I was prepared to testify, but it meant that Mr. Gray's name was going to come out. You were prepared to testify that you had given him certain documents and told him that they were extremely sensitive and, uh, and that they... Uh, I believe you said you didn't tell him that they should never see the light of day. Nothing that much. That isn't what I remember, but I, it, uh, as we talked yesterday, it was something that they should not be leaked or made public. In fact, were you prepared to testify that you carried the suitcase around in your car for a few days trying to decide whether or not you would deep six it? Deep six it? If I'd have been called, that would have come out. But would, would that not have been a certain amount of pressure on you? Indeed. You coming and testifying truthfully is one thing, but uh, wanting to do that and trying to prevent placing yourself in a position where you would have to do that is something else again. You didn't want to go down there and have to testify to that. Mr. Thompson, you can't believe the pressure that came on me after my name emerged in the Gray hearings uh, as to people not wanting me to testify in the same sort of situation well, where it was becoming about, inevitable I might have to testify. I'm talking about this specific point. I'm talking about whether or not on the day before you took this money out, of course, the records speak for themselves. I believe it was October 11 of that year, the day before you took the money out, that this motion was filed. I'm going to your mental uh, condition at that time. 
whether or not this was a matter of great concern to you. I wouldn't classify it as a matter of great concern, no, sir. You wouldn't mind going down there and telling them that you carried a suitcase around uh, with documents in it? That was a long way off, and let me tell you what inter intervening events occurred. After the letter that I said came to my attention before the motion was filed, I had conversations with Mr. O'Brien about this. I told him that if the motion were filed by Mr. Bittman, that a lot of problems might be created for the White House. When, when was this conversation? Well, it was well in advance of the filing of the motion. It was well after October 12th, uh, before, before the motion was filed? Yes, it was. And what was, what was the substance of the conversation? I told him that, uh, I told him it would create real problems for the White House if it was. I didn't get explicit with him. And possibly problems for you, would it not? At least embarrassing, wouldn't it? That you were trying to decide whether or not to deep six those materials? Well, it, it wasn't, an, it, you know, embarrassment to me uh, in the sense that I might have embarrassed others far more seriously, and it would have unraveled the cover-up, if that's what you're talking about, yes. You were only concerned about embarrassing others and not yourself, then. Is that, is that no, sir, I'm telling you that would have been the first step that might have started unraveling the cover-up. Did you ever give uh, Mr. LaRue any money for him to distribute to defendants? Directly? Yes, sir. No, sir. Was any money ever passed in your office when Mr. LaRue and Mr. Combank were present in order to, to give to defendants to, uh, to keep that? That is possible, but I don't recall it. It could have happened when Mr. LaRue and Mr. Combank met for Mr. LaRue to get his instructions regarding uh, or Mr. Kambach got the instructions from Mr. LaRue as to the disposition of the money. Mr. Kambach ever come in and, in effect, make an accounting of the money he had received, the money he had dispersed? We had some notes in his hand. Do you recall that in your office? Uh, I recall he told me that he had destroyed the, the copy of the distribution, but he said that he had, had uh, taken care of it, and there may have been some sort of accounting. I don't recall it precisely. Uh, it wasn't something we talked about with great frequency. Did you ever burn notes that Mr. Kambach had had concerning his distribution? Oh, yes, I did. Mr. Mr. Kambach gave me a small slip of paper, and uh, he was burning it, and I gave him my ashtray, and it was placed in my ashtray on my desk and burned up one of these little notepads that I think I referred to earlier in my testimony, uh, where he had transcribed larger... Uh, notes into smaller notes, and it was burned up in an ashtray in my office. I do recall that, yes. When did that occur? Uh, sometime uh, after the delivery, I gather, had been made. Was anyone else present besides you and Mr. Kalmbach? No, there was none. I ask you whether or not you, in fact, told Mr. Kalmbach that you wanted Ulasiewicz to be the one to distribute this money. I did not tell Mr. Kambach. Mr. Kambach requested Mr. Ulasiewicz's uh, number from me because he told me he was the only one that he would trust to do the job. Did you know who Ulasiewicz was? Indeed, I did. Uh, I knew that from the time that Mr. Uh, Caulfield had been put on my staff, shortly thereafter I learned that he had done countless assignments for Mr. Caulfield, and uh, Mr. Caulfield had regaled me at times with uh, Mr. Ulasiewicz's ability. Getting back to the money again in a, in, a, in a different light, and I hope my pursuit is not being completely irrelevant to you. I'm concerned about that fund and possibly whether or not there might have been distributions of that fund other than the one that you've related to us. As I understand your statement, is that the reason you took the $4,850 primarily was to cover the expenses that you would incur on your honeymoon. Is that correct? That was the original purpose. But I, as I have, I think, told the committee, I later used it for personal uh, expenditures. But that was, that was the original purpose. That was the original purpose. That's and correct. And your question, I believe, as to, uh, as to, you know, in effect, why would it take that much money for a honeymoon? And I believe your statement is that you plan to spend several weeks I had hoped to spend about uh, 10 days to two weeks in Florida if I could get it. I didn't know if I could get it. 10 days to two weeks? I didn't know how long I would get. I was going to stay. I was going to fight off the offices as long as I could. I hadn't had a break in some time. Are 
you've testified on more than one occasion that you were very careful in preparing your statement. That you went over your statement. It's truthful and detailed. Now, the 10 days, this is the first time I've ever heard the 10 days. No, sir. I believe you. If you check the transcript, that came out in the question also at one point. As you've testified? Yes. All right. If I'm an error in that, I apologize. But I'm going back to your prepared transcript, your prepared statement, where you say on page 116, on Friday the 13th, I left Washington to go to Florida to spend several weeks on a honeymoon. There was an abrupt call back uh, on the 15th after two days. That's correct. So I assume that was correct then, that it was your, when you left, it was your intention to spend several weeks. That was my possible. Hope. Yes. What were your uh, campaign duties, Mr. Dean? I don't know what you mean by campaign duties. Uh, you were, you were counselor to the president, and I believe uh, you referred to in the past, as I believe Mr. Harleman, in effect, related what your duties would be during the campaign. I assume you would have a slightly different role, perhaps, during a campaign than you would that in a non-campaign year. I certainly wasn't involved in any of the political aspects. I'd say the basic thing that my office did was that a number of the filings required by the president required research of the state laws to defi define and describe exactly what the president himself would have to sign as a candidate for uh, the Office of President of the United States. These could not be handled by the re-election committee. They would require a notarized presidential signature. The president was traveling around the country from time to time. We'd have to send them with the military aid. We'd have to not only be aware of what the 50 states required, but we'd have to be aware of, of when they required it. Uh, that was uh, probably the most consuming of the, of the campaign activities. Let me ask uh, you. I would say that my largest campaign activity was the cover-up of the Watergate. Let me ask you if this would be correct, and I'm reading from page 38 of the transcript in our executive session, which I think is essentially what you just stated. My principal area of concern would be that the White House itself would stay in full compliance with election laws. And I can say from that point on, we didn't miss one thing regarding the election laws themselves, which was a rather voluminous and time-consuming task, because as the candidate, the president had a lot of filings that required his signature itself, and were handled in the White House. Is that? I think that's uh, uh, that? saying another way what I have just said. If you left on October, what, 13? That's correct. Well, your honeymoon several weeks would put you after the election before you that's got correct. back. That's correct. Would that present no problem for you, considering that there was a filing uh, requirement on uh, the 15th and the fifth days next preceding uh, the election? By that time, we had a rather routine system set up for filing. Mr. Wilson had devised a calendar with all the check dates. Uh, there, wasn't a daily, there wasn't a daily filing period. I can't recall any particular filing period within that time. There may be. I don't have the calendar in front of me. These would be forwarded by that time routinely to uh, the president for signature. He was used to them by that time. He would sign them. They would come back notarized and be forwarded back to the appropriate state that was uh, requiring it. In fact, I would say the weeks preceding the election were some of the slowest weeks uh, uh, during my uh, time at the White House. Was it slow in terms of campaign, campaign contributions that uh, were coming in? We didn't receive campaign contributions at the White House. Were you ever called upon to uh, interpret the, uh, the uh, propriety of accepting certain campaign contributions, say foreign contributions or anything of that nature? Yes, that periodically came up indeed. But you were going to, to, to go on a honeymoon that, uh, from which you would not return if you had your preference until after the election. Let me explain that when I went to Florida, what the situation is in Florida, uh, there are two villas that are set aside for uh, White House staff. Uh, I had to retain that privately rather than take it at government expense, obviously being on honeymoon. Uh, that runs $100 a day. I also did that because when I'm in Florida, you have the entire signal uh, telephone system. As I think my wife can attest that while I was at the White House, uh, there was virtually no time that I was out of contact uh, with the remainder of the staff at any time. And as you well know, uh, you can conduct 
business by telephone and get staff doing things as easily as you can being present in the office, and that's how often you operate in the office. I also had a very trusted deputy who could handle things in my absence, and if he had a judgment that he wanted my attention to, I certainly was available for him to call and reflect on that judgment. <clears throat> so then you were planning to be gone several weeks. If you... I, I had hoped to. That had been our intention, yes. That was your intention. Do you, uh, did you know anyone when you were working at the White House uh, in contact with any woman, uh, first name Jane? I, uh, do I know anybody at the White House by the name of Jane? Mm -hmm. I, I know start, several. Start, uh, close, start closest to you, if you would, in terms yes, of working Yes, I have a secretary by the name of Jane Thomas. Jane Thomas. I have a, there is a woman that's, who that, is. That's, that's, that's the name I think that I'm interested in. If I'm not, we'll go back to it. Do you have, uh, do you have a travel office? Or did you have a travel office at the White House that sometimes made accommodations for you for the trips that you would take? Yes, I generally had my secretary make travel accommodations through the uh, travel office. Do you recall whether or not you had uh, Jane Thomas make travel accommodations for this particular honeymoon trip? I don't have the foggiest recollection. I have a document here, Mr. Dean, that I'd like to present to you for your examination. Title: Request for Transportation. If I might read it as you're being presented, it's being presented to you. Dated October 11. Contact Jane, traveler, Mr. and Mrs. John Dean, extension 2714, from D.C. to Miami, two seats. Carrier: Eastern Airlines, flight uh, 195. Date: October 14. And down, soon you return, National Airlines, Flight 102, October 18. Payment, American Express. Fare, $336, with the word ticket stamped across it. First of all, is this a form that's used by the travel office? I have no idea. I've never seen the form before, and I have no idea if, in fact, that was paid for by American Express. I think that's something that will have to be checked as the auditors go back through my records. Well, I agree with you, but would you say that this, as I understand, this document has been, if there's any question about it, obviously, the person in charge of these documents, the person in custody of these documents will be brought down here and placed under oath and explain these documents in full. Exactly. But my understanding that since your testimony has begun pursuant to committee request, that this document has been furnished by the uh, travel office. It does indicate to me that the request was made on October 11, 72, by someone named Jane for a flight leaving on the 14th to return on the 18th, a trip of four days. Have any further comment on that, Mr. Dean? Well, as I said, uh, uh, it was my intention to go down there and spend two weeks. Uh, two weeks or several I, weeks? Excuse me. Several weeks. Several weeks. Sorry. And I very frequently, if you can check my other travel records, when I went places, I took the immediate turnaround ticket for the whole purpose and often stayed beyond that date. Uh, a bird in the hand uh, in traveling back and forth through main routes uh, is something I always felt was wise to do, and I think if you check my records from the travel office, you'll find I did that on other occasions. So you're stating that this document could be correct, and you could have requested your uh, secretary to make uh, accommodations for you to return on the 18th after four days. It's my recollection I did not pay for that by American Express, as a matter of fact. And often when my secretary would go down and set something like this up, uh, me. a subsequent phone call would change an arrangement or something like that. I think you'll I have thought, to check that I also. I thought you just testified you didn't, you, you didn't remember whether or not your secretary had made a request for this particular honeymoon trip or not. I'm saying that the name Jane here would indicate to me that she had. I'm not saying that she, just you, you just she made you the arrangement. Recall, 
that you didn't recall whether or not this was paid for by American Express. Does that? Because I recall, here's the reason I say that. I recall that there was not time to pay for it by American Express, and I had to go to the airport and pick the tickets up at the well call, so I had the tickets in hand, that the White House couldn't process the tickets fast enough. I think if you check the record, you'll find out that's what happened. The White House couldn't process the tickets fast enough. That is correct. Then would that indicate then that you did make a request through the travel office at the White House? I, as I say, I generally made all my requests for travel through the White House travel office through my secretary. I mean, I asked her to arrange them. Uh, there are other occasions uh, when she went directly to outside lines and, and uh, made my travel requests as well. Did you uh, subsequently get to uh, Miami to, to spend a few, a few more days on, uh, on your honeymoon? As I recall, we made several trips to Miami uh, to try to have a honeymoon, and uh, we're, we're called back. Did you uh, did you leave for Miami on October 20, if you recall? That's very possible. As I told you, when we started this line of questioning, that uh, uh, I have not sat down uh, and tried to reconstruct this. I am perfectly willing to reconstruct it for the committee and turn it all over to the committee for the committee's use. Uh, uh, I just haven't entered this area of reconstruction, and I'm sure this will be on. You have not test your memory on, on these particular points. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think that it, I would like to have the opportunity to check my own calendar, particularly my wife, who does keep a calendar to these type of events, uh, and would be very helpful in reconstructing this for the committee. I have a document here that I'd like to present to you, which is a similar document indicating a request, the contact being Mr. Dean this time, dated October 19, 1972, for a flight to Miami on October 20 to return October 23rd. And there are several markings down here, uh, evidently with some confusion as to the airline is the only thing I can tell. but. Now, this probably indicates, as I, as I recall, it's 1019, uh, that they couldn't find a flight. They tried to get a flight and couldn't find a flight, and they had me on wait list. And I see there's a wait list indication down here, WL, I assume, is wait list. Uh, this must be a, the only thing I can assume is this is some sort of form that the travel office uses that I've never seen before, so I can't really explain it. But you do remember the occasion? You do remember the trip? I'm on the 19th. Let's see. It's, it indicates... Well, you've been leaving on the 20th, I believe. Uh, on the 20th. Okay. Uh, that is correct. Return on the 23rd? That is correct. Were you called Indicating back? Indicating this. Do I recall that? Generally, as I, as I say, I recall several efforts to get to Florida what, in, a, in rapid I, succession. Excuse me. What I started to ask you... Were you, what I did ask you, I think you misunderstood me, were you called back? Yes, by the I have testified. On the 23rd? I, was test I have testified that uh, after I got to Florida, uh, I was virtually on the phone the whole time, and suddenly I was called back to come back on Sunday, uh, went to this meeting in the Roosevelt Room, which I've described in my testimony, and uh, turned around again as soon as I thought I could get off to Florida again and tried to get to Florida again. Now, this must be the trip that evidences that. And uh, I would assume that indicates that trip. All right. So, Dean, my point again is uh, to the significance of the points I've been going over. I know that they might seem rather minute in comparison with presidential involvement. But I think when you state in your, in your statement that you planned several weeks, and that if one wanted to put a theory afloat, that possibly you were trying to seek to justify your taking this money out for some reason other than you have given us today, and that is an extended honeymoon trip, that this would be very relevant. Mr. Chairman, I would like to either have these marked for identification or made part of the record. I, I would suggest and hope that we would get the proper people in charge of the custody of these documents to come down here and, and, and verify them for us. Well, as I indicated to the committee, I am perfectly willing to provide all my materials, uh, all my records, and this can be gone over in the, uh, the greatest detail the committee wishes. 
I... Uh, that, that will be done, Mr. Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a request to the Chair, and I think Mr. Thompson ought to be aware of something that I don't think he is aware of, and that is that in the committee's files, there is a Xerox copy of all the currency that Mr. Dean transmitted to me and that I transmitted to the bank before that currency cleared. And that was made in my office by me and my secretary, who's in this room, and I still consider myself under oath, and turned over to this committee voluntarily and not pursuant to a subpoena. So by looking at the serial numbers on that currency, you can establish whether or not more than $4,850 was taken out and some other currency put back, because my recollection of that currency is the serial numbers, while from the first bill to the last are not in sequential orders, there are a series of sequential serial numbers that meant something to the prosecutors. With reluctance, I also would like to say that when Mr. Dean first spoke to me about the cash and his check, the cash and the check were not then open to view. I have never seen this missing check. We never discussed the destruction of the missing check with the check before us. That on the next day, when I had decided what we're going to do with the check and the documents, I said, I'll need a currently dated check. He had told me the one was old. And the currency, which he provided me at another location. And I am sorry, as an officer of the court, and also analogously as an officer of this committee, that we don't have here today for you that check. And I assure each and every one of you under oath that there was no intention on our part or mine or Mr. Dean's to destroy that document and keep it from you. Thank you. For my, for my just put, put one question. It, Certainly it, again. I think, I think it should go on the record that it is true that we did receive the photostatic copies of currency, and Mr. Thompson does know about it because I have shown him that file. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know whether you did or not, Mr. Thompson. I, want I, you received, to... I received some of these materials rather belatedly and, and much later than Mr. Dash, and frankly, and uh, I've, I've spent some time in, in going over all of them, quite frankly. I agree. I have the, no part the, of that. The, the question... If I could uh, ask a question, so hell, I might uh, uh, shorten some of this. Uh, Mr. Dean, uh, did anybody know that you'd taken out the $4,850 out of this money except yourself? No, sir, they did not. Well, if you'd wanted to deceive anybody about it, what would have prevented you from getting uh, getting $4,850 and replacing it? Nothing. And the first man that knew that uh, you had uh, used the $4,850 was your lawyer. That is correct, and I told him that I wanted to reveal that fact to the government also. And uh, your, uh, your lawyer advised you to issue a new check. Did he give us a reason of the fact that... Uh, Banks uh, sometimes refuse to cash checks unless they're presented within a reasonable time after they are dated? That is precisely the reason he gave me. Well, I object to that. The reason I gave him that was to tell me a check was made in cash and it had to be made to me and hold it as trustee. Yes. All right, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. You remember? Well, anyway, <laughs> the, the, if, if you had the desire to deceive anybody, all you would have had to have done was gotten the $4,850 in, in cash and taken them and added to the money that uh, the, the balance that you had, had in his safe. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. But uh, the first man you told that you'd use the money was Mr. Schaffer. That is correct. And Mr. Schaffer advised you to take that he did uh, that uh, instead of uh, concealing the transaction by restoring the cash, that he, you would give him a check paid to him, and he would deposit the trust account. That is correct. I together with the other money. That is correct. Making the amount of the money, the total amount that was originally delivered to you. That is correct. Thank I was you. quite aware of the fact that this is uh, obviously a great personal embarrassment, but uh, in a rather unwise move, but I didn't want to hide the facts from this committee of what I'd done. Mr. Dean, if I might ask you one more question with regard to the checking account which you drew this check on. Is it not true that an, up until... Yes. So you drew the check on uh, April 12, would that be correct? Uh, I believe there were two checks. I don't have those records. The first, 
have here in your bank account indicates that April 12 was the first day for some time, evidently, that you had enough money in your checking account for this check to clear. When I raised it, I called and, and had the, uh, my broker send money down necessary to cover the check. I take it, Mr. Uh, you were not advised by anyone that it would either be the, uh, uh, wise or the thing to do with regard to the destruction of your check. Is that correct? You did that on your own volition. Well, it was just, as I say, it was, I was told that... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Dean, you can explain in, in as great a detail as you like, but I... No, no one told me it'd be a wise all right, or... All right. All right. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. May I... Oh, I'm sorry. Any I'm questions to any other members of the committee? Uh, Mr. Dean, the committee has a rule that a witness, if a witness wants to make a closing statement, while we'd be, uh, we'll afford you that opportunity just as we afford it to other witnesses, I think we better get uh, on. Let, let me do this first, Mr. Chairman. Okay. It might be that Mr. Dean would want to comment on it before okay. he makes his closing Fine. statement. Fine. I have indicated earlier in the hearings that Congressman Gary Brown had written a letter to the committee and was preparing to submit a sworn statement. I did not at that time have in hand the letter from Congressman Brown. It had been inadvertently misplaced. I now have a copy, and if there's no objection, Mr. Chairman, I'll read it. And if there's no objection as well, we'll receive the statement under oath that Mr. Brown has indicated that he will submit to the committee. The letter is addressed to the chairman of this committee, dear Mr. Chairman, late yesterday afternoon, it's dated June 27th, I believe. Late yesterday afternoon, upon learning of the statement giving, given to your committee by John W. Dean III, in which he implicated me and members of the Banking and Currency Committee in what he alleged was a, quote, cover-up of the Watergate matter and other improper conduct, I immediately dictated a letter to you demanding that I be given an opportunity to appear before your committee and respond to, deny, and rebut Mr. Dean's allegations. I might depart from the letter to say that uh, the chairman and I have indicated to Mr. Brown that we'd be happy to have this letter as a part of the record, his statement as a part of the record. If he still wished to testify, of course, we would provide him that Mr. opportunity. Mr. Vice Chairman, I wonder if I might comment on something. I, uh, I think that uh, uh, in my testimony I have explained that often what was happening at the White House uh, was one motive. The person on the other end wasn't always aware of that motive, and I don't mean to impute to other people the fact that one person had one desire, uh, the same motive to the other person who was uh, doing a normal, what they thought was a helpful thing to a... Uh, the White House in a general election year and not understanding the implications of all the facts and circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Dean. I'm, I'm aware of that uh, situation, and what I would really like to do is read this letter now so that before you conclude uh, your testimony and make your closing statement, if you choose to, that you'd have an opportunity to comment on that as well. To continue with the letter, the second paragraph. Before I had an opportunity to get the letter off to you, I was pleased to be contacted by a member of the committee's majority staff who indicated an interest in talking with me relative to the allegations set forth and involving me in Dean's statement. I met with your Mr. Dorson and Mr. Parr and believed that this conference was mutually beneficial. I thank you for providing me this opportunity to at least apprise your committee staff of my position relative to Dean's charges. Although I think I have satisfied your committee staff members that, the, that Dean had no factual justification to link, the White, to link the House Banking and Currency Committee action, with that he has testified were White House cover-up activities, his irresponsible or false statements with respect thereto have caused me and other members of the Banking and Currency Committee grave harm. Without equivocation, I can state it was not known to me, nor to any other member of the committee to my knowledge that our opposition to the granting of subpoena power to Chairman Patman was in any way, nor could it be, nor could be claimed to be in any way, a part of the cover-up about which Mr. Dean is testifying. I personally vehemently deny the truth of Mr. Dean's statement that my letter of September 8, 1972, to the Attorney General was, quote, in fact drafted by Parkinson for Congressman Brown, close quote. This is an untrue statement 
the letter having been dictated by me and having contained my work product. Although I am preparing a chronological statement of my whole participation in the successful effort to deny Chairman Fatman subpoena power in October of last year, the mere filing of such a statement with your committee and even the giving of the same to the media will not counteract and repudiate the publicity given to Mr. Dean's testimony. I therefore respectfully request and insist that I be given an opportunity to appear before your committee and respond to the allegations made by Mr. Dean. The granting of this request, Mr. Chairman, is the least your committee should do, it seems to me, to attempt to correct the unwarranted and unjustified damage that has been done. Your prompt and favorable response to this request will be greatly appreciated. Signed, Gary Brown, Member of Congress. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I reiterate, this letter has been accepted for the record and is being read now for the record at the request of Congressman Brown. Yes, I might just and say I wanted, that. Mr. Dean, I wanted to read it now in an abundance of fairness both to Congressman Brown and to you so that you can make any further comment. Now, on the question that, uh, on, the, on the request that Mr. Brown makes, as I stated earlier, the Chairman and I have discussed this matter and Clearly, if Mr. Brown wants to testify as a member of Congress, he's entitled to do that. But by the same token, we understand that he is submitting a sworn statement as an addendum to this letter. And I would propose, then, Mr. Chairman, that we take under advisement the matter of whether any further testimony should uh, be received or not. I might just add on uh, with regard to Mr. Congressman Brown's letter. Uh, this is in the area of hearsay, of course, that I had heard that the letter by Mr. Parkinson uh, was, you know, Mr. Parkinson had uh, assisted Mr. Brown in preparing the letter for uh, the Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to close, and I'll be very brief, I have sought to provide this committee. Certainly. You stated that there was an, an attempt at the White House and are committed to re-elect the president to uh, put to prevent the Patman committee from investigating that. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And the Patman uh, committee did a majority of them refused to investigate. It. That is correct. So, regardless of motives, it had the same effect as what uh, the, the uh, White House and the committee were trying to do. That is correct. But of course, a, a congressman's got a perfect right to vote his own uh, convictions. Absolutely. That's function. I've sought to provide this information with all the facts and information that I know regarding this matter, to answer all of the questions that have been asked of me, and to hide nothing of my own involvement in this matter, and provide the truth as I know it. This has been most difficult for me because I've had to speak against the President of the United States, some of my friends, and some of my former colleagues. I attempted to end this cover-up initially from working within the White House, and when that didn't work, I took it upon myself to work from without. And I earnestly pray that this committee reaches the truth in this entire matter and reaches it as quickly as possible because I think that there's a terrible cloud over this government that must be removed so that we can have effective government. And I thank the committees for the many courtesies that they provided me in assisting me to get to and from the hearing room and providing me uh, uh, available space during the breaks and the recesses and the thoughtfulness of the staff in that regard. Without expressing any opinion about uh, your test the way to your testimony, I do think that you d do deserve uh, the thanks of the committee for the extreme patience which you have exhibited. It's been quite a, tr a trial, a trying time to you, and also to the committee because I think this is our fifth day on your testimony, and that's a very long time. Any other comments? Or Mr. Chairman, I would only <clears throat> associate myself with your remarks and express, I believe, the appreciation of the committee for 
Mr. Dean's patience and rather prolonged testimony. It's uh, obviously not an easy task to testify on matters of this importance and delicacy. And uh, I think Mr. Dean has provided us with a great deal of information and will, which will serve as the basis for the ongoing inquiry of this committee, and we thank him for it. It might be some of the later stage of the investigation. The committee may want to recall you for some I reason. Understand that. And I understand you will be willing to return after on proper notice on the same subpoena. Mr. Chairman, uh, a matter of procedure, uh, perhaps you could uh, uh, give us some help with, in the last two or three hours, we've had many requests from the media who've been so patient and who've been sitting through this to have an interview with Mr. and Mrs. Dean as they leave here. Uh, you understand, of course, that we can't provide those interviews uh, for some legal reasons and for the basic reason, five days, that they're, they're exhausted. We ask their leave and their understanding and yours that uh, we, we're going to leave the building uh, immediately after that. Well, I, I would think since uh, Mr. Dean has testified under uh, an order of immunity and he testified involuntarily, uh, I would uh, think that his counsel would be wise to give him the same advice that uh, I used to give my, my clients, and that is to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> that, why don't you the, the, committee, the committee will stand in uh, adjournment till uh, here to the 10, 10 o'clock. Very good. That is the very complete John Dean story. The committee won't be back until Tuesday, July 10th, when John Mitchell will be the witness. His lawyer has already stated that Mitchell won't implicate the president. It's doubtful, though, that Watergate will be temporarily forgotten during the holiday week. It'll be interesting to watch what, if anything, the White House does during this period. This week, there was an attempt by Fred Bazart, the special White House counsel on Watergate, to put his stamp on the hearings. But the response was so negative that everyone involved quickly insisted that Bazart's position was not that of the president. So the White House defense, beyond adherence to the president's lengthy May 22nd statement citing national security problems, remains unclear. Next week, America will celebrate the second 4th of July since the Watergate break-in, and it's still not clear how many new techniques those under investigation have added to the American political system. And as the committee takes time for its staff to catch up on its work, the senators have to deal with the problem of getting better information from the president. After today's hearings... Impact correspondent Peter Kay asked Senator Weicker more about his desire to hear from Mr. Nixon. Weicker, uh, seems to me the hearings ended on sort of a plaintive note with several members, including yourself, wishing the president would step forward or somebody from the White House and try to resolve all of this apparent discrepancy. Well, I, as I've indicated, uh, the president should be the one to go ahead and choose his forum, but certainly the president should speak out. I don't think it's up to the committee to invite him. I don't think it's up to the committee to subpoena him. Uh, uh, he is the President of the United States. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for the office of the presidency. And where he chooses to make his statement is a matter for him to decide. Do I want him to speak out? I want him to speak out now. I'm not talking about after Dean's testimony. I've wanted him to speak out every day for the last month, you know, uh, the last couple of months. So that uh, I think that. There's no question in my mind, and I've stated it all along, the country is best served, the president is best served uh, by this president speaking very forcefully uh, to the matters before the committee. In fact, as I've said many times before, I wish he'd put the committee out of business, and I'm sure he can, uh, just by getting there and, and uh, uh, not uh, always reacting to what we hear through the press or before the committee, but acting on his own initiative. But I'm not about in any manner, shape, or form to go ahead and, and suggest to him, to the office, that it be done under terms dictated by this committee. I think that'd be very bad. What's your appraisal of John Dean's testimony? How well do you think he stood up under cross-examination? I think he stood up very well under the examination of the committee. Now, it has yet to be seen how well he stands up to the testimony of other witnesses. I think this has to be pointed out. I think he's told a very important story. 
He's um, uh, had a view of things that uh, very few people have had a view of. Uh, uh, I think that uh, when it came to the cross-examination, uh, uh, he, he stood up excellently. Now, out of fairness to many others who Mr. Dean implicated, uh, let's hear their story. Uh, let's see where the conflicts exist, and, and then people can make a judgment in their own minds. Senator Weicker, thank you very much. Thank you. The special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox, is now in total charge of that ongoing investigation, with the resignation today of the three original assistant U.S. attorneys working on the case. Their exit has been expected ever since Cox was named. Also today, there was a different complaint of interference from White House aides Ehrlichman and Haldeman. This one came from John Ingersoll, who's quitting as director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Five days of John Wesley Dean III. It obviously adds up differently to different people, such as Stephen Hess, former White House aide, now a senior fellow at Brookings Institution, and David Austin, former Justice Department official, now on the law faculty at Georgetown University Law School here in Washington. Mr. Austin, what's your assessment at this stage? The five days have, have shown a lot of questions asked of Mr. Dean, but I'm afraid that if you added up all of the questions, they would be repetitious, and the, they would be repetitious exceeding even the acceptable limits of questions that can be repetitious. Let me say generally, however, that four of the days have been cross-examination of the witness. So the first day was his statement. Now, there are three ways, basically, of attacking a witness on cross-examination. One is to attack his credibility, and I think we've seen that tonight and in prior days in the cross-examination by, for instance, Mr. Thompson referring to the checks referring to the credit cards and referring to the length of the honeymoon. The second way you can attack a witness is to take his version of the facts and fit it in to your own version of what really happened. And I think we have seen that in what Senator Gurney has done and to a lesser extent perhaps uh, to what Senator Baker has done. And the, the third way you can attack a witness is to so confuse the issue that nobody really has any idea of what he said when you get finished with the cross-examination. I don't know if this was deliberate, but I'm afraid because of the repetitious nature of some of the questions, we have perhaps seen that happen. And the Dean issue, some of the Dean issues have become very, very confused. Mr. Austin, as a lawyer, having looked at what's happened now over five days, is there any way uh, that a, the story that we have heard from John Dean could ever have come out in this fashion in a courtroom? Well, it would certainly not come out in this fashion <laughs> in the courtroom because I believe, almost without exception, uh, Mr. Dean has been permitted to comment and offer explanations for most of his answers. That, of course, to a certain degree, fleshes out the answers and gives meaning and, indeed, editorial comment from his point. But there is no way that this kind of story would come out, at least not in this form, in a courtroom. Particularly beginning with the first day, the 245-page uh, narrative. Stephen Hess, what are your thoughts at this time, have, other than being tired after five days? <laughs> well, well, I agree uh, with, with David. Here was an amazing situation. The former counsel to the President of the United States was charging the President of the United States with being engaged in criminal activities. And yet for five days, we sat and we listened to repetition, to sloppy cross-examination. And you know, there were long stretches during those five days when I was just bored out of my mind. I had to concentrate just as hard as I could uh, to be listening and to pay attention to what was being said. And I think part of my problem, and I'm lecturing myself and maybe some other people share this, is that I was expecting entertainment. And politics as entertainment has a long history in this country, but we don't expect to be entertained uh, by a vote in Congress, and we don't expect to be entertained by a Supreme Court decision. And I, I think that we're involved here, as we will be when the uh, Urban Committee goes back into action, in the most serious business. And we just must force ourselves to consider it in that light and just not merely as another form of entertainment. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. I think what struck me in that same regard was that the, uh, so many of the senators, when faced with these incredible charges against the President of the United States, were prepared to go off into all kinds of side alleys and things and forget the central issue that was before them, almost as though they had lost sight of its importance. Yeah, I agree, Robin. Senators Irvin, 
Baker and Weicker also read a little history, as you know, into the record today in a not-too-subtle try at telling President Nixon that they, they would like to hear his side of the John Dean story. Well, that immediate problem aside, the history, the raising of history uh, made me wonder how John Wesley Dean III is going to make out in the history books of the future. Right now, the options are many, and you know them as well as I. He could get a major write-up as the valiant young man whose startling accusations led to the resignation or the impeachment of Richard Nixon as the 37th President of the United States. Or he could get just an average-sized paragraph as the talkative young man who made some charges against a president concerning some scandal called Watergate, charges that were never really proved nor disproved, but had a crippling effect on the remaining three years of the Richard Nixon presidency. Or he could get a slightly shorter mention as the despicable young man who told vicious lies about President Nixon in order to avert blame for his own serious criminal acts. The lies were exposed as such, and Dean served many, many years in a federal prison. And there is one other option, of course, <clears throat> that John Dean won't get a line. Not a word about what he did these last five days before the Irvin Committee and the rest of us, the American people, in this summer of 1973. Well, I'm not about to offer an opinion at this point in time as to which of the options will eventually be the case. But I'm not reluctant to predict that the last possibility, no mention at all, seems very unlikely. Well, we'll be back on July the 10th. For Robert McNeil and Peter Kay, I'm Jim Lara. Thank you and good night. From Washington, you've been watching gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.